and welcome to the Thursday, February 13th, uh, 2020 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. <clears throat> I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, chairing the committee, um, and this is our uh, meeting with the Student Advisory Council. Um, I want to begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Member Rebecca Musanski. Present. Member Sean Condon. Present. Member Laura Fallon. Present. Member Ronnie Gold. Present. Member Kai Holman. Present. Uh, Member Faulkner is tonight except for Tonight. Uh, Member Tina Levy. Here. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Member Sarah C. Talks. Present. Member Voss. Present. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and we will turn to our uh, representatives from the student union this evening to um, work on the agenda that we have before us and the reports you're presenting. Hi everybody, um, just to remind you guys, I'm Eleanor, senior, I'm sure most of you know me by now. Um, I brought Kamini Waldman, she's a member of the student union um, and we're going to talk about vaping um, and the progress that we've made on that. We've already given a, a kind of report on that earlier in the year, but we've made some more progress, so we thought we'd talk about it again. Um, and then Kamidi is going to talk a little bit about our discussions that we've been having with uh, REAL, um, or Racial Equity in Learning, that organization. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about grant forms. We haven't been able to focus really strongly on one specific topic in the past few months, so we figured we'd just give you an overview of a couple of different things. Um, yeah, so I'll start with the vaping. Um, we've been able to connect more with Ananda Lennox, the, um, I don't know, chair of the MPC, and so so that's been really good. Um, and we we it, we had a meeting with her in early January where we just kind of talked a lot about, you know, what some of the things that she's been thinking about doing um, that towards, you know helping kind of the vaping issue and figuring out what to do about it and some actions that we can take. Um, and then what we've been thinking about and kind of connecting on those things. So um, we talked a lot about potential resources that we can use and she said that she'd be, um, you know, some of the issues that we've been having I think are the posters that have been put up around the school. Um, they're often taken down by students who don't want to look at them. Um, and so we, she discussed um, putting plexiglass over the posters and that she'd try and find funds to do that, um, uh, which would obviously solve the issue of it, them being taken down, uh, which would be helpful. Um, we're not totally sure how much the posters are actually having an impact on the students. I think it's really easy to overlook them or to make fun of them. Um, but, you know, what if it's available and we can do it, why not? So uh, we also talked about reaching out more to parents and talking with them about the issue just so that they're aware um, and maybe so that students feel more comfortable talking with them about uh, their addiction or uh, getting help if they need it or getting a friend help, something like that, <coughs> so that more people in the community um, are available for students to talk to. Um, we're also, another thing that was thrown out there was a vaping text line where, that students could use um, or maybe partnering with like Northampton area pediatrics and seeing, you know, the kind of connection that we could have there um, where students could get help. Uh, also a name that Ananda brought up is a speaker named Chance Amarada who was um, a former vapor. He's like 18 years old and he had like a collapsed lung after vaping for a year or something like that. And uh, so he was a high school student in Florida and now after that um, illness and that really, you know, kind of scare. He's been going around to a bunch of different schools and talking about his experiences. Um, and that may be, um, I think it would be more effective because it's coming from someone who is, you know, a peer, um, someone who's our age. And uh, so that would may be interesting. And um, maybe holding a vape work workshop or having like a vape trade-in where, I don't know, you get money or 
gum or I don't know something where that would incentivize students to give in their jewel or something um, and then we also talked about a social media campaign which has actually been moved forward and I think Rebecca you know a good amount about that but um, so we it, so two marketing I don't know how much you guys know about this but two marketing uh, companies have have said that they're they've decided to like give their time and effort I guess into making a social media campaign an anti-vaping social media campaign for the school district um, and Anatoletics invited us or invited me to that meeting and um, it was really great to be able to talk with these marketing uh, organizations and uh, share our opinion um, and and hear the opinions of other uh, people so that was really great um, yeah we I think some of the questions that we're trying to answer on that topic is just like how are we going to target the different age groups and really um, like make sure it's getting the message across to students who are you know 11 or 12 and students who are <coughs> 17 18 years old um, and then also you know are we going like more of a route that's focusing on the students who are already addicted or are we going more of a route on like just spreading information and um, more of like a preventative thing so yeah we'll see and uh, a couple members of the union recently filled out a survey that have that will help the marketing uh, companies you know kind of tailor and make the the um, the social media campaign as effective as possible so that's good and yeah I'm excited to see how that works again you know we're not sure how effective it'll be but I think you know it's really great that they're um, putting it out there and making it available for us and I think it could potentially have a much bigger impact than what we've already been doing so that's great um, and then we were also able to talk to uh, the school adjustment counselor, Ms. Goodwin Boyd, KGB, and um, the nurse at our school to see if they are um, uh, if they are mandated reporters for uh, if like if a student comes to them saying I'm addicted to nicotine and I'm be I've been vaping, do they have to report it? Um, and it turns out that they do not. That it's not one of the things that they're um, like required by law to report to the administration or or the school or parents um, so that's really good to hear because it gives more people um, it gives more students someone to talk to about their issues and if they need you know if they need help and they want help they have people to talk to so we are putting that um, in the transcript tomorrow in the beginning and, and saying you know hey these are these people that you can go talk to um, we'll put it in the bulletin and on our Instagram page it's been put up so that's really good um, I think that's about where we've where we've gotten with vaping, and I think it's really I think we've been able to make some really good progress in the past couple of months. So hopefully, we'll continue putting those things into place and yeah, working on that. Yeah. Do you want me to chime in with a few more? Details? Yeah, I'd love uh, that. Yeah, that it was great. pretty exciting and it was great, Eleanor. We were there, but at the last um, prevention coalition meeting, we had basically uh, mar two local firms, Marketing Doctor and Brigade Advertising, who both work nationally and have been award-winning, and maybe you drive by Marketing Doctor on Damon Road all the time and see that sign, I don't know. But um, they basically have come together and decided that they wanted to do a public health uh, campaign pro bono, and they've chosen anti-vaping, and they've chosen to work with the Northampton Prevention Coalition. So they came and they presented, and it was pretty incredible that yeah. they put together this social media campaign. But they're going to base it on working with all stakeholders. So if anyone is interested, I know that Ananda Lennox is putting together a small subcommittee to work with marketing doctor and brigade because they and I hope students will not just have filled out that uh, survey but I hope a couple I mean the plan is to have students in there too right, right. You probably have the most useful information and then with that they will uh, develop and pre-test and post-test this social media campaign down to the to the level of incredible minutia that maybe other people know about more than me like it, what colors go viral and what color does not and then they can just keep refining it they can even 
geolocate middle schoolers versus high schoolers. So they are going to talk about setting up two different campaigns, what's appropriate for a middle schooler, maybe more around prevention versus high school, which may be more mixed in with that sort of addiction kind of help angle right. to it. Right. So, um, so it's going to take a number of months, but it's pretty exciting that they're and pretty generous that they're doing this pro bono. And I mean, we must have had eight of them in the room. I know I there was a was lot like, of people. A lot, <laughs> came, a lot of people came to, and they were I mean, all they were like really very all excited. And yeah, yeah, really, it was really exciting. And it, they are also, you know, very much willing. And I think they'd like us to, if this works out, to share it with other districts and absolutely make it a more widespread. Um, campaign which I think would be really helpful especially if it turns out to be successful so you know it wouldn't just help our school district but others too yeah, yeah. so now I think yeah hand yeah. it over to do you, Kamini. Do you have a question uh, oh yeah <laughs> I just had a question, a question. Um, this is amazing so thank you I remember in September October when we first talked to you about this yeah. and it was kind of what do problem and what and I listening to this list of things it's really amazing so good thank work you. to you and your colleagues on the student union and the <laughs> high school and a question I have and it's really just a suggestion I don't know if it's a good one or not but um, you know you took all that data for us with the late start and I found that helpful in terms of how much sleep students are getting mm -hmm. and I know a survey like that is a ton of work so that's right. where I say mm -hmm. take it or leave the suggestion mm -hmm. but I wonder if the student union would want to survey students about things related to vaping before the social media campaign and before you really get going on this mm -hmm. and then after it's going so that you have some data to show right. what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think there have been a few other vaping surveys done. Um, maybe I know the one that the NPC put out wasn't specifically about vaping, but it had questions about vaping on it. And I believe there was another survey that was sent out to students specifically about vaping. Um, and I'm not sure. I, I know that students got an email from Miss Valencourt, but I'm not sure if she was the one that instigated it. Or I don't know if you know anything about this, Dr. Provost. No, uh, actually it was Ananda Lennox who came to us. There okay. was um, an organization that was attempting to get um, some broad-based data on um, vaping by adolescents. And so we had gotten the information about two weeks before their deadline for collecting data. And so one, the, the basic uh, deal was if you are able to provide us with subjects, we'll give you information about your own school. So that's what that survey was about. Okay, yeah. And but and Ananda didn't mention that they haven't gotten the, as of our last meeting, they haven't gotten the data back yet. Oh, okay. But now that we're participating mm -hmm. in that, like you said, uh, we'll have some really good data on, I think, each grade. I think that was actually going out to each grade. So, yeah. so hopefully we'll be able to right. use that. Yeah. Will, will they redo that? I don't know. After this? Not sure. Oh, Mr. Cole, just a number Cole. question, um, and great work, by the way, was just that, is this, um, are you guys targeting vaping during the school day and on school grounds, or like vaping in all your lives as high school kids, like, you know, outside of school as well, like, is it targeting, yeah, is there? Yeah, I think we're mostly focusing on, I don't know, it's, I think, mostly focusing on vaping on school grounds and, and in, to the school community, but I think we also have to like in that think about the broader picture and you know if students are addicted, it that's an important issue and it's you know because they're addicted they're also using it in school and and on school grounds and that isn't the issue so I think that's kind of the root of the problem but I think like I said with it we're gonna have to look more broad. Yeah. yeah, and I mean to add on to that, mm -hmm. I would say the education, at like information sharing part of this that we are supplying the student body with, I would at least hope that they would then take it into, you know, other parts of their lives. So not just taking this information and being like, you know, I shouldn't vape in school, but also then um, taking that a step further and like bringing it home with them. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions about vaping? No. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the second thing that we're here to talk to you about is our partnership with REAL. And forgive me if you all have had connections as a school committee to REAL. I don't know how much you know, how much you know about you know what we've been doing. I don't know what Eleanor has said. So just shout at me if I say something that you already know. <laughs> um, 
So what REAL is, it stands for Racial Equity and Learning, and its mission is to support and strengthen the school community by creating um, a specifically anti-racist culture. Um, so the union's involvement in this, so both this year and last year, we sent out surveys at the, be, uh, the beginning of the year, um, mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, surveying the student body and asking what uh, issues students right. would like us mm -hmm. to zero in on yeah. for the year. Yeah, and I've talked a little bit about this, but yeah. just to reiterate, you know, for the new people. And, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so and for both of the surveys, the number one issue that students identified was that there are racial inequities within our school. Um, and so as a union, we, you know, we know that this is super important to address. And so last year, we started partnering um, with members of REAL because this is the work that they're trying to get done, not just within Northampton High School, but within the whole uh, district. Um, and so we thought there would be a really important resource to uh, use. And so last year, we met with them towards the end of the year last year, and they had told us that what they want to do is they're starting with story collection for their mission. So what that looks like is um, they have a website in which uh, students and uh, members of our community can go on that website. Um, and they're asked to share stories of either experienced racism or racism that they have seen within our district. Um, and to add on to that, not just racism that they've seen or experienced, but also what, you know, in their opinion, a district and a community, therefore, without, a, without racism could look like, just sharing mm -hmm. their like broad overview of right. that, because that's super important. That's why they're doing the work. Mm -hmm. And even um, positive experiences, too. You yeah, know, no, exactly. It doesn't to have be... to be negative. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. So yeah, awesome. whatsoever. So what we're doing currently, we met with them just at our past meeting. Yeah, like, yesterday. Was it, yeah, yesterday night. Yeah, yesterday night. Um, and so they again asked us to uh, do story collection within, you know, for uh, students at NHS, Northampton High School. Um, and so we're taking an approach to that in which we're going to start to share information with the student body. Um, we don't want it to be forced. We don't want to, you know, force this. We don't want to force our peers to, and, you know, teachers, therefore, um, to tell their own stories, especially when you're asking a minority um, to share their experiences. So what we've decided to do is um, just kind of a broad, uh, like, information sharing. So putting that. Um, like in all forms of media that the students get within our school um, and so just just putting the information right. about how to contact mm -hmm. real yeah um, saying this is real this is what it is this is their mission mm -hmm. you know exactly the, if there's their website and mm -hmm. they are asking for story collection or you know or they would like to share stories and so just you know providing that information hopefully so students who do want to share their story can have that mm -hmm. uh, information available to them and mm -hmm. instead of just asking please go on this website and share your story because you know they're very personal and we don't want to you know uh, force them mm -hmm. and just to be able to have this resource in the back of their minds you know they might not have a story then at that point but they might later on or they might have a peer who they think um, real would be a helpful resource for um, and so just you know getting that information out there uh, we think is super super important to start with um, another idea was brought up at our meeting last night um, we have a social justice week coming up in March yeah I believe yeah. it's the 16th 16th, 16th the through the 20th yeah. yeah yeah exactly um, and so the idea was brought up that maybe real during that would come into the school and have like a table throughout um, third period, which is the, the lunch period, um, just for students who we hopefully will have information out at that point about what real is. So students will have already gotten kind of acquainted with it and been able to maybe go to their website if they're interested. And then to be able to take it a step further and have these people who come directly from real who they can then approach um, and talk one-on-one -on -one from a member with real. Um, and also, w you know, the student union can be a huge resource to the mm -hmm. student body. Um, but of course, you know, if you're going to ask a question about real, it might be better to ask real itself. Um, and so I think the last thing that we talked about at the meeting was, so 
since Real was started, which I believe was like a it was a year and a half ago, two years ago. I think ago. it was three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah, because oh, wow. they had a a grant for like a three year grant. Yeah. So yeah. they. So they've been doing story collections since then, um, and they've actually uh, partnered with the Soka at JFK and also um, the Soka at NHS, mm -hmm. uh, along with our union, of course. Um, and they they're trying to figure out a way to present their information um, to the community as a whole and would like uh, both student input but also community input on how to present it. Um, and so they're asking for student involvement um, and ideas about how, how we want this information shared mm -hmm. um, because it needs to be shared. Um, so that's currently what we're working on. I don't know, Eleanor, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think that's about it. I think they're just to add on about like the sharing of the stories in a more public format is just mm -hmm. they're thinking about some sort of art exe exhibition yeah. or are taking that approach to it. Um, they're very, it's very, I think, in the beginning stages right now, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something that's, I think, their main idea. and they'd like students, us or other students, members mm -hmm. of SOCA, JFK students to uh, work with them on that and, you know, participate um, in actually creating that exhibit, whatever mm -hmm. it may look like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, Assuming that the one of the purposes in doing the story tell, story collection and then and then sharing is to raise awareness of some of the very real, um, no pun intended, yeah. um, <laughs> in issues and experiences that people are having within the schools. Yes. I'm wondering if you if there's been any conversation about then what comes next once those stories are collected and shared, um, in terms of if they have any plans or intentions to partner with schools or with administrators to think about either being reactive or proactive about some of those experiences that are happening? Um, I'm, they, so we haven't talked with them specifically about uh, post story sharing and telling, but we do know that they've been working, they've had a, a member on the code of conduct uh, revision is it the revision committee yeah. or something um, and so they've been working with on that and been able to share their opinions and have their views at those meetings mm -hmm. um, and I think the idea of um, you know working in this uh, code of conduct committee is to um, have a system in place for what happens when you're in school, when you're in a classroom and something racist is said. Um, or happens. Or happens, happens yeah. exactly. Um, and how to uh, raise awareness about that, but also have a plan in place for that teacher to then be like, you know, what do I do now? Um, and then be able to have a, a system in place for when right, that happens. Right. I don't know, Dr. Provost, if you know more about that process. Sure, uh, I can speak a little bit to real. I was actually part of the meeting where they planned their original NEF grant proposal. Um, so, the, the, and I will say that they have evolved their thoughts as they've gone through the process. At first, the first goal was just to, to gather stories and um, to present the stories. At the time, we were thinking maybe some kind of like real people of Northampton. I mean, again, no pun intended. Um, but then, We've, as we've continued in conversation, we've found other ways that we could um, expand their influence. So, being a part of the, the code of conduct was, I felt, very important. Um, I know that one of the things they've talked about is next steps. And in fact, it's a letter that I think many of the committee received, and we're also printing in the code of conduct, is uh, being involved with trying to explain the philosophy of restorative practices to the community and to students um, because some people hear restorative practices and they think it means the administrators have gone soft on crime, um, which is definitely not the purpose, but um, having conversation about that is I know one of the things that they think is an important next step for them to take. I would just add that I think it would be really, um, I think it would be really helpful if once their stories have been collected, if they could present those to this committee, and if we could think about how um, how we could then respond in ways that 
again, are both reactive and proactive in terms of thinking about creating anti-racist um, climates in the schools. Absolutely. So I think just lastly, and I'll try and briefly talk about this, is our, our grant process that we've been going through. Um, so last year, we've I've talked a little bit about this at previous meetings, but um, I'll give a review. Um, last year, we, have, we decided that we'd start giving uh, grants out to um, student organizations and clubs or I think we've decided that it can be just regular com com uh, community members. Affiliated with the school though. Yeah, 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 yeah school community members. Um, and uh, this year we've become a little bit more um, like structured in that process so we've decided that we are going to give out a total of one thousand five hundred dollars per year to a variety of clubs and organizations um, in a way and and we want to make sure that the money that we're giving will be going to um, you know activities or materials or whatever it may be that will have an impact um, on our school community uh, in the long term so that it won't just be you know a one-time thing um, although you know we we are a little lenient with that because it's really important that our clubs and and student organizations are just able to stay active and and that's an important thing but we would really like to focus on it being a more long-term um, having a more long-term impact on our school community and yeah so the kind of that idea of sustainability um, is what we're kind of fueling this um, but so pretty much a grant um, the grant process for a club or in our organization is they fill out a form um, detailing how much money they need what for um, and how it will be used and and how it will have a long-term impact on the school community um, and and benefit the community over time they can ask up to seven hundred and fifty dollars um, but we are then able to decide how much money we actually give them and if we give them any money at all after we receive applications from different organizations. So just at our meeting yesterday, we decided to um, give $750 to the musical production um, to be split between the costuming department and the sound department. Um, the costuming department would like to buy a new sewing machine and because we don't have one. And um, a uh, like fabric scissors because we don't have them. And um, so those things which will really be able to help um, the musical stay active and really um, I think a lot of the community sees the NHS musical as like a really beloved tradition and so we'd like to really try and keep that um, in keep that going um, so that will really help and then also to the sound department for body microphones um, so that so that will be obviously sustainable because those can be used over and over again um, and so we're really excited about that um, and that's kind of just the I think we're planning on having another round of grant forms going uh, for this year. I think Model UN is interested, um, and we're in the process of you know talking with them and deciding whether how, whether to give them money, how much to give money to give them. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Yeah. Are there any other questions from members for this portion of the meeting? Thank you both very much. Oh, oh, just, I'm just sorry. was going to say the same. Just thank you. I think that's great. I think the grant. Uh, I think that's really wonderful. I love how you've used it so far. It's great. You're talking with the clubs sure. about how to kind of keep sustaining them. Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. So. Thank you both very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. So um, I think it's now 6:46. So I think we can move right into our. Regular full meeting. Uh, those of you who are joining us, the school committee is convened here on February 13th, 2020. Um, we've already done a roll call. We have a quorum, um, so I'll dispense with that. Um, and I would now um, open up for the um, public comment period. Okay. Um, no one has signed up for public comment, but is there anyone who wishes to speak in public comment this evening? Okay, um, 
Hearing none, we'll move on then to announcements. Are there announcements uh, from members of the school committee? Ms. Busansky? I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that we have, um, that the second annual Farm to School Summit has been um, scheduled and the Eventbrite registration is up. Um, it's gonna be Saturday, March 21st from nine to one at Smith College. And it's on the um, NPS uh, banner, scrolling banner. You can click there and get to the registration form. And it's free to attend, lunch is included. We had a great day yesterday, uh, yesterday, last year, with uh, around 50 people attended from all the different kind of stakeholder groups. And we've done, now that we have a USDA grant in motion, we've done even more around student choice and voice and improving uh, you know, what's happening in the cafeteria around local food as well as kind of pulling up that farm to school thread through middle and high school. But we've only just begun, so we'd really love as many people to come as possible and help come participate in the process. So uh, that's it. Oh, and I also just wanted to give a, a thank you to Jeremy Whalen, who's done a great job of putting a farm to school page up on the Northampton public school website so you can find out more information there as well. So, thanks. Ms. Fallon, member Fallon. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we'll be, I'll be hosting um, a Division 5 meeting for the Massachusetts Association of School Committee Members on Monday, March 9th here in the community room. Um, Tracy Novick, uh, the field rep, one of the field reps for the MASC will be presenting um, 70 minutes on chapter 70, how it works, how it doesn't, and what's being done to change it. Uh, Senator Comerford uh, has confirmed that she'll be joining us as well. Um, and it begins at 6, well, light dinner at 6.30, and then the presentation will start probably at 7. So I hope you guys can join us. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? I did want to announce that um, <clears throat> last night I held my seventh um, Proposition two and a half town hall meeting at uh, Ryan Road Elementary School. Um, and my eighth one is scheduled for the Monday after school vacation week, uh, Monday, February 24th um, at Leeds Elementary School um, in, the, in the gymnasium or cafeteria um, at seven o'clock. So if you haven't had an opportunity to attend, um, that there is one more scheduled on Monday, February 24th at 7 p.m. Um, in Ward 7 at Leeds Elementary School. Okay, um, so we'll now move on to our uh, recommended actions. Um, the consent agenda we, uh, that's on the printed agenda, we actually um, have only one item, um, and it is the field trip, trip request uh, for the Northampton High School trip to Madrid, Spain. Um, April 15th through the 22nd of 2021. Um, and the other items, uh, their minutes were not ready for this evening's meeting, so they're not on there, and we do not have any budget transfer approval. So I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, so all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Uh, next, we move to reports and recommendations, and we uh, turn back to our student representative, um, Eleanor Harden, for the uh, student representative report. Um, okay, hi again. Uh, I think that other than what I've talked about at the SAC meeting five minutes ago, um, I we've had, I think, just... Um, some more conversations about you know what we, what I talked about and just brief things, um, and then we've also had m some meetings with um, people, and uh, one being Laura Fallon. So myself and uh, Willa Sipple, our president, uh, met yesterday with Laura Fallon to talk about the uh, position that was proposed. By Lori Lonnie, sorry, Lonnie Kaufman at the last meeting um, at, of a like a student, a school committee liaison to the student union, um, and so we just kind of shared our opinions with Laura Fallon about that. Um, that was a great meeting, and then we. Uh, I also wanted to mention that a few um, members of the school, the student union, 
groups, and there's so many groups, um, the student union have um, separately uh, met with members of the administration to talk about the student death that just recently happened at our school. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about those um, meetings, um, but I just wanted to let you all know that members of the union have been talking with administration about uh, what's going on and about that. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, like I was saying, in March there'll be the um, Social Justice Week coming up and the musical is coming up. Um, I know uh, spring sports are starting today. And I just had my tennis meeting yesterday with um, yeah, the tennis coach and that was fun. And so I think it'll be, yeah, it's we're getting, we're getting there almost to the end of the year, it feels like. Um, so that's about it. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Eleanor. Um, next, we have um, a vote on the agenda. Um, this is a vote to accept uh, the Northampton Education Foundation's uh, donation from their any uh, SOS book fund. Um, uh, Member Kaufman is not able to be with, with us this evening due to illness. Um, but this, as some of you may know, is the uh, funds that are collected as part of the um, partially the census as well as the um, plant sale each year and it's distributed on a formula basis to all the schools uh, for the purchase of uh, books and other learning materials. Um, the uh, amount uh, of the uh, gift to the schools this year through the SOS book fund is $19,502 um, and I would uh, entertain a motion to accept that uh, donation from NEF. Motion to accept the donation from NEF for the SOS book fund. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Um, so there's a motion <coughs> seconded to accept that uh, gift of $19,502. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much, and obviously thank you to um, to NEF and to all the generous uh, contributors to that uh, book fund. Um, next, we have a vote uh, to approve uh, the Northampton High School Program of Studies, and I believe Principal Valancourt is here to uh, make that presentation. So each of you should have a copy of the program of studies. I will start by at the beginning and go through where we have made changes. And if you have questions, please stop me along the way and we can discuss those. Hopefully I'll clarify everything as it happens. I have to grab my glasses, excuse me. Smashes. <laughs> Just have my sunglasses. All right. <laughs> Looking forward to vacation. So um, that's okay. Thank you. I'm sure. Thank you so much. So on the first page where it says Northampton Public Schools mission statements, that has recently been changed to read Northampton High School mission statement. That was not marked on your form, but I just want to make that clear. All right, so you will notice on page eight where it lists the new members of our faculty under counseling department. We do have one new adjustment counselor that's been listed here. And then there's a new title change for Misha Began, which is the school to career coordinator. She's the person responsible for the internships and work studies. That's her current job title. And if we continue to the graduation requirements, here are the updates. So you will notice that under wellness education, there are currently, instead of the field trip experiences, we're now calling them physical education experience. This will happen in grades 10, 11, and 12. We did this year, last year, have what was um, 
what were field trips and money allotted to field trips. And now instead of that, we are allowing students to participate in the same duration of hours, which is seven hours a semester, to participate in a physical activity of their choice. So this can include participation in a sport or a team sport or an active club like Ultimate Frisbee or the Adventure Club or Hiking Club. It can also consist of a personal or private activity that they participate in including um, a dance class, the climbing the rock wall or going to a yoga class. It can also consist of other activities that we will be offering throughout the year which might be um, a walking opportunity with a favorite teacher or walk with the principal or maybe one day walk with the mayor or the superintendent. We haven't decided but having some community outreach in those cases. Um, and really being mindful of other opportunities that really sporty, non-sporty kids may participate in. So um, just dance or um, things like hula hooping competitions. We have 15 pairs of horse uh, snowshoes in our gym. So these are just different activities and ideas. I imagine you might have some questions about that. Are there any questions about the wellness? Member uh, is there a requirement for a number of hours spent in those activities in order to then count for credit? Thanks. So the PE field trip experience was seven hours. Um, it was a full school day and we did those once a semester. So it would be to 14 total hours throughout the year. And our integration tech person has come up with this really nifty form where kids can go in, they can plug in their name, their grade, how many hours they completed, where they completed it, and then they'll get an email bounced back to them that will indicate how many hours they have left and give them cheerleading, like keep going, you're doing it, you got 10 more hours to go in their, um, in their email message. Member Butsansky. So, um, I mean, this is great to see because we started this conversation in the Budget and Property Subcommittee, so I'm happy to see it being implemented. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious if you think there's any budget savings in that, just now that we've sort of put aside, we've had about, what, 38,000 put aside for those field trips, but I realize we're talking about program of studies, so I can ask that. I'll save that yes. question. Um, so what's, is there any sort of, um, are you require? Is it just the honor system that they put in the number of hours they've, um, you know, spent in a dance class or at a, at the gym or walking or at a sport or is there any kind of system of? We can be very trusting at Northampton High School, yeah, and great. we would like to go by an honor system. There is one question that states where did you part participate in this activity and who might be somebody who monitored that and they can just identify that. I walked with Miss Valancourt, and if necessary, we can check in on those things but really we're just hoping kids do this for the lifelong process of being active and participating in physical activity. And can I keep going? Sorry. Please. Um, you know, seven hours per semester just seems like too little. I agree. I'm, but I mean, for a kid who's taking a PE class, mm -hmm. you know, they're getting, or doing a sport, it, it seems like we should maybe think about basing it more around that number of hours might be not as many hours as that but I mean seven hours per semester so I'm going with what we had that existed and that mm -hmm. and what was determined by the wellness committee and the the PE department on what uh, was acceptable for the wellness experiences for the last couple years and so I'm basing it on that I think we could open that up for conversation with those departments to figure out if more hours um, are warranted or it, people are interested in doing that, I think it's a good place to start as we ease in. Mm -hmm. And then um, last question, is there, and I know we talked about this in the subcommittee, but um, will there be any additional kind of wellness activities in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade? You know, it's so hard that kids take that semester of wellness in 9th grade, but what a 9th grader needs around, you know, sexuality, gender, health, all of that is so different than what a 12th grader needs. Will there be any I will challenge you to hold on that until we okay. get to the wellness section. All right. We have some it. new courses. Is that okay or do you want oh, me to jump Oh, well, I understand you have new courses, but not every student would take a new course. It would be... Um, I'm excited about the new courses, yeah. by the way. So. so not everyone would... They could. That would yeah. be one of the options. We are also 
we have approved doing a flex block for next year and so that would also be a time that we could incorporate flex block act activities to do more physical activity but also wellness seminars um, there's nothing plan that we are making mandatory at this point mm -hmm. and I would think that's a conversation for us to continue to have. I remember in the subcommittee meeting you mentioned the idea of doing some wellness, oh, yeah. um, you know, expos or whatever, yes. just tables or yes. some kind of something like that. That is true. So I really think that's a great idea to be able to try and continue that for the, you know, in a age appropriate way. Yes. So, yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if, like, do you know exactly how students are going to be informed of this new, like, process and what's going on? I just, I know that it it's, has seemed in the past years a bit hectic, the field trip program, um, and I'm just wondering if there are going to be any changes to that or, like, if there are new ways of implementing this that will just seem a little bit smoother or, uh, It yeah. definitely needs to be a little smoother, I agree. So a couple ways. One, when students are signing up for or registering for classes, okay. which is coming up, right. we will, and we showcase all of our classes and we let people know what the new requirements are. That will be one way we notify students right. of this new um, PE experience. The other way, Eleanor, is in flex block next year, we mm -hmm. will have what's called Mentor Mondays. And on Mentor Mondays, students will have a, a time to be able to talk with their teacher who is scheduling them for their flex block. And that's where we could also say, hey, don't forget, there's an open gym. Or today, you're, there's like a hula hoop contest for flex block, or whatever it is. Okay. Got it? Great. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank, thank you. you. I'm member boss. And Thank you, and thank you for this. And also, as part of that subcommittee that Member Busansky spoke of, I'd, another thing we mentioned that I just want to make sure the public and other students think about is there's so many great clubs at the high school that could count toward this that aren't sports teams per se, like Mountain Biking Club, Outdoors Club, some of that stuff as well. We even had a, a slight conversation about marching band being yes. able to count. Marching band. And that meets a whole different group of students, but I think it's worthy. Okay, moving on to page 13, you'll notice that we have made two additions to um, this page that's titled Colleges and Universities Admission Standards. We have never had written in here that NCAA eligibility for college athletes includes having courses that have been pre-approved by the NCAA, so that now is just made crystal clear. We've put that in the program of studies. And often universities ask questions about, or colleges ask questions about integrated math, and our common statement is that they are comparable to algebra one, two, and geometry, so we made sure to write that there. Um, next page, under graduation requirements, it is currently a requirement that students participate, um, well we made it very clear here, minimum of four academic courses must be scheduled per year. So this is just, it's usually advised and we have just added this to the program of studies. We also took out a big section here that used to be called credit recovery because we're not running a summer school program right now. We had been doing some online summer school programming, but we don't have the capacity to staff that right now. Can I just ask, does it yeah. define what is meant by an academic course somewhere or? You know that, I asked that too, and so that would be something from the four core, math, any math, social studies, science, English. Language? And world and language, yes. Sorry, Member Lee. Um, where do students go to get the information about how to how to recover credits, if not here? Mm -hmm. So summer school really is the only not credit recovery thing that has been offered to opportunity that's been offered to students. Everything else has been made on an individual basis. So if we have student who is behind in credits, they're meeting with their counselor. We have spreadsheet after spreadsheet that's monitoring and tracking their credits. So we are talking to them all along the way about opportunities to do that, whether it's through our Twilight program or it's through an online class or an enrichment in the summer, something like that. So that's really done on an individual basis. Okay. So is there, I'm, I'm just thinking about this as an opportunity for parents to get information that may not be shared with them from directly from their students. And so just thinking about maybe something that says, 
here's where people will go to get information about credit right. recovery? So, so yeah, if a, there's a student who's behind in credits, they get multiple notifications sent home to parents and meetings with parents. That happens through uh, STARS, which is our at-risk student team, or SAT. Um, um, SST, excuse me. And so they know that it's happening, and when we send home a letter, it says these are things that you can do to retrieve credits. You can make, a, you can, like the things I just mentioned. And then just the last point, it still has credit recovery in the um, table of contents. Oh, so thanks. you might want to remove that. I'll let Jeff take Thank you. Alan Court catch up here. Um, I just want to go back to the academic courses and sure. since you're adding that, just suggest that maybe it would, I think it would make sense to define what they are there for people so that you save yourself from somebody arguing something's an academic course if it isn't defined. Okay. Thank just, you. It just makes it more clear, I think. Sorry, just to, oh, can I? Member Hardin. <laughs> <laughs> um, just like a clarifying question is, so are the four <laughs> academic courses, are they now like mandatory? Is that is it mandatory? I or is that just like a recommendation that's now been put into the uh, program of studies? You, have, you must have, you, it's always been mandatory. Okay. We've never written it in. And okay. so now, because it's come up again and again, now it's there in writing. Okay, thank you. It also counts as a Smith class or a dual enrollment class or something like that. Those count as well. Okay. So the rest of the document, or the rest of the um, the text here that's in highlights, it, it really has just been condensed or made clearer. There's no significant changes. The next page, 16, and my on my notes is the addition of Project Lead the Way, and we recently, which is a national program, we recently this week were, were notified that we received a $40,000 grant to support uh, a computer, a Project Lead the Way computer science class. We had also applied for a biomedical class, but unfortunately did not receive that grant. But we are super excited about the computer science. And basically this is an accelerated class where students have the opportunity to earn college credits and they can also, um, students of this class are engaging in real world challenges, they are engaging in project-based learning. Um, they're creating online tools and workshops and things like online art galleries or um, there's a number of different um, opportunities for making things like the automation uh, to process and analyze DNA sequence. So there's just a number of different real hands-on opportunities for students to participate in through Project Lead the Way. And again, this counts as an accelerated course, which we are hoping will, which we know will help increase our accountability data around enrolling students in um, accelerated coursework. Member Voss. Um, just to clarify, so we didn't get the grant in biomedical science, but we still have a path in it, is that right? Oh it, yes, okay. it was just, just additional, sure. class. It, there were yes. just a couple additional classes. So um, there's not really any changes on page 19 in regard to IT pathways. It's just cleaned up. It just looks visually nicer. Sorry. No sorry. Tell me if this is not the right avenue of time to be asking these questions, okay. and I can we can talk about it offline. Sure. I'm just curious about on page 17, this is not a change, but the, the rationale behind um, Smith courses or all of these other additional college and career course options um, counting towards credit requirements but not graduation requirements. Is this an appropriate time to talk about the philosophy behind that or do you want me to save that for another time? Um, you can certainly ask the question as an informational question. Sure. You, so can you just restate it please? Yeah. Can you just talk about the philosophy behind why the, behind the decision for the um, additional college and career course options that are listed here to count towards credit requirements but not graduation requirements. 
so students are required to have all of their graduation requirements be Northampton High School classes and taught by Northampton High School teachers. And so these classes are, you typically students enroll in these classes are juniors and senior year after most people have done mo all of their requirements in the high school. The philosophy is, is that we, these are classes for enrichment and we would like students to make sure, we, we want students to be educated and earn their diploma and all of their requirements from our school and our program and curriculum that we have approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so it looks like there's not, unless there's any questions between that page and page 26. The next section is on page 26 where there is a change in the course offerings under English senior English options. So here what's happened is we are offering some courses to be every other year classes, alternating electives. So many of our seniors have an opportunity to take, to choose which senior class they want to, or which elective English class they want to count as their English credit. And um, we're just going to alternate those classes from one year to the next so we can make sure we have um, decent enrollment where we can have rich class conversations and it's not lower than 15 students in a class because it impairs the instruction. So that's every other year. Page The next page you'll see where it says great short stories. That will be an additional class. The curriculum's not written, but that will be for the 2021-22 year. We included it here. So as kids are planning and looking at the course offerings, they can consider what they might want to take when they're a senior. Member Fallon. Um, the great short story to say that I do love um, what you've done with that, and I love that it's presented as a no homework course because mm -hmm. I know that some students are really struggling to balance the load um, as far as you know whether they're taking a school college class or whether they're kind of taking a class that's a little bit out of their reach. It's nice to have this to sort of balance it. So I, I'll be interested to see how that works out. I hope it's in the way that you intended it. Yes, and I'd like to say that this is um, created and birthed by Mr. Selfridge, so he can get all of the credit for that. It looks exciting. So the next changes ha happen on page 30. And next year will be our first year in rolling out the sequence of the history courses in order of grade 9 will be U.S. History 1, 10 U.S. History 2, or AP U.S. Grade 11 and 12 is World History or AP Euro. So that will be the rollout. Next year starts where um, US History 1 is only open to ninth graders. There may be a few 10th graders who take that if they were unable to schedule that in their, their course based on other conflicts, but that will be quite rare. I'm wondering, does that match with um What's on page 13? I gotta like quickly scroll back to page 13 with graduation requirements with this new rollout, or is that because it's? I just was trying to kind of match that up while you were talking about that. It says two courses, including one course in U.S. Oh, history. Oh no, we need to update that. Okay, thank you. Good catch. Yeah, <laughs> hired. Okay, so page 31. <laughs> Page 31, these changes here are mostly in regards to prerequisites or which grades they're open to and that has to do with the sequence. So AP US was never open to grade 10, but now it makes sense to open it to grade 10 because we're teaching US history 1 in grade 9, so it would make sense for these students to be able to take that. And this we took out for AP Euro, grade 10, and now it's only 11 and 12, again because of the sequence. Sorry. I know, just a question, also another clarifying question. The So a se you mean by a sequence of classes, so like there'll, there'll be less um, movement between different grades taking different classes? Um, so I, kn I know right now, like it's required in, as a ninth grader to take, what is it, just world history? Mm -hmm. I, it's changed since I was a ninth grader. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then U.S. history, I think, as a junior, or you need to take it. So are, is it just now that it's going to be you will take each of these classes in this specific grade? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I understand this. So I think what I just heard you say is, 10th graders used to be allowed to take AP European history? Or no, no, no. It was used only been 11th and 12th. Right. No, 10th graders could take Euro, AP Euro. Yeah. We took grade 10 out. So now yeah. it's only open to so 11 and 12. My question is does grade 10 need to be out? Because what if somebody took um, U.S. History 1 and U.S. History 2 freshman year? They can't take the current class cannot take U.S., cannot take world history their freshman year. They can only, and the prerequisites are U.S. History II or AP U.S. You can't take, you have to take that either your ninth or 10th grade year. So it looks to me so like you, the prerequisite is U.S. History II. Which you would take your 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. So you It could, doesn't say that here though. It looks like you could take that in the spring of your freshman year. AP US? No, 1302, United States History 2. Can a freshman take that? On the previous page, page 30 at the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. For US History 1 for class of 20, So U.S. History 2 should be taken for grades 10, should be taken in grades 10. And you're, okay, so that does not say that, you want it to say taken grades nine, in 10? I, I'm sorry that I'm not. Do you want me to ask my question again? Yeah, ask okay. my question again. Um, under U.S. History 2, the last course listed on page 30. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm reading that as a student could take that ninth or 10th grade the way it's written there, I believe. They should only be able to take it in grade. The current incoming class should only be able to take it in grade 10. Okay. For the class of 2023 and beyond. U.S. History 1 is taken first and then Grade 10 takes U.S. History 2 or AP U.S. So to make it. So I can write in there for grade 10. Above that 1301, it says only open to nine, grade 9 students. So, so we, we can this write one it here only to open. open to ninth or 10th yes. grade students. So I will write, have them write only open to grade 10. Okay. Um. I just want to, are you, does that satisfy that, the? It makes it work. Yes, for me. it makes it work. Um, I got it. I mean, a follow up question might be is that the way the history department wants it, or do they want ninth graders to be allowed to take it early and have access to these AP classes? I don't know. I just wanted it to be consistent. So right. It's only open to grade 10. We don't want hit okay. students doubling up in history okay. their freshman year. Then I'm happy. Is it? Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you're happy. Remember the uh, can you talk about the the reason why the history department wanted to get rid of world history? World history remains. They take world history in 11th or 12th grade. I see. But it, and it's a requirement. And it's a requirement. Got it. There was a division, but there was world history one and world history two. At this point two in the one. sequence, we're only doing world history. I'm yes. sorry, could you just explain a little bit about why this like change is happening? Like why are ninth graders not taking it in juniors and juniors are instead? Like why is this change happening? Sure, it has to do with the new alignment of standards um, from DESE and the vertical alignment from the middle school to the high school, making sure that there's no repetition. And we are also incorporating new standards. So we're following the recommended guidelines of the Department of Education. Okay, thank you. Sorry, member. I, I was just going to add. It, they changed the eighth grade standards, and that kind of pushed what what the high school standards look like. That's okay. what it really 
Good to know. Thank you. Oh, you were adding something. Okay. <clears throat> Our next. So the rest is more about what we just talked about in regards to the history standards. So the next big changes are under in the science department on page 39. Oh, can I yes. Stop you yes, you can stop. I just want to say how exciting it is to see AP government in US Oh, thank you. Politics. That's brand new, right? That is and Oh, yes, that is new. AP government and US politics. It will it's going to be based on enrollment numbers. Hopefully we get to run it, but we're pretty excited about adding a new AP class. Yes. I'm sorry, member. Please. Okay. So we're looking to see if we're just missing it, but Here we go. Uh, it's okay. just separated by quite a bit. Got it. Oh, the okay. world history? We're looking for the world history description. Oh, thank you. Okay, so that's on page 35, and the reason it's way in the back here is because it's not running, because currently we, will ha we won't have any students who are taking world history because they, everybody has taken it, and the incoming class, ninth grade class, will be starting the sequence, and they won't take it until their 11th, their junior year. So next year we won't have anyone in the building who will need world history. It's a little confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it might, again, as people are reading this and they're thinking ahead, it might be helpful to, because it's a requirement to have it in sequence. Right. Just a thought. It ha the rollout has been very confusing because the history, the history requirements have changed over the past two or three years. So there have been an abundance of changes that have been hard to keep up with. But I am hopeful that this will be the last required change. Here's to hoping. And also just add that on page 30, there's both sequences. So the required core sequence for classes 20, 21, 22, and then the required core sequence class of 23 and beyond so hopefully that will kind of help people too. Oh no that makes sense. Yeah yeah yeah. But because it says it's required and then it's really hard to find the description it that was the confusing piece. Right. So would we alleviate, uh, alleviate some confusion if it was included within the sequence with that note? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe in the, the core history courses section? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Just for people to be aware, I, I don't remember when, but last year we, as a school committee, did have a presentation on these big changes made in the history and why coming down. And so it was, it was discussed. So some of us have heard some of this, and I recognize some of us haven't, but I just want people to know that the school committee did get a fairly good briefing on it and was supportive of it. Okay, moving to science, page 39. We have simply changed some prerequisites on page 39. We removed physics as a prerequisite for earth and science. We removed, um, there's no longer, we, we took out the word and and added or, so biology or chemistry is a prerequisite now instead of both. And the same is true for environmental science. The next, so, page, yes. Under advanced placement environmental science, it's biology and chemistry. Is that accurate? That's true. So that stays the that same. Stays the the same. other two change to or. Right. Okay. The only change there was just some wording. Page 40. There are changes in the AP Physics 1 class. It has we, the current prerequisite is I am two. Prior to that, it was I am two and I am three. And in advanced placement physics two, the same case, it was I am three and it's now I am two. Okay, moving forward to math. There's a small edit to the core sequence recommendation. It states here in this um, synopsis at the top that it is now recommended that students do not double up in math courses in both ninth and 10th grade unless planning to take AP calculus in junior year. So what we found is kids rush through math and they're doubling up in math very early on and then they get to their senior year and they're just 
they don't want to take calculus and there aren't they have taken financial math in their junior year and there there aren't really a lot of math options that they're interested in and we are struggling to find or students just who are not interested in the accelerated classes don't have a math that seems um, or that they want to take so by having them spread out their math experience they will have more options towards the end Um, you'll notice on page 44 there were Sorry, some. Sorry, yeah. so I, had a, me. I had a question on 42. So I think this is new and it's not pink, but I compared it to last year's. And I just wanted to ask a question about the text with math placement policy. Math. Um, so I. Is it new? Is this new? I don't think this was in the. Maybe I missed it last year. But um, I like. I think. For people who don't have this in front of them, it just articulates how students will be placed in a math class when they arrive at the high school. And the thing that I wanted to clarify um, is the final bullet. It says, in all our integrated math courses, one, two, and three, students will be assessed within the first five days of the semester based on teacher observation, student engagement, and a pre-assessment to ensure appropriate course placement. And you know, this is a place where I have heard from a lot of community members of just, you know, different approaches depending on which classroom a, a student is in. And I think this is very helpful to make it more transparent to have this sort of statement in the course of studies. But when it says a pre-assessment, is that specifically a written something or uh, something that's written and not just the judgment of the teacher that somebody happens to get? So. Things that are observable are student engagement and teacher observation, but a pre-assessment is something written. It would be a written test. Okay. Great. Yeah. And I don't think this is new. What I think is new about it is it's in bullets. <laughs> Before, I think it was written as part of the narrative in the course sequence recommendations. Okay. So it's just, it was intentional in bulleting it to make it very clear and transparent. Member Seraphie Cox. It's there. Um, going back to the doubling up uh, in uh, ninth and tenth grade, um, are are students doubling up on math uh, math classes that are would be otherwise concurrent, or they're doubling up on say integrated math one and integrated math two in the same year? Right. So some many hmm, some students are taking I M one their freshman year, and then I M two their freshman year, and then their sophomore year they take I M three. And then they might take pre-calculus their sophomore year, and then it's junior year, and they don't want to do any AP classes, and they don't, you know. So then they could do financial math their junior year, but then it comes their senior year, and they're really struggling to find a math class that, that's suitable. So I'll just offer that I took uh, I took AP calculus in my junior year, and I did that requirement, and. I was going to be a professional dancer. I wasn't interested in going on and doing math, so I was interested in filling up my time doing other things. So I'm wondering, not necessarily that I want to discourage people from taking math, because obviously I'm not a professional dancer and <laughs> didn't go into that field for very long, but but maybe the the solution isn't to to stretch out that math experience, but to have course offerings that would be more interesting in the senior year. I, I don't, I'm we not absolutely a, agree. an expert on this, so yes. I, I, you know what, our math department would love to have more course offerings for electives. They've been wanting to teach discrete math. They've been wanting to do more financial math. This would mean need, needing more math teachers to be able to to suit that need, and having more math teachers isn't in our our budget right now. Um, member Fallon and then Member Sansky. I didn't actually have this question until you started talking about all of this. Um, so when we talk about summer learning loss, it's you know just a few months, not even three months. If a student's enrolled in the fall of one year for a math class and then goes all the way to the next fall and then all the way, I mean, is there a lot of learning loss that's happening that could have been avoided? Are we putting teachers essentially in the position of having to reteach a lot of what they already taught the prior year? I mean, is there some benefit to not having this spacing? I, like, it just seems like maybe when we when we talk about why students are struggling in math, it might be that they're, you know, they're taking so much time off in between math classes. So, 
there are people who make that argument and <laughs> and there are definitely schools that have that same situation. We aren't alone in that with a block schedule and with semesters. And what teachers are prepared to do, teachers who teach block schedules and semester classes, is that there is reteaching that happens right at the beginning. They do an assessment, pre-assessment in all their classes. They figure out what students need, how they need to differentiate the learning, and they're already prepared to catch kids back up because everyone comes to math in a different spot. Even students who go into math having a lot of knowledge, sometimes they may have missed a unit or they don't qu didn't quite grasp a certain um, learning standard. And so teachers are really prepared to be able to catch students up and align themselves with whatever the standard is that they're working on. Sansky. So I'm curious about how it says, um, JFK students who by choice and or by teacher recommendation require year-long integrated math course will register for integrated math 1A, I, I get that part. But why don't we do the same for students who should be accelerated and be skipping IM 1, 2, or 3? It seems like in that last bullet point, it's really hard to do in the first five days to have teacher observation and student engagement. I get how you can give a pre-assessment test in the first five days, but you know, a teacher can't observe them, it doesn't get to know them in the way that a teacher's had them as, you know, for the entire year. Why not in the eighth grade <coughs> at JFK if a teacher's saying that a student needs two semesters, you know, needs to slow down math, why wouldn't that same teacher also be given the opportunity to say this, te this student's really ready to accelerate? And same with a teacher in IM1 or IM2. It seems to me at the end of the semester would be the time to do all of that rather than at the beginning of the semester. I also think it puts kids, students at a real disadvantage to then have to come into a class late. We're saying on the one hand, you have to drop a class within three days, but we're giving ourselves more time. I mean, it's very hard for a student to, to switch from IM1 to IM2, you know, a week or two into it. So it just seems like we should be, you know, kind of pushing that all back to the end of the semester the same way we do with kids who need more help and more support. Why wouldn't we do that for the flip side? So there's about the same number of students who need an extended IM1 class as there are for students who skip over to IM2. So there were about 11 students this year who um, took a pre-assessment and were able to move into an IM2 class. All students in eighth grade are working and preparing for the IM1 curriculum, so all students are going into IM1. The students who struggle with math are still going into IM1. It's just a year-long experience. So everyone's getting IM1. All kids are getting IM1, even if it is a year long. But it's the same number based on a whole different way of assessing them. So those kids who are are slowing down so they can take it over the course of a long year being that's being determined by their teacher at the end of eighth grade so the so maybe there'd be a lot more kids so the assessment for students who need a year-long IM1 is about um, being able to process and how much time and speed they need to process the information and less about the particular standards and the content. It's really about being taught the material in a slower pace over a longer period of time. Member Voss. So I was going to ask about this same question as part of that bullet. And just to add to what Member Busansky just said, um, it seems like this needs more conversation. A lot, it, it, another bullet here talks about if out of district students get placed the, in an appropriate math course based on their transcript. And as you said, there are kids coming from JFK who are able to skip over integrated math one or, you know, what maybe it's a language placement. But it, it feels to families, and I agree with what I'm hearing from many families that. If you could sign up for the appropriate class as an eighth grader, it, it puts our in-district kids on the same playing field as the kids coming in from out of district. They, have, they know what they're going to take when they get to the high school. They're not faced with five days into the semester being said, oh, you can go into a different math, but it isn't this period, so you're going to take it next semester, or you're going to get a choice of these three classes, and maybe they don't want to take those three classes. So. Some of them just stay in IM1, even if it isn't necessarily where they should be. So I, I just feel like it treats our 
students who go through JFK differently from students who are coming in and any student entering our high school if they know the IM1 material should be given an opportunity to go on and take IM2 so that they can take advantage of all the other great stuff at the high school. So I appreciate that you started your statement with um, I would really like to have more conversation about this because I know that my department chair and my math department would also like to engage in more conversation about this and I trust them as the professionals of math. I believe they know math inside and out and will have all of the answers to those questions and be able to um, engage in some meaningful discourse if invited or if they were to take part in a conversation. So I would love to just invite you or invite them to have that conversation with you. And if I could just add to that, I think um, I would really welcome that and I think it's more than us and like you said, the professionals, but it's also the families and the people who are choosing to send their kids to our schools, that we should be listening to the experiences and understanding how to make it equitable for everybody and give everybody the best learning that they can get. So I don't know how we, maybe Dr. I guess Provost we have to look at the idea. data that might show that our students are not feeling challenged by math or not excelling in math because, you know, my perception is that all of our students are excelling in math and they're doing some amazing work with math and they're really engaging in mathematics and our test scores are showing that they are steadily rising and achieving in mathematics. So I think we have a big conversation to be had and I think we have to look carefully at some of that data Dr. to support what we're both I, saying. I think this uh, is something that probably could be answered quickly and may not have to be part of that conversation that you're discussing. but. Um, to Member Bozanski's question, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't part of the reason why the difference between students who may need an IM1 AB versus a student who could go into IM2 is that for planning purposes, you need to know how many sections of an IM1 A you need to create while you're developing the schedule in the summer, as opposed to a student who may start an IM1 and then get accelerated would be going into an IM2 that's already part of the schedule? That's true. We have 11, we currently have nine sections of IM1 and three sections of IM1 AB. And so that changes from year to year based on the needs, right? And then we do have an equivalent number of IM2 classes, nine sections, so students can easily move into those sections. I'll just second the desire to have a, a future conversation. Um, and to bring in the appropriate stakeholders and the math teachers who really are the experts. And I would I, I ideally include the math teachers from the middle school as well. Um, because like uh, Member Voss, for me, the one of the most common things that I've heard in my emails from, from um, community members is a desire to really look at math and, and a feeling that their students are not receiving the appropriate um, challenge in the curriculum and so just an opportunity to have more conversation I think would be really uh, a really good up, uh, next step. Yes. I think to kind of go back to the point about um, like how encouraging spreading out of math classes I'm a little like weary on that um, I, f I feel like there are a good amount there are I, I believe there's just regular calculus that you can take in your junior or senior year, and correct me if I'm wrong, regular statistics, is that true? Um, I don't know. I don't have the, pan, the program of studies in front of me, but I, don't, I'm, I feel like d discouraging students from taking math classes in their earlier years may not be the way to go about it. I feel like, like encouraging students to take more math classes in their senior, junior, or senior year, you know, and saying these are the classes that we have available if you don't want to take, um, you know, AP or honors level courses. I, I don't know. I, I think based on my experience, though, like regular, and I mean, I've been taking more advanced level math classes in, in throughout my high school years, but it, seems to me that like regular calculus and, and regular statistics and financial math aren't as encouraged to take for students to take as AP level classes um, and I think for students who don't want to take AP level classes I think it should be more encouraged to 
it's like students should be encouraged to take just the math classes that are available in their junior and senior year rather than discouraged from taking more math and math classes in their freshman and sophomore year that's I don't know I think that's my opinion so every student's encouraged to take math every year I want to be super clear and right. this is not intended to discourage students it's intended to recommend that they they consider their trajectory as a math student and where they want to end up and make sh and to be mindful of which classes they are taking along the way. Okay, I think, yeah, and I think it's definitely helpful to be mindful of the, the broader picture of, you know, all four years, but I think it it's possible that it could be interpreted by students as, you know, oh, you shouldn't take two math classes in your freshman year. Um, and I just want to be conscious of that, I think. Okay. Tiptoeing away from math and into the language, world language. It looks very clean. Um, everything is, everything remains the same until page 52, where you see there's a split between the Honors Latin 5 classes. There are two sections. One is Advanced Latin Seminar, and the other is Topics in Latin Literature. Um, these run on alternate years, so that's just a new change. Then the next changes are, you'll see the descriptions on page 55 for the two additional Project Lead the Way classes. One is Computer Science A. If this is comparable to what used to be uh, computer, AP Computer Science. And it's basically a quick question. Yes. Sorry, just no, no, back to ASL is not being offered. Do we think it will be again? Oh, did I skip ASL. It was oh, you have world language. Yeah, page fifty-two. ASL currently isn't being offered. It has. It has been nearly. Right now, we're offering it as a dual enrollment class, and we have a GCC instructor coming in and teaching the ASL class. Students really love it, but they're taking it as a dual enrollment. We've really had a hard time filling the position for a .33, which is one class taught a semester. It's very hard to find a certified teacher to do that for one class. So unless we had the ability to open it up to be a full-time position, it's impossible to run. So we'll con encourage it as dual enrollment, gotcha, but not as a Northampton High School class. So the other um, Project Lead the Way class is Computer Essentials on page 55. The descriptions are right there. Again, what's this, this one takes the place of an AP class. The other one takes the place of what was once um, an honors computer coding and Python class. The next page, 56, the robotics and AI class. This is, I, this is, they wrote in this comment here that um, it no longer counts as a science requirement. It never did count as a science requirement. I'm sorry that that is there. It just, it's, in, it's considered a technology elective. Member Foss. I'm curious if any of these classes, for example, web design, um, do any of them count for the art requirement? Wood technology does. Wood tech does. Yeah. I don't think web design okay. does. I, I'm just I'm putting that out there. If I, I'm not quite sure which of these are brand new, but it just is something to consider as we add these because there might it might be appropriate. The ones that do count as a class are identified as counting as a fine arts requirement or art requirement. Okay. But no. Robotics and web design are not considered art requirements or web design. Okay, so page 58 is really just a, a change in some wording. And then Page 60 has the course offerings for the every other year classes. So these are the offerings for 2020, 2021. P 
page 63, there's just a change in clarity in the title, Jazz and Rock Improv Workshop. It was just Improv Workshop, but that wasn't clear enough to students, so enrollment, we think, may have been lower because they weren't quite sure what that class was, so now it's crystal clear. And then on page 67, we move into the wellness education courses, and here you'll see there is a yoga and mindfulness class and contemporary health. This is a seminar class. Um, it's going to explore a number of different issues. It's only open to grades 11 and 12. This year, uh, Trish Armstrong finished her professional development and certification as a yoga instructor. Um, and so she'll be teaching yoga as part of a PE class. And that's all that is new for wellness. Oh, I'm sorry, remember. Um, I hope you're volunteering to teach a dance class. <laughs> How did you know that my question was going to be about dance? Yes. <laughs> um, there is an amazing dance community in this community uh, and in the broader valley. I'm surprised to not see a dance class. Can you talk about how that did not come about? Well, currently we have one PE teacher, and that PE teacher is also um, the one teacher that teaches physical education is also responsible for teaching wellness. So we really aren't able to run very many PE classes. We run one a semester, sometimes two. And so within the course of the PE class, there are different opportunities for different types of physical fitness. Some may include dance. I haven't seen Salem Derby um, teach dance yet, but it doesn't mean that he can't have um, some guest speakers come in. Also, I keep thinking about the flex block, which is really going to give us a lot of opportunity to bring in community people to lead some enrichment activities, which could be all kinds of multicultural dancing or uh, modern dance or things of that nature, which could be great in a flex block. So I'm not against it. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about dance in the context of PE, because I was actually looking for it in the performing arts mm -hmm. section. Uh, it, feels more akin to me, uh, akin to theater, than it does to gym class. Uh, I, I know it's called PE, but yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, it just uh, in like in terms of maybe even like a creative movement or or um, um, choreography um, class. I think I absolutely agree. Nothing <laughs> would be more successful. Um, I will ask Mr. Eldridge if he'd like to lead that <laughs> class, but really he's the only performing arts teacher and um, you know he does often have guests who come in and do different things within his, his drama courses, but at this point it's just not in the budget to have um, those opportunities, which is unfortunate. Okay, so the last edit or the last change in this program of studies is on page 69 and this is under um, oh it's not a change but it has it came up as a question that I knew might be asked which is why um, or how did it get mentioned in the program of studies uh, that the course for learning strategies was considered a pass-fail course and so that was approved in the program of studies for this school year, so it was approved last year, and it remains in the program of studies. It was a decision that was made by the special de special education department, and um, has been included on all special education teacher syllabi and on our website as being with a rubric of how students are graded for a pass fail grade. So, yeah, and, and I had some folks asking me about this and so I asked about it too and I guess one question I have is are any other courses pass fail or is this the only one? Oh thanks for that. So yeah. yes right in the beginning um, page 16 lists all of the courses that are oh, nope not there Oh, okay. Right in the front under the marking system and grade point average, page 10, it says pass fail courses. Students will receive a pass or fail, a pass for satisfactory work, a fail for unsatisfactory work. Um, 
pass-fail classes are not calculated into the GPA. The following courses are pass-fail, internship, teacher assistant, work study, tech management, and learning strategies courses. So what I'm hearing you say is the there was a process through um, the special ed teachers and the teachers who um, work in learning strategies that recommended that this be pass-fail. Mostly because the special education teachers strongly believe that a service, a special education service should not be graded because all students progress on their goals in different ways and the learning strategies classes are really designed for students to be working on their individual goals. And so being able to um, offer a grade for students on how they're achieving their goals is really hard to measure. They're not based on standards or um, any particular curriculum at this point. And so it makes sense to be able to um, assess students based on their willingness or ability to engage in their personal goals in their special education goals and not give them a grade on how well they're achieving that goal because that differs for all students. So, so just to share the perspective that was shared with me which I am sympathetic towards so I want to put it out there. Sure. Um, students who are taking learning strategies are taking that as 25 percent of their courses some of them throughout their entire high school career and so not allowing them to choose perhaps to have a grade versus pass fail for this potentially puts them at a disadvantage if they're applying for college and they can't try to earn a good grade in one of in 25 percent of their classes um, and I guess when I read the description of learning strategies and my understanding is students are really learning executive function skills and learning what their strengths are and how to get better at certain things and working toward them um, to me, that feels like something, you know, and I, I don't want to tell you all how to do it. I'm just putting this out there, trying to make things better for all our students, right? Th those are things I think you can grade by asking students to reflect on, did you set goals? How close did you come to meeting them? And I don't see why that's any harder to grade than a PE class, for example, or some of these other classes in, in here. So I'll, I'd, I guess I'd, again, like to just put back maybe there could be another not this group, but a conversation about this with the students and the families that are affected by this decision and just have an open mind and listening to their perspectives on it because I think there's a, a bigger conversation. There's always room for conversation, yeah. absolutely. And I, and I want to point out that every class, so a couple things are happening at the high school which are really exciting and as we're ro ro rolling them out. One is that we're really looking at how to grade habits of work and we're also looking at grading academic classes and all classes based on assessments and the standards that are being taught. So um, even with physical education classes there are uh, state standards that are measurable for meeting those classes and with all technology classes there are standards and so until we have a curriculum for learning strategies that can be measured. Right now we're just going on what is a pass-fail. I just want to read you what the special education teachers say in their syllabus. Um, it states, progress and IEP goals will be provided quarterly as required by special education regulations. Progress reports are not associated with a course grade, but rather are required by law as part of the IEP process. Learning strategies term grades will be recorded as pass-fail based on the completion of assigned learning strategy tasks that focus on skills in areas of academics, organization, study skills, transition planning, and meeting classroom expectations. So I agree with you that there's room to have the conversation. I do trust that the teachers tried to make some thoughtful decisions around it. I too have had conversations with some caregivers and um, it, it is concerning that somehow the communication wasn't made as clear or they didn't feel as if they were a part of the decision making and that's always um, an important takeaway and that is always upsetting to hear. So there are definitely, there's definitely space for more conversation. Mr. Messing was... So I'm really uh, glad that we have the opportunity to have the conversation about where learning strategy fits in, how it's assessed. Um, a lot of this comes with trying to separate learning strategies, the course, 
from the service, the special education service that's intended. So we talk a lot about the 25% of students' experience, and that really speaks to the heart of the matter. One of the things that we've tried over the last three years to do is increase flexibility for multidisciplinary teams, for IEP teams, to make thoughtful choices about the amount of service and the nature of that service for students who need it. So coming into the 17-18 school year, essentially, outside of some of our specialized programs, specifically our intellectually uh, impaired program at the high school, if you were receiving special education services, it was almost a given that you were getting five by 83 or 83 minutes a day of learning strategies, nearly irrespective of your actual needs. You can expect you know, the burden that that puts on teachers to try and meet a wide array of need within that 83 minute block. What it also does is severely limit IEP teams in being able to make uh, thoughtful judgments about frequency and duration so that two students with widely discrepant uh, needs have essentially the same option. So uh, conversations that we were having were twofold. One was how do we ensure the logistical benefits of having learning strategies the service, the specialized instruction service, um, accounted for within the schedule? How do we make sure we have enough sections, we can deploy special ed teachers appropriately, we can fit other classes around it to make sure all students have full schedules without some of these negative detriments? A lot of what we saw it cuts the other way as well because just like we're concerned about students being negatively impacted about going to a pass-fail model in the way you described, what we saw by and large for the vast majority of our students, some of our most vulnerable students were having a situation where they were being negatively impacted grade-wise on assessments for receiving a service. So when we were talking about equity for, for us as a department at the high school, we were very, very concerned that uh, students were be receiving failing marks for engaging in a service. Uh, that if we were to think about occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, it, we wouldn't be having any, any type of discussion the same way. So certainly there are, there's a lot of discussion to have about it, but the thinking was to make sure that students weren't being negatively impacted on the uh, other end, certainly what we uh, think of our most struggling students, you know, the students for whom we're trying to lift the floor, but also it's a really concerted effort uh, in line with a couple of other steps that we've taken uh, last year and into this year to really provide more options for students with regard to executive functioning, specialized instruction, and still maintain options for learning strategies. Specifically, all the work that's gone into the flex block and providing opportunities for all students to have some of that flexible opportunity during the school day that doesn't require them to stay after, that doesn't raise all of those equity issues, um, but also to be able to make decisions for students. For those students who need 83 minutes every day, great, awesome. For those students who need half that or twice a minute, you know, twice a week, three times a week, whatever the case may be, that was really part of it. So the pass-fail piece was one small uh, change that was part of this larger to separate the service of learning strategies from the course. Because without doubt, there's a lot of logistical and, and functional uh, benefits of having it associated as a class in the same way it is in this building, for example. But there are many more potentially unintended consequences that limit folks' uh, experiences. So that's really where we came into it, uh, certainly last year when this change was made. So, Member Voss, you had a follow-up? I just have a question yes. about Dr. something. Dr. Yeah, um, so do some students who aren't taking learning strategies, not needing to go to learning strategies for the full period, five days a week, are they getting a grade in whatever class they're going to? So you're talking about some need it 83 minutes every day, but who, what do they do if they don't need that? They would go to largely a general ed course. They, they'd have the opportunity. So again, the major concern with learning strategies every day for your entire high school yeah. career is that you're missing an opportunity to participate in another class. So for example, we've done a couple of things. We've been able to, at the edges, create some specific situations where students are receiving right. uh, smaller pieces out of another class, limiting their impact. So if a student is taking, going to strategies twice a week and chorus three times a week, they get a pass and a .5 credit for learning strategies and a .5 credit for chorus or something like that. that, that was and the grade for chorus and a pass for learning strategies. And so chorus is graded. Chorus is graded if they go to chorus. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, um, students 
Also in lieu of learning strategies may take a learning lab, which is more of a drop-in space where if they are in an English class and they are in moment, in time, needing support with writing, they can, be, they can ask to go and see a support teacher to get some one-on-one -on -one support with writing, and that's a learning lab. That's just another opportunity that students have who don't want to take 83 minutes of strategies every day. I'll just end by saying I, I'm concerned for a student who gets a .5 credit in chorus and gets a grade in chorus and, do, and gets, doesn't get a grade in learning strategies compared to the student who really needs to be in learning strategies full time and therefore gets 25% of their entire high school experience potentially pass fail. That just doesn't, I, I can understand why people are concerned and I'll leave it there to you. There are standards for it. chorus. Just. So you know, there are. I, I, yes. I would challenge you all to think about standards for learning strategies if we're asking students to spend that much of their day. And I can understand if they're spending 83 minutes a week, that's a service and different. But if we're asking them to spend an entire 25% of their high school time in there. And, and then just for me, one of the things, like some neighboring districts, in fact, utilize this as more of a structured academic support with a standalone curriculum. The concern that we have is arbitrary limiting students because not all the students that are sitting in the same learning strategies have the same need. So it, we are looking at, and, and teachers have been working really diligently to try and identify ways to respect that. We're talking about habits of work and the rubrics that go into that so we can respect the work they're doing and assess it appropriately. But the concern is not all students going into a period one, period two, period three, or four learning strategies are working on the same thing. So for two students, even two students that have math goals that are being supported, not all of them are receiving uh, the same specific uh, outcome, which is why it's it, IEP goal driven, which is the, for me the main um, sort of confounding factor when we're talking about providing a grade. Because now we're talking about providing two students whose the desired outcome and the expectation of them each day is widely different. And then we're talking about how to grade them both appropriately in that way. There are a host of, of issues that come up, which is why I think further discussion is, is appropriate. Um, but that would be my concern with, you know, with saying, hey, everybody who's in a learning strategy should be assessed the same way on some default set of standards, for example. Member Fenton. Um, so maybe this is just a mandate for the community talking about um, is there a reason we can't call it credit, no credit versus pass fail? Because when you say to me a student fails a therapeutic service, I'd rather hear that they don't receive credit. Like to me, that's some like it, I don't know if there's a difference in the educational world between those two things, but to me they're the same with the difference of how you feel receiving no credit versus fail. So, so you want to so pass they do receive a credit. And fail would be no credit, but all students receive credit in the class if they pass. So you would prefer to say pass or no credit? Well, no. The, I mean, I'm just credit saying, it, no in the, like in the university setting, credit, no credit versus pass, fail, they're kind of interchangeable. Okay. So I'm saying, sure. There seems to be like a, there's a little bit of a psychological edge to telling, like, to have this being pass, fail mm -hmm. to me. And if it, if it were all the same, I feel like having it be credit, no credit would be somehow more appropriate. And the same for all the other classes that count as pass-fail? Those would be credit, no credit, too? I didn't, I'm didn't. i sorry, I don't remember how many others there just were. Just intern, work, study, TA. It was just when you said you would be, it's a therapeutic service and then to be given a grade of failing, that feels terrible to me. To, like, and, and I imagine that feels terrible to the student who's worked really hard or to the family. So if, if there were the opportunity to that. not say you failed, but to say, you're not receiving credit, somehow that feels like more appropriate. Okay. But it was just a thought. Thank you. <laughs> just uh, uh, riffing off of the university model, there's also the potential to think about uh, allowing students or families maybe to choose between credit, no credit, and a grade. And that might speak to getting at some of what you've just discussed. But I'll just, it's completely up to you, just a thought. Um, Dr. Provost. Uh, I just want to offer a few thoughts on this. First, I would point out that um, 
Creating a curriculum and giving a grade creates its own set of problems. Um, I worked in a district where we had this course there. It was called um, Study Skills. And so there was a Study Skills curriculum. Students went through it. They usually took it freshman year because the idea was that it was set to set them up with the skills they needed to have to be successful for the rest of their experience. Um, so they got a grade and they got a credit. But then there, and the, one of the de downsides to that is they weren't getting the kind of support that students are currently getting in this class. Instead of getting help in the other content classes, they were getting additional content. Um, and then what happened was some students actually wanted to continue to have that course because they felt that they did get some help, but a lot of what they got was writing help. Um, and then we were in the position, and the position of that high school was, okay, well, you've already passed it. So we can put you in the course and you can take it again, but now we can't give you another grade because you've already passed it, and we can't give you any credit because you've already passed it. So that's a, um, that's a situation they had. So that creates its own problem. I'm just saying that, that um, every solution creates other problems. Um, the other thing that I'd say is I just want to encourage to continue to explore the options because I think that really is your answer. Yes. Um, right? Creating the learning labs, I think, was a great um, way of expanding services. It addressed the need um, of not locking up 25% of somebody's schedule with services that might be over-servicing them and taking them out of learning opportunities in other classes. Um, the uh, flex block will create more opportunities to do that. And the last thing I want to say is this really comes down to choice, right? So we talk about locking up um, kids' schedules, and that actually does happen, but that's only with consent, right? I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever gone to the BSEA to ask a hearing officer to force a child to take the class. If, if the child's parents and the teachers feel that it's not in their best interest, then we wouldn't do that. So, um, but the more choices you have, the more things people have to pick from, the less sort of Sophie's choices they'll face. Thank you. Okay, so that completes the um, program of studies. Um, we are required to take a vote on that uh, as a school committee, so I would entertain a motion. To approve the um, Northampton uh, High School Program of Studies as presented. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Principal Valancourt. And uh, next we will move on to a report uh, from Dr. Cheevers on the uh, NPS curriculum. So first, I, I just want you to know that I'm happy to come back and teach dance after I retire. <laughs> it sounds like a lovely thing to do. I would really enjoy it. Um, but no, never. <laughs> so um, good evening, everyone. Tonight, I want to begin with gratitude. Earlier this evening, we had our Academy Awards for teacher, curriculum teacher leaders. Um, we had a red carpet with several curriculum teacher leaders, many of whom are in the room tonight, and I would like all the curriculum teacher leaders to please stand up and be recognized. We lost a few, it's getting late, tired. <laughs> but these wonderful people have spent hours and hours writing curriculum for the Northampton Public Schools and I couldn't be more proud to stand next to them, to collaborate with them, and it's just been a wonderful, joyous, joyous, uh, and hard work. Um, it's been a long, long journey, and we are at a resting place, but not a stopping place. Um, collective, do you, do yes. you mind telling us their names and what areas 
they work on just because I don't know a lot so, of people. So, for your Thank convenience, you. I have given you a handout. Okay. If you look on the handout, and I was just about to say a couple of things about the handout, um, the names of all of our curriculum teacher leaders are listed there and their number of years of service. Mm -hmm. And we have several people with us tonight who have been here for four and five years. Uh, so these are very, very dedica dedicated workers um, in our district. Collectively, they have written 173 courses with more than 600 units. Some of these dedicated and talented teachers um, have worked as long as four and five years. It's, it's pretty amazing. Some of these specially trained uh, teachers um, also qualify for the Lifetime Achievement Award and, and those will be forthcoming. Over the past five or, four, five or six years, we have had many challenges, not the least of which are the constant updates, as you have heard earlier tonight, about the Massachusetts Curriculum Framework Standards. Specifically, we've had updates and brand new standards for math, English, language, arts, history, social studies, technology, science, and most recently, the arts. Not to mention, as we've discussed somewhat tonight, the changing subject area requirements, most specifically for history. And we've had to rewrite those, those uh, courses a couple of times. Our most recent course, which I will share a little bit about with you this evening, is our civics course, our eighth grade civics course, which is coming along very nicely. Uh, our successes also include uh, winning several grants that have paid for our summer curriculum camps. Most recently, just last week, we got another $30,000 grant to fund our civic engagement curriculum camp we run the last week of June this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, we have also been recognized by the state twice for our curriculum writing training our structure and our teacher expertise. We have presented twice at the state title conferences with regard to our curriculum writing process, and we were featured in the Massachusetts Department of Education's curricular newsletter. And we have shared our transfer goal expertise at the ASCD conference. That was a couple of years ago. Our teachers, these teachers have worked during the summers after school, on snow days. We had plans to come in today and work for the entire day if in fact there was a snow day. People were going to walk in their boots. Seriously. During release time and even during vacations. February vacation, April vacation, and obviously over the summer. Curriculum work means working outside of the school day, even outside of the school year. In many districts, curriculum is directed from the top down, and teachers have little say over its structure, materials, or the themes that align it within subject areas or across subjects and grades. This is not the case in Northampton, where our talented and, and passionate uh, teacher body work collaboratively to create courses and units specifically to the needs of our students. So my agenda for the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, is as follows. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about what curriculum is, how does a uh, curriculum contribute to the success of a school district, what is our curriculum writing process, how is our curriculum stored and what is included, and what are our next steps. And I'll take you through a few of the sample units so you can see what they look like and where they're found <coughs> on our district website. So curriculum, I think about curriculum like a blueprint. If you're going to build a house, you have a blueprint. If you're going to build knowledge and understanding in a, in a child, you need a blueprint. It's a blueprint for learning that is derived from desired results. Content and performance standards. Curriculum takes content and shapes it into a plan for how to conduct effective and engaging teaching and learning. It's more than a list of topics. It's a map 
for how to create the desired student performances. How does the uh, curriculum contribute to the success of a school district? It provides a content-based resource for deep critical outcome analysis. It provides an essential component to an equitable education. It provides a resource for ELL, special education, and all educators to support our diverse learners and their peers. It provides opportunities to link professional development, curriculum, and district improvement, and it provides all stakeholders with an opportunity to learn about our district curricula. So, the first thing provides a content-based resource for deep critical outcome ana analysis. Here are some examples. These are some of the things that we can think about now that we have a curriculum. What opportunities does the curriculum provide for civic engagement across subject areas? We're going to take up that this summer and I can't wait. What content and skills are we teaching and when and are they consistent with our district values and goals? To what extent are our summative assessments asking students to think critically and how are we measuring that outcome? What technology standards are taught in a grade span, let's just say grades six through eight, and do they prepare students for ninth grade? Issues of alignment. To what extent are students writing across the curriculum and what are the expected outcomes? What are students learning about the idea of relationship consent, K through 12, in our wellness and our health curricula? And what are the opportunities for social emotional learning within units? Next, a curriculum provides an essential component to an equitable education. It guarantees a high quality common outcome based plan for each subject area and grade level. It assesses all students with the same measurement tool and descriptors, expectations with adjustments as needed of course, and provides a foundation on which to differentiate instruction it maintains alignment within and between subject areas and provides an organized, systematic resource to critically examine materials and texts, instructional strategies for bias and perspective taking. Next, a curriculum provides a resource for EL, special education, and all educators to support our diverse learners and their peers. It provides a consistent unit-based resource to meet the needs of student educational plans. Provides a comprehensive list of vocabulary to pre-teach before adults encounter the unit in class because everybody has access to all the units. Provides a resource in order to pre-teach and prepare culturally and linguistically diverse students and their peers in order to begin a unit with a topic outside of their schema. Next, it provides opportunities to link professional development, curriculum, and district improvement. Sustaining a successful process of continuous improvement and strategic planning, we are not too far away from our district improvement process. And now we're going to have this amazing tool to move the district forward with that plan. We will create meaningful and effective professional development, support teachers and new teaching assignments to be successful. We've had quite a few new teachers come to our district and they're so happy and excited to have a curriculum that they can see. Collaboratively support our district values and goals with all stakeholders, caregivers, teachers, administrators, and students. I attended a webinar today on sharing curriculum with students. So this one is really small, I'm gonna read it out loud. I didn't wanna have 100 slides. So what is the Northampton Public School vision of curriculum? Students should receive the same common educational experience across grades and courses. Curriculum development 
It never ends. It's ongoing, collaborative, and dynamic. Collaborative curriculum development provides a vehicle for critical conversations about teacher instructions. Just being in the room with, crit with our CTLs when they're writing units, uh, those are the, some of the richest conversations that we can have in education, talking about which materials go where and the sequencing of instructional strategies. Uh, tonight, people were looking at resources for young children for social-emotional learning. A comprehensive curriculum is aligned, rigorous, and engages all students. Engagement with stakeholders, all of you, caregivers, students, is enhanced through transparent communication of curriculum expectations. Curriculum work improves student learning. It's the backbone of instruction. Curriculum design and implementation is an essential component of educational practice. Curriculum needs to be aligned with the mass frameworks, the AP frameworks, as needed. And the process of writing, differentiating, reflecting on, and revising curriculum is ongoing and collaborative. Curriculum should be rigorous, engaging, and developed using the understanding by design model. So what is that? What is understanding by design? We've been using this for a very long time. Um, I think almost as long as I've been in the district, which is about 27 years. What is it? What is UBD? A curriculum framework that goes deeper than the content knowledge with critical understanding. It's all about deep understandings. It includes, this is my favorite part, empathy, and perspective taking as key facets of learning in addition to the traditional components of Bloom's taxonomy. We all remember that, right? Um, to know, comprehend, evaluate, synthesize, analyze, apply. But UBD is also about students learning to empathize and learning about perspective taking. Uh, it's sometimes called backwards design because you start with what you want students to know, do, and understand. You start with the outcomes. That's the first thing you do. And then activity planning comes after the desired results are identified. And then at its core, we ask ourselves, what do we want students to be able to do when they graduate from high school? Those, that is all based on transfer of learning. And maybe some of you remember the transfer goal, um, transfer goal workshop that we had last year. We had a big presentation. I think it was last year or the year before. So what is our process for creating curriculum? This is just the basics. First of all, we, of course, identify courses and organize units to be written um, at, based on the Massachusetts framework standards. Um, district requirements and course requirements or alignment. CTLs, teacher teams, department chairs share in the unit writing organization and work collaboratively with colleagues to map out a process for unit writing. Sometimes this is divided up. You might have a CTL running a teacher team and everybody takes a unit. We've done it in a lot of different ways. CTL teams and chairs, they write, they share, they receive feedback, they re revise, they receive feedback spe uh, several times, they refine. And then a unit undergoes a pilot project, a pilot period. And then revisions and updates are made. And then finally, the unit becomes an official part of the course. And again, up, uh, with updates as needed or required. Um, three key design questions. What is worthy of understanding? You can't teach 2,500 standards. You have to teach, you have to choose priority standards. What are the priority standards? What is worthy of understanding? And then, what is your evidence for that understanding? How are students going to show that they really understand this? And then, what are the learning experiences that are going to promote that understanding? That's what the curriculum process is about. So we have curriculum maps. What's a curriculum map? It's a tool for organizing expectations for what students should know, be able to do in each subject each year. 
It shows what our students are learning, but it's important to remember these are outlines. Teachers are teaching real students in front of them every day and differentiating and teaching them the way they need to be taught and teaching them the content they need to, that they need it on that particular day. So that, these are outlines, they don't capture all of the richness that happens in the classroom, but nonetheless, these are our guides for learning and teaching. Each curriculum map includes what students are learning in the individual units for that course. So what are the parts of our unit plans? Basically, three stages. Stage one, desired results. What do we want students to know, do, and understand? Stage two, what evidence? What, how are we going to assess what they have learned and what is the assessment evidence? And stage number three is the learning plan. And that's where I kind of call it the magic bag because that's the part where the teachers get to apply their magic. It's an organized plan but it's a, that's the moment at which teachers can differentiate the learning for the students that they're teaching. So what's included in our plan? Dr. Yes. Do you have a, what, what was the, the, when I was looking over the starter, what was the public part there? Oh, thank you for that. Right. Sorry about that. That's the part that's public. That's the part that everyone will, will be able to see, everyone can see. That is the public part of our unit plans. Obviously, we're not gonna share the assessments with you know students and the public. And, um, and the learning plan, it, it's, that's the teacher plan. So that's not something that we would share publicly. But the desired results, and I'll show you what that looks like momentarily. So what is included in each unit plan? Um, for stage one, the desired results. And this is, again, this is the public part. This is where you, what you would be able to see. First of all, the unit overview. And that's an overview that includes the title of the unit, the grades, the time allowance, which is suggested. Again, these are students in front of us and you might need a little more time or a little less time. The focus of the unit, the topics, a brief discussion of the big ideas, the key instructional methods, major student requirements, a brief description of what students will actually do, and if there's any prerequisite knowledge that students need to have before taking on that particular unit. Transfer goals, I referred to these earlier, and this is indeed the workshop that we did la uh, last year. Transfer <coughs> goals are those goals developed with college and career in mind. They're what we want students to be able to do independently when they confront new challenges, both in and outside of school, beyond the current lessons in the unit. Each unit includes one or more transfer goals. These transfer goals are explicitly taught or taught towards for our younger students in these units. And then these transfer goals are unique to the Northampton Public Schools. Some of them are based on organizations, um, but the themes are very unique to our school and the teachers created and agreed upon the unit transfer goals. And we have transfer goals for every single subject. And the most recent is I'm working with the guidance department. They are now doing theirs. So district transfer goal themes. These are the themes that are in every single set of transfer goals. Communication, including the strategic use of technology critical thinking, collaboration, social emotional learning, creativity and flexible thinking, and civic engagement including local and global citizenship. And that is the piece that we are going to be working on um, specifically this summer. Unit standards, you know what these are. They come from the Massachusetts frameworks um, most of the time, some of them come from AP frameworks. Um, but we have chosen the standards that are priority. These would be the standards that are taught and assessed, not reviewed. We review standards all of the time, not reviewed or reinforced. 
you're going to see the standards that are actually taught and assessed. That's how we, one of the criteria for choosing them. And they would be assessed on a summative assessment for that unit. A summative assessment is the final project or exam or experience, you know, young children obviously experience, that allows students to demonstrate the extent to which they learned the standards. They're able to do, understand, and know whatever they were supposed to in this particular unit. And then the summative assessments are aligned to the standards and assessed with a rubric. Now, the, the summative assessments are not pub public. I said that, you know, the, this is not, we wouldn't want to put our exams online, you know, in pu for public uh, uh, sharing for obvious reasons. But your students, students will be bringing home these, these summative assessments all of the time. Uh, or most of the time, and, and, and you'll be able to see them, and you will be able to see the rubrics as well. The rubrics are the measurement tool. Um, now again, with younger children, there's going to be checklists. It's going to be a little different with younger children, but, um, but in the upper grades and obviously in the middle school and high school, you're going to see uh, a rubric. And rubric is a teacher and student measurement tool used to determine the proficiency level for the unit standards. And it usually contains a descriptors that provides specific and direct feedback to students and measures the growth. And this is a tool for students and it's a tool for teachers. Teachers can use it for feedback, students can learn it, can use it to learn. Understandings are the big ideas that have enduring values in students' lives beyond the unit, course, and classroom. Essential questions, one of my favorite things. These are the questions that you are likely to see on a blackboard. They're the big questions that students are uncovering as they work through a unit. And I have examples of these. I'll share some with you in a few minutes. Uh, content, obviously the key knowledge for each of the units. Think of it almost as the facts, the details. And then, of course, the skills. What are the abilities students will acquire as a result of the units? What will the student actually do? And then finally, tiered vocabulary. Tiered vocabulary is the vocabulary essential for the mastery of the unit, and we have tiered ours. It's not all tiered yet. We're kind of working on this, um, but our goal is to have tiered vocabulary. So if I'm an EL teacher, um, ELE teacher, I can go in, I can look at these, these words, and they're all nicely categorized for, categorized for me. And I put the definitions right in that, um, in that model, but just to give you an example, um, tier three would be particular to a particular subject, like the word proton, electron, um, tier two would be interdisciplinary words like synthesize, analyze, critique. And uh, tier one uh, would be a word like list, a word that might be in our everyday category, but not all of our learners would know. So those are the major components of our curriculum, our public curriculum. And so now I'm going to move over here so I can manipulate the computer and I'm going to take you into the, into the uh, site. So we are all familiar, hopefully, with our Northampton public school website. And I also want to thank um, Molly McLaughlin for working with me on the technical aspects of this. Um, we worked on this part together. So under about, we see NPS curriculum. And you'll also see here, here's our handy dandy list of K-12, thank you. K-12 transfer goals. Uh, you can click on that. And here are the transfer goals 
four that are explicitly taught or taught towards for every single subject. So here's math. If you would like to see the transfer goals. Now these are K-12 transfer goals. Every single teacher in the entire district is teaching towards these transfer goals. And here they are. Transfer goal number one, solve problems. Kindergartners can solve a sharing problem. Older children can have, uh, they can solve uh, complex uh, calculus problems. Um, and so on and so forth. You can go through each one of these and take a lovely tour and I highly encourage you to do that. And you'll see all those themes that we talked about earlier. So let's go here though. It says NPS district curriculum. This is the opening page and it tells a little bit about our curriculum and then it give some instructions. I think so many times we don't know where to go when we have a question. Where do we go? Well, we have a lot of experts and the most important expert, of course, are the ch uh, children or, or students' teachers. So should you have questions, um, the first person to speak with, of course, is the child or the student's teacher. And then secondly, we have grade level and subject area department chairs. And here they are. Math and science chairs, K through five, ELA and social studies chairs, um, K through five. And then we have some additional chairs, phys ed, visual, technology, LL, performing. And then if you have questions about six to eight curriculum, here are your directions and your chairs, high school department chairs, I'm going to tell you, if you go through those lists, you're going to see a lot of the same people that are on the CTL list. These are very, very devoted teachers. And then if you have general questions about instruction in a school, you have all the principals' emails. And then before that, you can also refer to our math coach, Jim Hansen, or our literacy coach, Andrew Samuelson, who's with us tonight. Um, and then finally, if there are questions about alignment, implementation, um, or the process of writing curriculum, of course, that would be, that would be me. So all of the, the, the protocol for asking questions is here. So we hope that will help people. All right. So now, to access these NAPs, you will need to visit our Atlas page here. So then, it is a simple click and look what appears. This is very exciting if you've been working on it for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our Northampton Public School curriculum website. Ta-da! And uh, so we have all of the, so all of the, um, all of the elements of our curriculum are listed here. Everything from the course title, the unit titles, the transfer goals, all of those things that I just reviewed for you are here as well in case people want to read more about them and understand them. Um, and then our vision of curriculum is here. And then navigating the system. Molly and I spent a lot of time honing these instructions and we've tried them several times and they seem to work pretty well. So these are the instructions for how to use it and I am going to model that right now. So this is our beautiful Northampton N and to the right of that we have the little um, symbol for Atlas. And underneath that, it says use unit calendars, and you're going to click, and here you go. Here are over 173 courses and well over 600 units that have been written. So I'm going to give you a tour of something that we don't often look at. We're going to look at some art at the high school. I'm going to take you in. So I'm using this filter feature to the left. I'm choosing a school type, and you can see that there's a few choices over here. Well, we're going to go to um, the high school. And you don't have to choose high school because we only have one. Um, and then grade level, I'm not going to choose a grade level. Subject, I'm going to choose art and music. And 
now I'm going to browse. You can get more specific if you like, but now I'm just going to browse. So here are all of our arts courses. And at the high school, we have art, music, and dramatics are all in one, um, in, in one area. So I am going to choose, let's see, I'm going to choose Ceramics 1. Notice that you have the, uh, the uh, grade level, the title of the course. This little thing right here means that it was written by consensus, more than one person, a teacher team. These are the names of the two curriculum directors, and these are the two teachers that teach the course. Really, really handy information. Ceramics. Let's take a tour. So here are, here's the first page you're going to see, and this is the whole unit calendar. Um, and these are all the units in this particular Ceramics 1 course. This is, apparently this uh, course is taught in the, uh, starting in the winter semester, the second semester. And these are the approximate number of weeks that each of the units is taught. So let's take a look at this first one. In order to actually look inside of the unit, you just press the unit and here it is. Process and Properties of Clay. It's an introductory, uh, introductory course. And here are all of the parts for the first stage. All right. So there's the unit overview during the one week processes and properties of clay unit for 9 through 12 in the ceramics class students are introduced to the operation of the clay studio and studio safety through demonstrations class exercises working with clays and to clay and tools slideshows etc i'm not going to read this whole thing you can go in afterwards and read it um, but let me show you some other uh, another tool that you have at your disposal here you can mouse over, I love this, you can mouse over unit overview if you want to see, oh, what's in a description? Well, here's what a description is right there. So it's another way to, um, to understand what is inside or what might be inside that section. And then here are the transfer goals for this particular unit. Problem solve and take risks. Respond and empathize. I love this one. It's one of my favorites. Describe, analyze, interpret, and criti critically evaluate and respectfully respond to art created by self and other artists with global understanding. So they're going to be looking at art in this, uh, and ceramics in this particular unit from a variety of cultures. Curriculum frameworks and standards. Now this, as you can see, this is the next thing we have to do. We have brand new standards, so they're going to have to update this with the brand new standards. That'll be a piece of work that might get done this summer. They're not actually too far off. There's some added. Um, actually, one of the elements of the new standards for the arts is there's a lot of diversity um, in the new standards, which I really like. Um, and then you have the understandings. These are the big ideas. Um, and remember, this is an introductory uh, unit. Creating artwork is a process of pre-planning, designing, creating, and editing. Um, there's a difference between utilitarian, functional, and fine art. Um, process is, import is as important as the product. And then the essential question. This is my favorite one. What is the difference between art and craft. Now if you're the art teacher in this, in this course, you're going to write that on your board. And every lesson that you're teaching in this unit, you're going to have continued conversations about that question and you're going to uncover more and more detail as you move along. What a great way to teach. Um, sometimes students keep journals um, to record their thinking and learning. What, is students, what are students going to, what will they know, do, and then here's your tiered vocabulary. Uh, let's see, characteristics of physical aspects um, uh, and stages uh, and abilities of clay. Um, 
ceramics is the first synthetic material created by humankind, et cetera. And then all of the skills, and notice the skills begin with verbs, explain the process of uh, properties of clay, discuss the broad distinction between fine arts and crafts, uh, identify health risks, identify, um, respectfully describe, oh, look at this one, respectfully describe and respond to art created by diverse cultures with a specific focus on symbols. All right, so here is, um, Here's stage one, and this is what everybody can see. So that is the first example. I also want to show you one more very wonderful feature of this. It works with Google Translator. So here's Google Translator in the upper right-hand corner. And of course, we would help our families upload this who might need it. It's not hard to do. I did it today. It's really quick and easy and you simply click on translate this page and then translate to, let's see, I think I'll translate <coughs> it to Spanish and there it is. All right, and now be, <laughs> isn't that great? Yeah, and look at all the languages, it's, it's really, it's quite marvelous. So, that works very nicely. Okay, so now I'm going to take you through two more units real quick. But before I take you to the next unit, or as at the same time, let's see if I can do two things at once, um, I want to tell you about a, a, a letter that I got from a young woman from middle, the middle school. I'm not going to use her last name, but her first name is Abigail. And she wrote to me, and she was concerned um, she said that in Northampton Public Schools, black history should be more acknowledged and, and learned about because students of color need to learn more about their history. And she specifically mentions black activists uh, in her letter. Um, and I was really happy to receive this letter because this is the kind of thing that we can use our curriculum to look into. So I immediately, this is a middle school student, so I immediately wanted to see what we were doing in the middle school and seeing that we have a course that is in the works. This is a draft, but I'm going to show it to you. Let's see. Social studies. And I'm going to hit browse. So this is a brand new course, and this course has been written by Faith Bisbee Tracy Dawson Green and, and uh, Kate Fontaine is also from the high school, has worked together. That's the beauty of the summer. The summer brings everybody together. So there's a lot of collaboration, K through 12. So this is our civics course. And I was actually able to answer her question by looking at the curriculum. There are so many reports that you can run with Atlas. You can run a report on any standard. You can run a report on specific um, uh, words or concepts um, in order to get information. So this is really useful. This was really useful for me. So I went to how change is made, and I looked at the desired, uh, the first stage, the desired results, and I read the unit overview and I was really pleased to read it. I'm just going to read this one sentence. It says, the role of political protest and the courage of individuals in fighting for change, equal rights and protection for all will guide them through the study of abolition, segregation, reconstruction, modern civil rights movement into black power, black lives matter, women's suffrage, Native American rights, and the LGBTQ plus movements. Students will see how persistence, bravery, and a dedication can lead to change. Students will become research and become an expert on a specific part of one of these topics as a final eighth grade project. That's the summative assessment. And then here are the transfer goals. One of my favorites, number six, engage as a global citizen. Use a variety of digital tools and communication skills. skills. Apply knowledge of political, economic, and social systems to solve complex problems and take informed action as a global citizen. Kind of timely. Critical, and then here are the framework standards the understandings, the essential questions, <coughs> what students should know, be able to do. Um, let's see. 
critically evaluate online resources and websites for re reliability and potential bias in preparing for a presentation. Keep a reflective journal in response to political cartoons, discussions in class, etc. You can go back and read these on your own. I highly recommend that you do take a look at this one. It's 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 really good, um, and it's it's just a starter as well. All right, I'm going to show you one more, and this one is super exciting. <coughs> We're going to look at elementary math. We're going to look at grade one. And let's see, math one, here we go. Again, four curriculum, uh, curriculum developers and 14 teachers. It's a lot of people to collaborate and they've done it. Um, kindergarten, all of the grades, they've collaborated greatly. Okay, so here are all the units in our first grade math course. I want to show you unit three. Unit three is called how much, or excuse me, how many of each, how many in all. So we have, again, the unit overview, the transfer goals, the standards, understandings, it's all here. But there's something very special about this unit. So we've had our math units for quite some time. But now, because we've had them, we're able to go in and make them more specific to the needs of our students and our district. So many of you have heard about our math recovery program in our elementary schools, and actually it's not really a program. That was a, a mistake, I should say. It's an approach to learning. It's professional development. So what we've started to do this past year, and we have a grant with this, with Math Recovery, and Beth Brady is, is doing a lot of this work with Jim Hansen and, and frankly, all of the other teachers. They're embedding math recovery practices into our curriculum. So this is where you really want to be in curriculum. A program is a program, but a curriculum is yours when you are able to embed and, and make it your own. Embed those things that you know are going to move your children forward. And this is, in fact, where we are with our elementary math curriculum. It's pretty exciting. So I'm going to show you this little note here. And we're sharing this with the public, but this is really for teachers. I mean, that's really the purpose of it. No, before starting Unit 3, complete the AVMR, that's Math Recovery, Addition and Subtraction Assessment as a pre-assessment. For students who are at Construct 3, and teachers know what that is, able to count on, uh, count on um, for addition and, subtra and count back for subtraction, administer and score the full structuring AVMR assessment schedule in order to properly differentiate. So it's a note to the teacher so that she or he knows that this is a pre-assessment that should be done that will help the teacher to differentiate as they move forward. And if I took the time to go into the lesson, you would see inside the lessons that they're reorganized. We've taken math investigations and we've reorganized them in some units, in some places, and we've embedded these math recovery practices. And this is really, um, it's important work, it's groundbreaking work. There are no other districts that are actually taking the time to do this kind of work. We're actually breaking ground with this. And we can do so because, again, we have these amazing math recovery teacher leaders and department chairs and coaches and groups of educators that are willing and able and excited and passionate to do this work. So that is, um, that's pretty exciting work. I'm going to go back to my stand and finish up now. I'm going to bring you back to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, we have a curriculum. What are our next steps? Um, sharing Atlas with caregivers and students. Uh, we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing some workshops um, likely at the end of March and the beginning of April. And sit, be sitting down with school councils and parents and sharing this information. I am very excited about creating the Northampton Public Schools Curriculum Review Calendar. And we're going to do that in conjunction with the District Improvement Plan that Dr. Provost is going to head up. Really excited about that. Think of all the possibilities of now we have all this data, we can really look at um, instruction in a very deep way. Um, and then we'll of course have a fall sharing plan. A few comments before, um, you can turn the lights on if you want. Um, a few comments just before I, I end up. So the curriculum we have written, I think you have to move. There we go. The curriculum we have written is not a finished product, rather it's a beginning. It's the starting point for reflection and opportunities for growth that could be of immeasurable value to our district, to the future of literally thousands of kids moving forward. Um, for those of you who haven't been around um, as long as I have, we have seen, and many of us in this room, we have seen paper versions of curriculum. Uh, and some of you work in schools, you know what happens, right? Curriculum uh, gathers dust on shelves, it gets packed in deep in filing cabinets, it gets tossed away in, in folders and neatly organized on charts and, charts and stuffed in the bottom of drawers. The truth is, once a curriculum has been articulated, it should be in a very accessible place. It should become the catalyst for all of the district's continued work. Of course, this is your friendly curriculum t uh, director saying this. We think everything is curriculum, but it is really important. Every professional that has come into our district um, has said the same thing. Christina Dubay, Carol Tomlinson, Marcia Embo, Mike Anderson, remember um, Bill Henderson uh, and the about inclusion, um, our theorists, Jay uh, McTie and Wiggins, Kathy Vatterow, Tim Westerberg, these are all people whose works we used to inform our curriculum and people who have delivered professional development to our, to our district. Their first question when they come into the district is, where's your curriculum? What do you have for curriculum? How are things aligned? And now we have answers, which is great. Um, and then most, uh, a couple of years ago, we, Barbara Love, she was interested in how equitable um, our curriculum was. Was there access, uh, equi equitable access? So finally, technology offers the gift of sharing this important work online in multiple languages with caregivers, students, teachers, administrators, our community and beyond. And I'm hoping our shared value of curriculum, our commitment to an equitable education for our children, and our profound respect for the work and the collaborative spirit of purpose will carry us forward if we hold curriculum in a prominent place in our district. And there it is. <laughs> Many of them left. They have to teach lessons tomorrow. <laughs> so I realized that was very long. I don't even know how long I went, but it was. Uh, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't be any shorter. I think that you know, five years of work. Um, I'm happy to address any questions, and also. Um, I am happy to have conversations with anybody um, who might want to sit down and tour the site with me. I'd be delighted to do that. Um, I know that was a, a quick tour, but I'd be happy to do that. So. Any comments? Oh, yes. uh, a, a pl applause for you and the teachers and the, the teams who put this all together. Uh, it's, it's incredible, the level of detail there. Uh, having done a lot of this work myself, I know how involved it is. and. 
connecting back to the sitting on a shelf, I know how it can just sit there. Uh, you do mention a curriculum review calendar. Uh, considering it took five years to put this together, have you started thinking about a, a regular process to make sure not to lose that work and have it become stale and not a living document? Critical, and, and the fact that it, we have the technology to do so makes it super easy. And not only do we have the technology, but we also have the structure. We have department chairs at our elementary schools. We have a, a math department chair and an elementary uh, uh, ELA department chair for every single grade level. And we meet every month. We meet as chairs and they meet with their teams. What an incredible opportunity to move and continue to move that, uh, that work forward. We also have our coaches. Um, that can help us with that work as well. So I see it as ex having excellent planning, having the structure within the district to move that, that process forward, and then also having the technology and the, you know, the tool um, to make the work easy. This member of Usansky. <laughs> Uh, so, t well, first, you know, kudos, congratulations to all of you, and your excitement's contagious, and I know if we let you, you could just talk for a few more hours about this. This was like tip of the iceberg for you, and I, and I, and I love that, and that comes across really well. Um, so two things. One, I'm really interested in how parents can access this. I feel like, I, especially in the elementary and middle school, that's just been such a missing part, and I, and I think it's great, the Google Translate and on computer, and I just wonder if it's going to be wrapped in at all to um, our school open houses so that when parents are there in person they can get a piece of paper. I know that's very old-fashioned but sometimes that's a just another way to hit parents with this kind of information. So what we've said. Or whatever else you're thinking. I don't know. Yeah, it's just I, you know. I have been thinking a lot about that and um, what we have started at our high school is our high school teachers are including some of that information in their course syllabi. So some of that is actually, you know, uh, on, a, on a piece of paper for, uh, for parents. And, um, and then, of course, we can give them um, uh, the website and more information, you know, at those experiences. We're going to have a fall sharing plan that will be very detailed. We'll have great. school newsletters and a variety of other places. And, um, you know, I suppose we certainly could, you know, give paper copies as needed. I mean, again, I think it's much more, I've seen it much more at the high school level than in the elementary and middle school. And coming from another school district with my oldest kid, I was surprised that we weren't getting that information when they were in elementary and middle school. So that'd be great to see it more. Um, my second question, I just sort of a, another practical example, you know, student union came to us last year about um, uh, sex ed in the wellness classroom and how it's being, you know, their concerns about it. And I remember the whole conversation about how hard it was because to get them access to the curriculum. So this would solve that problem. Is that yes, correct? It does. Very exciting. Yes, it does. Yes. And that curriculum was updated as well. Right. But yeah, it, it definitely solves that problem um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Yeah. Thanks. I'm the boss. I have a minor. Thing. First, thank you to everybody. Most of you aren't here, but um, those of you who are, thank you in person. And to you, Dr. Cheevers, I mean, this the number of hours that went into this is a lot, obviously, and it, it's really exciting for reasons everyone's already said. This is a minor thing, but on your slide under unit transfer goals, and I'm not sure which one it is, um, I see this wording a lot. It says, throughout a lot of the material, we get a school committee, and this particular wording is transfer goals. Are those goals developed with college and career in mind? Mm -hmm. And there's something else there that I wonder if you would consider adding. And that is like, I don't know the right word, but citizenry, right? It's all over there. How do we be kind to each other? And how do we, you know, bring an anti-racist perspective to our work? And I think adding college, you know, these goals developed with college, comma, career, and whatever word we can come up with, and I'm sitting here thinking citizenry, but there's maybe a better word, but I think that belongs there because that's equally important for our Well, the, the citizenship and, and that piece, it, they're actually in the transfer goals themselves. They are. Yeah, but highlight, I, I, so it isn't just this slide, it's just we've seen things like we have to do this to get our students ready for college and career, and I feel like collectively we should also add this other piece to that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it just seems equally important. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I just want to start by echoing the, the kudos from my colleagues. Um, this is a lot of work, and it's such a huge, um, it really just takes the district so much further forward in terms of what we're able to do as a result of all of that work. And also, it's ongoing work, right? This idea of keeping it a living, breathing document. So thank you in advance for all the work that's still coming. Um, I'm thinking about the, um, the district review report and some of the areas of opportunity that we have. And, I'm, and it seems like there's a real direct link between the ability to use the maps um, and, and to engage folks in conversations about some of the work ahead. Um, a couple of things I'm thinking about are um, allowing for formative and common assessments at the high school. Um, and the other is um, really thinking about how we're demonstrating learning experiences that develop higher order thinking skills. And I was wondering if you could talk to how the maps allow you to engage um, various teachers in these different areas. Oh. Just <laughs> <laughs> I hope it still works. <laughs> that question with a show and tell. Because um, I think that's the best way to do it. So the high school, actually the entire district, we've been on, um, <laughs> we've been looking at, uh, let's see. I have to take you in a different view. So this is my view. And you might actually find this kind of interesting. Um, so let's see, so this is manage courses. Let's take a look, so this is my view because I'm a super ad admin, right? Um, which is what they call it. I'm gonna take you back into arts and music and I'm gonna take you to, let's see, let's go back in that one course and I wanna show you, I hadn't, I hope it's a good example of this, let's see. Well, so this is my view. It's a little bit different. And actually, this is um, the teacher's view. It's a little different. Let's go into process and properties of clay. And here are stage one, desired results. Here's the transfer goals. Here are the curriculum frameworks, understandings, tiered vocabulary. Here's the assessment evidence. And I want you to notice, this is actually perfect. I want you to notice that um, that the first assessment, it's kind of small, but the first assessment there is a pre-assessment. So all of the units, or most of the units, have a pre-assessment. What do students know before they, about clay, and about art, and about craft, before they even begin this unit? What do they know? That's where you need to begin with student learning. And then the formative assessment is an assessment that you would give, you know, halfway through or some point. And usually there's more, especially with other courses, um, you know, you, there's multiple formative assessments throughout a unit. And that's where you get feedback from the students so you know what your next instructional moves are. And then for every unit, there is a summative assessment. And that summative assessment is directly aligned above with the standards that the teacher has chosen or the group of teachers have chosen, this is what this teacher is, um, is uh, evaluating in the summit of assessment. So we've had a very, very, um, we had professional development last um, fall um, about organizing assessments and making sure that those summit of assessments um, are common, that they're common and they're used within uh, all it, within a course and within that unit. Does that help? Yeah, so will that be the case as well in, in maybe a course like math or Absolutely. somewhere where there's multiple teachers and yes. there will be a way to then take the data that comes out of those courses to then be able to compare? Well, you, could, you couldn't compare grades, but you could definitely, um, well, I mean, this doesn't record grades, but you can see what the expectations are for that course. And for that particular course, you would see the same um, uh, summative assessment. So you can assume that for that particular course that the teachers are using that particular summative assessment to measure. And, the, and it's common across It is common, courses. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And, then, and then also about the, just the, the higher order thinking skills, mm -hmm. is, are you able to see 
so I, I believe Atlas allows you to do that, but I didn't quite see it in the examples, sort of the different, the different levels on which teachers are, are looking for. So that is a really good question, and let's go back to this example. I love this question because this is my favorite thing about understanding by design. Now, I'm not going to tell you that all of the units have all these pieces in them, um, but many of them do. And actually, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, I was looking for one that had, let's see. Oh, this one doesn't have it. But the answer, the short and the long of it is yes. And I'll show you our tool. These are our tools right here. Some of the teachers have the six facets of understanding marked in their, in their learning plans. Some of them do. Uh, not all. We're working on that. Um, and some of the, so in the elementary schools, those are kind of worked into, uh, those facets of understanding are worked into the, you know, the programs you're using, so it's not as critical, but definitely for middle school, especially with high school, that's a piece of, uh, of work um, that many of the teachers have done. But here they are, the six facets of understanding right here. Explanation, interpretation, application, perspective, empathy, and self-knowledge. UBD requires that these facets of understanding are included in, in, in each of the unit plans, or most of them. Okay, most of the facets of understanding. So we have done workshops on this, and we probably need to do more workshops. I mean, you always need to go back and, and think more. But we have Bloom's Wheel. We have the depth of knowledge chart. The high school likes this. The high school uses the depth of knowledge chart quite a bit. Oh, now it's not going to come up. There it is. And this is really nice. Um, it shows, it gives you um, some verbs and some, some terms to use in order to get to uh, deeper levels of knowledge. So this is something that we have addressed at the high school. And it is something that's part of our curriculum training and, and part of our work. Yeah, thanks for the question. That was a great one. <coughs> Ember Goal. Um, yes, yeah, certainly huge congrats to all of you. Um, wearing a couple different hats, like on the teacher side, I was clicking around while you were doing it, and it was just a great feeling as a teacher to be able to click where it showed the teacher's names and literally next to that unit, being able to email those teachers and be able to ask them a question, hey, what's going on in this unit? Back to it. I think that's an awesome level of collaboration there. So super excited as a parent. It's um, really great. And I know schools are doing a lot to communicate and to have that resource there for parents and teachers to draw on is awesome. Um, I'm wondering on the on a school committee hat, um, uh, two questions. One, like how how wedded to the, the program, whether it's investigations or foundations or math recovery or whatever, how wedded to those programs is are these maps? Like if 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 you change to a different program what impact does it have on those maps is one question because it seems like there's a lot of years to building up to that so yeah. I could imagine if a program shifts how how is it able to adjust to that I would say it has a pretty profound effect um, on elementary schools for sure um, middle school probably a little less so and not so not at all at the high school um, but yeah it would have a profound effect but I would also suggest that you know he, here's another piece of work that we just did and Andrew is right here tonight um, Andrew is our literacy coach and uh, we have just taken and actually Andrew has taken up a lot of this work. He just took the writing uh, standards and has um, cru and, uh, for our program and revised them to meet the Massachusetts st standards because we use the Lucy Calkins reading readers and writers workshop and we just you know he just redid all of those and, and reorganized those and now we're making a lot of those assessments our own. Um, and next year is likely going to be more about reading and fundamental skills of reading. Um, and we're taking foundations, uh, fundamental uh, skills, and, and, and embedding it with uh, the Lucy Calkins program, which is actually really perfect. 
Um, so if we all of a sudden decided not to do Lucy Calkins, which is likely not going to happen, because we're really happy with it, teachers chose it, our students are doing well, it's, you know, we might teach it differently, um, we might modify our units, um, but certainly, um, you know, if we, if we abandoned the units or all together, um, you know, I guess that would require, you know, some, some, revi some revision. Um, and then I, the follow-up to that also is on the programmatic side, mm -hmm. um, it's all embedded in the Atlas program, which is something I'm assuming we purchased. And like how, um, I guess, what happens if, you know, they go out of, or they get bought up or out of business or think, you know, like shifts happen right. with that technologically wise. So we were very careful about this. Um, it was a big concern of mine. and. We did a lot of research at the beginning of course, and when we chose Atlas, there weren't a lot of choices to be made. But Atlas Rubicon had been around for a really long time, and their uh, organization was really tight. Um, they have a worldwide, they have a global organization. Um, and actually, um, they were just, uh, uh, they just combined with another larger company, and the company's doing really well. So, you know, all of those things are, are, are going well for Atlas Rubicon. Um, and, um, but, so what do you do? What happens if? If for some reason we decided to move to another platform, what you pay for is a migration. You pay, um, a, you know, technologists to um, from the other company most often to go into the software that you're using and do a migration, um, and that's one way of dealing with it. Another way is to simply download the units, which we could do if we had to do it, um, and then the company would take care of the migration through PDFs. So there are ways to do it. None of it is really great, but um, you know, I, I can tell you this. I, I, Atlas Rubicon has given us terrific service. They've been wonderful. And in fact, they're giving us a free public access. Um, I don't know if it'll be forever, but certainly for right now, they're giving us free public access. We're paying for the subscription, um, but they're giving us a free public access to help get us started. So that was really good. Dr. Provost? Um, thank you. You have recognized the teachers who've worked on this project with you, which is appropriate, but I think it's important for someone to recognize you. Um, so I just want to tell a little story about this that brings together a lot of the comments that were just made. Um, so I remember starting in this district, and it was a few years after the last district review, where the finding was there is no curriculum in the district. And I knew that the... Um, the document had been out for a couple of years, and so one of my first meetings with the leadership team, I said, okay, so where have you gotten with the curriculum piece? And one of the principals reached into her bag and, and pulled out one of these three ring binders and said, I think this is it. And the, and the rest of the principals just looked and said, I've never seen that before. Can I get a copy of it? <laughs> At which point I realized there was no curriculum in the district. There really there just wasn't. So um, the reason why you couldn't get that, that communication when your child was in the lower grades is there was nothing. Um, Nancy and her team built this from zero. Um, so it, it's been an amazing achievement. And um, I'll say that we had a lot of Monday morning conversations that were a little bit um, uncomfortable, um, sort of maybe Lincoln McClellan-like, where I was like, okay, so where's the curriculum? I need to get something out there to the public. And she's like, well, I need to get team leaders first. And I'd be like, so, all right, now you get the team leaders. When can you get them out to the public? And like, well, now they have to be trained. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay, so 40% of this five-year period has gone by. I was kind of expecting there'd be 40% of something to show. And Nancy was just like, have faith. You're going to love it when it's done. Just believe me. Um, and this has all really come together in, in the last couple of months. Um, I've, I've seen samples, but I haven't seen the finished product until just a few uh, weeks before you all did. And it really was worth the wait. Um, and it really was worth all of the faith that I had in you through the process. So I just want to thank you for your leadership through this. This is moving the district so far ahead. And, and you've done something here that's going to benefit kids and teachers for years to come. So thank you.
Well, thank you. Oops. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cheevers. And um, now turning the clicker over uh, to, uh, to Ms. Smith to give us a report on the Power Math Program. So um, Power Math is the name that uh, somebody other than me came up with um, to describe um, a new class that we started offering at JFK this year, um, which is a math intervention class. And so I put together a slideshow to kind of tell you about it. Um, so I'm not going to say much other than to go through these slides and then answer questions. Um, so the course name is Power Math and it is new this year and I am teaching it as well as developing the curriculum. Um, so what is Power Math? Power Math is a small group, four to eight students um, in math intervention class. It is a second short term ranging from six to ten weeks full math <laughs> class for the students who are involved. It is individualized and differentiated instruction it is focused on advanced problem solving. It is aligned with grade level standards and it is aligned with the content being taught by all of the JFK grade level math teachers. It is supporting students with strategies for self-advocacy and it is supplemental instruction in numeracy skills and concepts as needed by the students. What instructional methods and resources are being implemented? More of what I'm teaching comes from the five practices for orchestrating productive mathematics discussions by um, Margaret Smith and Mary Stein, um, which is something that um, Dr. Cheevers uh, has uh, provided uh, professional development for the entire um, math community at JFK and I believe also at the high school because we did some joint things and they're doing also some stuff. So this is something that all the teachers are rolling out, um, but I'm focusing very highly on it. I'm also using things called three-act tasks, which were originally developed by Dan Meyer and Andrew, Andrew Stadel. Um, these are problems specially developed to help students um, develop their own concrete strategies for solving complex mathematical problems. And I use a lot of their tasks, but I've also had training now in how to take any math task and make it a three-act task. So I do a lot of creating of my own three-act tasks at this point. I'm also using Open Up Resources, which was developed by Illustrative Mathematics, which is the program that right now um, we are piloting here at JFK in math um, as a resource to go with our curriculum. Um, it is right now coexisting with Big Ideas, which is another resource that goes with the curriculum that the CTLs have written over the last five years. Um, both Big Ideas and Illustrative Mathematics are uh, keyed to the state standards. So the curriculum, the math curriculum here at JFK is keyed very highly and tightly towards the state standards and we're using uh, um, Open Up Resources and Big Ideas concurrently as tools to help the students meet the state standards. Um, I'm also using WIDA and DESI English proficiency benchmarks in Power Math because as you'll see in a few minutes, there's a significant number of students who end up in Power Math who are English language learners. Um, so the next question is how were students selected to be in Power Math? Um, again, this was a decision made by somebody other than me, but a really solid one. Um, we took the students who were at the very top of partially meeting expectations. So there are students who have not fully met the state expectations by really only a few points on MCAS. Literally the first half of the year, all of the students I saw in Power Math scored anywhere from 499 to 495 on MCAS. So they were sitting very much at the top of that um, lower middle quadrant. Um, so who are these students? A um, hundred students and their families have been offered Power Math so far this year. Seventy-eight uh, families or seventy-eight percent have accepted our invitation <coughs> to actually enroll in the course. Um, nine out of seventy-eight students or twelve percent of those students who have taken or are currently taking are former or current English language learners. 
Um, Nope, oh, that didn't come out so well in the final one. I'm sorry about that. That's my fault. The racial composition of power math, 64% um, white, 17% Hispanic or Latino, 6% Asian, 5% black or African American, 3% Native, uh, or 3% American Indian or Alaskan Native, and 5% reporting mixed race. That's taken right out of uh, family reportings that were put into Aspen. Um, more power math numbers. 54 students have completed power math at this point in the year. Two students completed two sessions of power math on teacher recommendation. They were sixth graders, so instead of having six weeks, they had 12 weeks of power math. 24 students are currently taking power math. An average of two students a week have been attending informal after school help sessions two days a week offered to any current or former power math students who want support with any math. There we go. Profile of a typical power math student. 90% overall appear solid in memorized math facts. They're really pretty strong in basic math. All of them lack flexibility in their abilities to manipulate numbers when calculating. These students also have significant deficits in their understanding of how our number system is built. That's part of that lack of flexibility. They don't, they know one way to do things. 40 to 50% of them have significant gaps in their understanding of how the basic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division grow out of our number system. They cannot see patterns within problems which would be or are clear to students who have a stronger working knowledge of the structure of our base 10 number system. 95% of the power math students have high levels of math anxiety, and 100% of the students who come into power math have low levels of self-advocacy skills when they enter the class. Reasons family have, families have given us for why they decline participation in power math when it is offered. So far we've heard that parents don't feel that MCAS alone should be the basis for their intervention. Parents said that their child feels singled out as bad at math and inclusion in this class makes them feel that in a stronger way. Sometimes the child themselves resist having a second math class. Um, sometimes they give us no reason, they simply say politely, no thank you. Parents feel that their child simply had a bad day when they took MCAS. After all, the child has earned high marks in math all the way through school and that is another feature of all of these students. They all have earned A's and B's pretty solidly through their math career. So what am I doing for progress monitoring? I'm working on finding and developing effective progress monitoring tools. It's a little bit more challenging than perhaps I thought it would be. We tried Ames Web, which is something the district already has and already uses for students who are struggling and discovered that it had limited value as most of these students have relatively strong mathematical computation skills, especially when they're tested in isolation on tests such as Ames Web. The math recovery numeracy assessments give more information about how students compose and decompose numbers as they calculate and um, understandings and misunderstandings that the students hold about the structure of our number system. These assessments are tricky to give as they are mostly given in a one-on-one -on -one settings and we didn't build allowance for that into my schedule and into the way the course is set up. So, but I am using them on a limited basis. Um, I'm currently involved in training. I just completed this week uh, the final of 10 days worth of training through Math Recovery Council. Um, which will put me more fluent in this wide array of assessments that they have. Um, one math recovery assessment, the units coordination assessment, has been very helpful. It's something that I can give to every student as a group. They take it individually, but uh, it doesn't involve me administering it in the same way. And it asks students to unpack their understanding. Uh, there are only seven problems on it, but it takes most of the students about 45 minutes, sometimes sometimes as much as 60 minutes to finish it. It asks the students to unpack their understanding of how numbers build upon each other. And it's a strong predictor of how easily or not students will master the concepts of fractions which then lead on to algebra and higher mathematics with ratio and unit rate and similarity and everything that uses fractions. 
Um, the vast majority of students who have come into Power Math have scored at a construct one or two out of five on the unit's coordination assessment, which is quite low. Um, but not out of the box nationwide, but it is, it means they need some intervention. It's another validation of that. Um, classroom teacher feedback. 80% of the classroom teachers surveyed reported that they see a difference in students' class performance before power math participation versus after power math participation. 80% of classroom teachers surveyed reported that the students who have taken power math seem to be calmer, more focused, and less defiant in math class. 80% of classroom teachers surveyed reported that students who have completed power math are more likely to participate in whole class discussions. 75% of classroom teachers surveyed reported that students who have taken power math have lower levels of math anxiety in math class. 80% of classroom teachers surveyed reported students who have taken power math are visibly more confident than they were pre-power math. 100% of classroom teachers surveyed feel that the power math curriculum is addressing areas that are helping students. Classroom teacher quotes, I gave out a survey recently that collected all of this information from the teachers. And I heard, I am seeing more confidence in their reasoning and strategies. I've seen students be willing to consider multiple strategies for the same problem when before I would not see that. And my power math kids have a pretty wide array of personalities and work habits before and after power math. I see improved engagement and persistence overall. I also have given the survey to, to all of the students who have come through Power Math. And these um, are statistics here first. There'll be some quotes in a minute. 50% of students who have taken Power Math report, quote, I am doing OK in Power Math class. I can understand most of the math we are learning, but I feel like I need a bit more practice with new topics before I'm really confident. 37% of students who have taken Power Math report feeling like a rock star in Power Math class. They can understand the math and they can solve the problems. 13% of students who have taken power math report feeling a bit overwhelmed, both in power math and regular math class, on some days. 73% report that power math helped them to do better in their regular math class, and 77% reported that power math has put them in a position where they can understand the math in the regular classroom, but sometimes they need a bit of extra time to work through problems. So these are some student quotes. I do add that they are non-edited. I took them directly from the surveys. And I felt it was truer to just have you hear their words and their spellings and their thoughts. So pardon the grammar. I have learned a lot about math and that you were a great teacher and taught me a lot about math. And if I wasn't in power math, I wouldn't know a lot about math, right? But thanks to you, I do know a lot now. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I can take all the credit, but I think power math can take the credit. I struggle a lot in my regular math class, and this has kind of helped. <laughs> you have taught me so much about math and how to solve problems and make me more confident with math. Power math helps you achieve new levels of math and helps you understand math easily. I really think you would enjoy it and you should take it. If these quotes were taken from two open-ended questions, one that asked the students to tell me anything they needed me to know about power math or my teaching, and the other one was what would you tell somebody who was thinking about power math but hadn't decided if they were willing to take it. So that's, you'll see a mix here. There are a few more here. It will help you. It might seem unnecessary, but it helped me. I got my grade up from a B to an A in regular math from this class. I would say that power math is a very helpful class. If I didn't do power math, I don't know where I would be or what I would do in my math class. I am so thankful that I took this class. Power math helps and makes you feel more confident with math. You should take it. It really helped me. And if you are struggling with math, then take this class, because I was able to really understand after taking that class in my normal math class. And to be fair, I didn't put it in, but one student did say, this is a second math class. If you don't like math, don't take two math classes. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I also um, have gotten a lot of parent emails reflecting on Power Math. Most of them have been extremely positive, and these are just some quotes from some of those emails. Um, 
She went into it with low confidence and low self-esteem. I asked her how she thought she did on the MCAS, math MCAS, and she said due to the length of the test, she got frustrated and tired and just began guessing at the math answers to get through it. Although we were reluctant, Power Math turned out to be an amazing class. Completely reestablished my daughter's self-esteem and confidence in math, and also taught her as a student and young lady to advocate for herself. I wanted to thank and appreciate you first for your investment in helping Blank succeed in math through your work with the Power Math curriculum, and secondly, and equally important, for making my daughter feel connected. Blank reports back very positive things about the class, and we do want him to grow in his sense of self-efficacy and just plain numeracy, so we are totally on board. My takeaways. These very capable students carry a huge amount of math and MCAS anxiety, even if their parents have never shared their MCAS scores with them. Their fundamental skills of multiplication and division are good, not fabulous, but they lack the ability to comfortably apply those skills in problem-solving situations. As a group, they rush. They fly through math as if to be the first finished means they have established their success. They do not work together with any organization or efficiency. They each assume that someone else in the group will and should do the work of thinking mathematically. And in what seems like a catch-22, they also do not work well individually. When asked to work alone, I get comments such as, I can't do this. I'm stuck. I don't know where to start. I need help. This doesn't make any sense. To be clear, this does not happen because they are mathematically stuck. This happens, I think, because they are emotionally stuck. I'm not giving them problems they have not seen or problems for which they lack the computational skills to solve. And that's it. Has any questions? Thank you very much. Comments or questions about yes? Uh, it seems like there's some real value in the class. Uh, two part question for you. First off, can you explain kind of the rationale behind uh, limiting it to students who are only a couple points away from passing MCAS? And then the second part, uh, do we have other interventions in place for students who are just below that threshold who don't get into this class? Let Dr. Provost take that. Okay. As, um, as Ms. Smith indicated, there was someone else who made that decision. That was me, um, and, but, but it wasn't. It wasn't an arbitrary decision. It's an evidence-based decision. So one of the things that essentially what we're doing here is a tiered system of support, and one of the differences between tiered systems of support at middle school and elementary school is um, in elementary school you take the students who are most struggling and prioritize those. In middle school, and the reason that you do that is because the developmental window is still open and you can have a big impact on them. In middle school, the evidence-based model is to take the students who have the least need because the developmental window is almost closed. And you're not likely to be successful with students who are far away from achieving proficiency. And so with um, a limited limited amount of resources you have to apply them with the students who you have a reasonable chance of success for so students who are farther um, farther away from proficiency will only be successful with a level three intervention such as special education um, member gold um, I, um, I would throw out there it'd be interesting to see um, if like in terms of like the impact of this and looking at their MCAS and um, as you use, since you picked them based on MCAS, um, you know, next year you're seeing specifically their um, SGP data, their student growth data, to see if how they did comparably to other kids in that zone. They're, they're staying really connected to me. The kids that have sort of exited Power Math that have finished their short term intervention come see me all the time. They come see me after school. They, I'm on duty upstairs with the seventh and eighth graders in the morning. They come to talk to me about what they're doing in math class. They show up at my door for after school help when they have a test. They're really, 
they've really bought into this idea that it's really cool to have somebody who knows them really well, who's just interested in how they feel confidence-wise in terms of their math. And so it feels like a really strong and lasting connection, which I think is what you want. So thank you. I really enjoyed this, and I think, you know, a lot of it is that this is an opportunity for them and then what you bring to it and that you really care about these higher level things of giving them the confidence and teaching them to ask questions and it's okay not to know. So thank you. And um, I think having these small classes, did you say four to ten in a, four to eight in a group? Point, yeah. um, and it enables them to get that relationship and to keep working on it. And it, it just, I, I wish all the kids who aren't um, performing in math could have this experience. It's interesting. This group has a very specific set, a very specific profile, and a very specific set of needs that are really easy to overlook. I've been a classroom yeah. teacher for 30 years, and I, I, I know, I knew going into this who the kids would be that I had last year that would show up in Power Math. And they have, every single one of them. And because they're the students who are really solid, high B, low A students, they, in a general ed math setting, they're pretty much invisible. They don't make waves, they do their work, they appear to participate, but they also step back every single chance they get. Yeah. So, so sorry, I was just, I, I guess the things I was going to ask were, um, or that really struck me include two things. One, they really are missing something and you're helping them get it. And the question is why are they going through and getting B's and A's and why aren't we figuring that out and giving them more support in other places in addition to this. And then the other thing that really struck me is um, I understand the MCAS was a good method to select this group, but when we ask parents for them to participate in it, I wonder if it's just a, I'm just wondering, I'm not saying this is right, but if it might be a broader, you know, we've identified the child and maybe you use that as part of it, but also teacher recommendation, just so it's broader than just this MCAS score. I don't know, but it seems like some parents didn't want to listen about that. Can I take a few of those yeah. things? So uh, I think you've put your finger on a very important question. Um, and I think the answer is because we're not doing standards-based grading. Um, one of the things that you'll see in the budget presentation, well, you've already seen <laughs> coming up, is um, a request for some support to try to go to standards-based grading. Um, one of the other challenges that I heard from counselors, I'm not sure if they shared this with you too, but one of the things I heard from counselors is, why are you picking my child? He's gotten A's and B's all along. Um, the, the, I don't think there, that there are any gaps there. Um, and I think in a non-standard space grading system that can easily happen because sometimes we grade on things other than the student's actual performance, like their behavior, et cetera. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, on the other, th uh, the question about why MCAS, that also is a, a best practice for trying to do tiered support at the secondary level because you always have this, this tension between how much time do you want to spend assessing students and how much time do you want to spend intervening. With elementary kids, we do Ames Web and all our own assessments because we're trying to get to kids before they even are old enough to be assessed on the state system. Um, what the research says around middle school and up is just use your state system because you're, you're going to find the same kids if you administer other assessments anyways. And for, to the question about teacher recommendation, one of the things that I think was most powerful about this is not only do I think that the teachers from last year may not have picked a lot of these kids based on that they were giving them A's and B's, but mm -hmm. I heard teachers from the middle school saying, I'm surprised this child was picked for an intervention. You know, I thought this child was not an at-risk student, um, but saw a difference when they had an opportunity to work with you. So yeah. there's that. That's, that's, that's really, really true. It's, I mean, and that's not to say that the teachers don't have piles and piles of students they would recommend for different types of intervention, because they do. Um, there's never enough money or resources to help everybody the way we really would like to. But um, it's universal. The, the surprise of teachers about, oh, those are the students that are in power math? 
versus, you know, oh wow, I'm glad that student was in power math. They've really shifted all of a sudden. And so it's a visible shift that happens, um, but, not a, but not per se a predictable one, I guess. Just one more comment. It, I guess it doesn't surprise me that the kids do seem to have some math anxiety because they clearly care about getting good grades. They're working hard. They're behaving and fitting this picture you're presenting here. But they probably know they really don't understand it as well as it looks. So, I, you know. I, I'm not convinced yet as to whether it's an understanding issue. Okay. There's something else going on that's multi-layered as well. And it has to do with self-perception, with um, when you've got five kids in front of you, they can't hide. And you give them a problem that you know they can do, and their first response is, oh, sorry, you blew it. That one won't work. You have to pick a different one. We can't do that one. And you take them through a process that's generally five or six or seven steps long, sometimes several days, and lead them to the point where they have just solved a problem that they went public with and said they couldn't solve. And something changes in them. And I haven't, honestly, I'm not teaching multiplication, division, fractions. I'm not teaching basic skills. I'm teaching f sort of freedom of math thought in a way. I don't know. Other than that, I don't know. Just, uh, Eleanor, then I'll come to you, yeah. Member Goldman. I just wanted to say that I think this is a really interesting program, and I really, I, I'm a very appreciative of it, even though I'm a senior in high school and I, you know, I'm, I'm not a middle schooler, but I think some, you know, the whole confidence issue around math, and I think the, the thought process behind solving math problems and, and thinking about it in a way like, you know, like understanding your own skill set and what you can and can't do um, is, I think, a struggle for students of um, all math levels. And I don't think it's just, you know, students who are in this range of almost meeting expectations. But I think, I mean, I, I've, I just personal experience have pretty consistently, like, met or exceeded expectations on MCAS and in school, but I've also struggled a lot with, you know, figuring out how to, uh, like, apply what I do know to math problems that don't seem, are, aren't as straightforward. Um, and I think that it's really important to be thinking about that and how, you know, it's, especially as math classes get harder as you go along you know in elementary school and earlier in middle school I think it's math is pretty straightforward and it's it's memorization and uh, like applying just memorized things to uh, pretty straightforward problems and as math increases in difficulty it becomes harder to apply what you know um, and I think with that there's a, a confidence issue and you know because it's more difficult it's it's harder to understand how your knowledge can be applied and and so I think it, but saying that it's always you know if you have that you know whenever if you have that extra support you know that's more one-on-one -on -one, it's so much for or at least for me it's been so much easier to see what I do know and and to see how it's how I can apply it to a certain problem and I think it's it's always real it's been eye-opening for me especially in the past couple of years just like you know it's hard for me to solve a math problem independently but when I'm working with a group of students or with a teacher one-on-one -on -one, it's you know easier for me to get there um, and it takes me a lot it, a, a much shorter amount of time. So I, I don't know, I think this is a really great program and it seems like you're really like hitting the nail on the head with what the issue is and I don't, and I think one of the questions is like, yeah, why is it, why is this a problem? Why is it so hard for students to build that confidence and to use, to understand what they know and to apply it, like especially in math. I just want to take a moment to thank you. I'm really moved by the work you're doing here. Um, I think it's 
so clear that you're doing it very skillfully and compassionately and um, just creating that kind of support for the students. Um, and I think that that would translate across for them in other ways. Um, the, the answer about the standard space grading might apply to this question, um, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a way that students are provided support in test taking, just test taking prep in general um, at any level. So I guess I'll, I'll answer individualistically. You know, I've always said the we should teach to the standards and let the chips fall where they may. I really don't want the, the school to become a test prep shop. There are some places where, you know, I have seen a little bit of test prep going on, but I don't think it's, you know, endemic in the district um, because I think that can be really negative. Like, so yeah. in one of the districts I've worked in, we, we, there was a, tor a required course called test sophistication which was basically strategies for guessing when you didn't know the answer, um, which I think is the worst possible, you know, version of the madness that test prep can go to. So, um, I, the issue around anxiety also I think kind of can be exacerbated by if everyone's prepping for the test, we're giving the message of, oh, this is a really important test, and for kids who worry about their performance, I think that makes it worse for them. So, you know, and, and from my perspective, I think it's better to downplay that. Um, but that's, that's just my feeling. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Member Sarah Cox. Um, of course, I'll echo the kudos uh, from the rest of my colleagues. I also, I was very interested that you gave uh, the racial demographics of your, of your group. Um, do you find uh, gender demographics that are different from the rest of the school? Turns out I don't. I thought in the beginning, when we first started, that there were more girls about to be enrolled in power math, and because it was looking on the very first round that there was like 75% or 78% female students. Um, it just was luck of the draw. As we've gone further on, it has completely equaled out now. I think it's, if, I did the statistics on it because I was expecting it to be heavy on the female side, and it's like 56 to, you know, no, I can't do 40, math this time. 40. <laughs> 40. 56 to um, 40. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's really very balanced now. Um, yeah. Other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, that completes our report phase of uh, the agenda. And we'll now move into some donations and some other votes. Um, we have a vote, uh, we have a donation from National Grid of $5,000 uh, for the Robotics Club. Is there any further explanation other than that uh, descriptor? No? It's for the high school. High, high school robotics. High school robotics. A number of them now. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to. Um, accept that donation from National Grid. Motion to accept the donation from National Grid. Is there a second? second. Okay. So the motion has been made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Um, next, we have a donation of, from the Leeds Elementary PTO of uh, $2,074.48, I guess, worth of water bottles. I'm assuming these are reusable water bottles for drinking water? And they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're the actual bottles. They're not money for the bottles. Okay. They are the actual bottle. Okay. Worth of bottles. Okay. Is there a motion to um, accept this gift? Motion to accept the gift from Leeds Elementary PTO in the amount of $2,074.48 for water bottles. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Great. Um, all those in favor of that gift, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, this next gift is actually, um, uh, this is from D.A. Sullivan and Sons Incorporated, uh, Mark Sullivan, um, who is a uh, an, an, an NPS alum and the parent of NPS alums, um, has been um, 
generously over time um, making sort of strategic gifts to the city and to the schools. Um, and when we had our uh, discussion this year, one of the ideas that I pitched to him, he was a former uh, chair of the planning board who just stepped down after many years. And those of you who've been in the council chambers know that we've converted from these sort of older fashioned PowerPoint projectors to a digital display. Um, which has advantages in terms of interactivity. It also allows for direct connectivity to um, Northampton <coughs> Media so they can actually run the slideshow through the actual, as opposed to taking a, a grainy video of the slideshow. Um, and so they're essentially um, going to work with our IT department to make possible the installation of that type of a system here in the community room that will be used for school committee but will also be accessible for um, learning in the school as well. So first step is to see whether the school committee would accept that type of a system in school property and then I have to go to the um, city council um, to actually have the, the, the financial gift accepted and appropriated to the um, ITS department. So. I hope I'm pushing on an open door on this one. Um, <laughs> is there a motion to um, to accept the, that gift of this new uh, display presentation system? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Excellent. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Um, so again, I'll be taking this uh, to the uh, city council at their next meeting. Um, to actually uh, complete the, because uh, it's not an actual, it's it, they're actually giving us the money, which then has to be appropriated um, for that purpose. So thank you very much for that. And obviously thank you to uh, Mark and uh, the DA Sullivan and Sons uh, company, which is actually the oldest company in Northampton. They are, they are the oldest. They're, I think, fourth generation um, family owned business. So they're uh, very unique and they've, you know, actually um, built um, some of our municipal buildings and some of our school buildings. They and so anyway, they have really deep roots to the community. So I really appreciate their generosity. The next is a um, request of a vote to delegate uh, uh, authority to uh, Dr. Provost uh, to negotiate an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, for um, an extended day nurse for one student. Um, and I'll turn to Dr. Provost to explain give us just an explanation of that? Sure, thank you. We're about to enroll a student who uh, is extremely medically fragile. Um, the student requires nursing services constantly um, and may require life-saving um, procedures at any time of the day, including from um, the moment that the student gets on the bus uh, throughout the school day to the time that the student is returned to their house. Um, so obviously when you add on the morning ride and the afternoon ride, we would be in violation of Article 4, which is ours. Um, but it, it would be very much beneficial um, to try to do this with one person rather than splitting it halfway through the day and having two part-timers. Um, so I, I would like to uh, work with the union to see if we can find um, an accommodation that would make sense for an employee to do this very specific service, not meant to do to create any kind of precedent for nurses across the district, but just to address this specific need. So could I have a motion to authorize the superintendent to uh, negotiate that MOU? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? second? Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, similar, uh, another request uh, for some, uh, an MOU and the authorization for Dr. <coughs> Provost to do that, and that is to adjust the preschool schedule by three days for staff to attend training. Dr. Provost? As I noted in my email, we actually think we have a different solution for this one, so I, I, I don't think we need one. Okay. Excellent. I clearly didn't read the email carefully enough. Um, <laughs> So next, uh, this is a uh, vote to approve uh, foster care uh, reimbursement. Um, this is another one of these two-step uh, processes. Um, this is a new program um, of reimbursement specifically for transportation for foster care children who are um, coming out of their home district to be in foster care and then 
much like homeless children, we transport them back to their home district. So there's a new program. Um, I did take an, uh, an order to the city council for a first reading at their last meeting, basically authorizing the um, school department to enter into an MOU um, with um, D, uh, is it DCF and EOEHHA, uh, HHS and DESI. It's like a three way uh, agreement. Um, and that's sort of one of the requirements of this. But then obviously it, it requires the um, school committee to also approve uh, the acceptance of this reimbursement. It's not obviously full reimbursement, but it's at least partial reimbursement of those transportation costs. And it's very analogous to the. Um, uh, McKinney-Vento uh, mm -hmm. reimbursement that we get for homeless transportation. Right. So is there a, did I, I get that correctly? To approve the foster care transportation reimbursement. Is there a second? second? Okay. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. And again, the second reading on that will come up at the city council, so it should align uh, Cami for the end of the month. We need to have it submitted by March 1st to the exactly so the, for this first quarter. Yeah, so they'll be taking their their second vote next Thursday. So we'll have the authorization to do that. Thank you. Um, next is uh, the uh, vote uh, to delegate authority to sign bill warrants. Um, this is something a uh, practice that we began uh, last year to try to streamline uh, the. Um, the district's ability to pay um, its bills on time, and so rather than having to have a majority of the um, of the body sign these warrants, um, it's been delegated to uh, typically two two members who act uh, as uh, as you know principal and backup uh, to sign those on a weekly basis, um, and so um, I. Uh, my, my recommendation is that um, we would delegate that authority to uh, member Fallon um, and with myself serving as the backup. I've been sort of the backup um, plan uh, since I'm sort of City Hall and close by and I signed the bill warrants for the, for the city um, similarly. So, um, but Ms. member Fallon has agreed to um, take that on. Um, I've checked with other members. I checked with members of, um, uh, but because of conflicts and work schedules, um, I couldn't quite find the right uh, person to do it. Um, but but member Fallon has stepped <laughs> once again <laughs> um, into the breach. So um, my my request would be a vote to delegate that authority to member Fallon and myself to serve as the co warrant signers uh, for the district's bill warrants. Do you want a motion? Sure. All right. I move that Member Fallon, with backup from Mayor Narkowitz, are delegated to sign the bill warrant. Is there a second? Second. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? OK. Uh, next, we move to uh, late start. Uh, and this is uh, this is an item that was um, that was continued from our last meeting, uh, and so it appears back on our agenda as a discussion and possible vote. Um, it's obviously something that we had a workshop discussion about, and to sort of get us, try to catch us all up on sort of the long um, and winding history of this um, issue. Um, and so, uh, <coughs> Dr. Provost, do you have any sort of I have summative thoughts on this. I have we no, are. nothing additional to add. I would just say for the public, this is a plan that would move this start and end times of all schools a half an hour later. Yeah, that was sort of the one that we had, uh, the one piece that the committee had asked you to do outreach and research and dis you know discussion. And um, we've gotten reports from students. We've gotten reports uh, from NACE surveys as well. Um, so it now just kind of lands back here again. Mm -hmm. So I put it out to the members for continued discussion or continuation or um, whatever you choose. Susan, member Voss, you I, I, I don't I came thinking about it because of the re retreat-like meeting we had about it. So um, 
would it be appropriate to try to make a motion that I think I think sums up kind of where we got at that meeting? Okay. Would that be a place yeah. to start? And place certainly to... we can vote it down or amend it. Sure. Um, and I don't have it written out, so I'll just do it off the top of my head. But um, the motion would be something like um, the committee feels that it is important to um, find a way to start our high school later, um, recognizing several years ago, I don't know how many, a former school committee recommended starting the high school between 8 and 8.30. And collectively we feel we need um, to consider a wider range of options in order to best serve all K through 12 students and a path forward that we see, and I don't want to speak for everyone, so I'm summarizing, um, would be to commit to identifying three scenarios um, by September and voting on the one we feel is best, recognizing that there will be pros and cons of any scenario that comes up, but to acknowledge that we are committed to doing that work by September, perhaps having some public comment and voting by October, um, uh, roughly, and that by fall of 2021, the, there would be a later start time. That's where, that's what I took away, I think. Is there a, a second for purposes of discussion? Second. Okay. And I think I loved it right up until your very last sentence where a few of us were a little reluctant to commit to a later start time in advance of knowing what the solution was, what the budget was, where we were as far as the community discussions. And so I think that I would be happy with it ending exactly where you were. Um, when you said that we would vote on those three scenarios in um, September. But remember, we had talked about, well, what happens if we don't all agree on it and what happens, you know, there were so many other issues. So just to maintain the public's trust, I don't want to commit to something a year and a half in advance if we aren't sure how we're going to make that happen. Um, that's all. And I would just amend that to say that while we may not be committing to something that we don't know the details of, I think we, we, and I think we universally agree that we need a later start time for the high school. And we want to make it clear, I would like to make it clear to the public that our voting basically no on this current proposal that pushes all school start times a half hour later does not mean we're not committed to pushing the high school start time later. It just means we want to find a solution to that that doesn't also then move the elementary school start time later. And I'll add that I don't know how many of you saw uh, it came in at 9 o'clock tonight, so you may not have, a very long email from a community member urging us to really consider the history and to not start from scratch here. And so I think as we move this conversation out into the subcommittee, which is I believe what our recommendation is gonna be, that that subcommittee really does do that work that you mentioned, uh, Member Voss, of engaging the community, engaging the, the historic um, research that's been done to ensure we're not starting over, but that we're finding a solution that best meets the needs of the community. So, uh, just to keep us on this, the, the motion was made and seconded for discussion. We're getting some discussion. Member Bustansky, do you want to add to that? I, I like the, I really like the proposal that Member Voss made. I think where I, um, uh, and I think it's important, of course, to keep the public's trust, but I think it's also important at the end of the day that we've got to make a decision on this and that we can just, we've kicked the can down the field for about 10 years now and we can keep doing that. And I thought that one, one of the things that came out in our uh, retreat was just this idea if we had three proposals, um, maybe we could do ranked choice voting. I like that idea that came up at the time, but you know, we're going to, at the end of the day, to make the high school, to get the high school to a later start time, there's going to be some pros and cons and not everyone's going to be happy with it and we've got to come up with a decision. And so just to get to September, October and be right back in the same place again where we say, nope, we got three proposals, 
we don't want to do any of them. Uh, that to me is even worse in terms of you know what we're putting the public through. So to me, I want to be able to commit that, and we all know that we have to make this decision in enough time to let the community know, make sure people feel comfortable with it, they can change their schedules. But we've got a, but we have to. I'd like to be on the school committee that makes that decision because I, I just don't think it can go on much longer. So I, I'm willing to kind of run that risk that. Um, and that we can just vote on something. Uh, I'll, I'll second Member Bisansky's feelings about this. I think getting the current committee up to speed by that time should give us enough knowledge and history to make a best educated choice. Uh, and like you said, there's going to be no perfect choice, no matter how much effort and time we put into it. So we need to do something. So making that commitment really puts the pressure on us to do the work to make it happen. Oh, I'll, I'll add to that. I think recognizing the history and that a former school committee said this has to happen and we're all acknowledging we agree with that it has to happen, saying, to, and, and it, I, I understand, Member Fallon, it's uncomfortable when we don't know how it's going to happen. But for me, I'm thinking we have a fallback plan. And we already know that it's not ideal for some of the community. But the, in my mind, the fallback plan is you just put every school back half an hour. And, and you know, maybe not everybody agrees with that perspective, but that's where I am sitting here. And yet, I, I have this hope that we can figure out a different way. I think some of the bus schedules have changed since 2015, and maybe there's some other creative ways of mixing things up. Um, and, and I think that's what I heard at the retreat. People want the chance to try to hear more ideas, but at the same time telling the public, this is not, I, we don't want to go through an argument, should we do it or shouldn't we do it? It's more a conversation of how are we going to do it? And, and so I want the motion to reflect that. So I don't want the public to be worried that we're not going to do it. Um, so I am just going to say that I want the public to know that I support a later start time. I am not going to vote in favor of this because exactly what you said, we have a fallback plan. I don't support the fallback plan. and so. We've heard from teachers, we've heard from students, we've heard and read the research that moving the elementary schools later is not ideal. And I would struggle with that decision. And so I'm not going to commit to making the high school later at any cost in the fall without knowing the decision we're going to come to. And so that's my rationale. I, I hope we do find a solution, and I will work really hard with everyone to find a solution. But that's exactly why I don't feel comfortable committing mm -hmm to doing, to definitely doing it at any cost and voting on it in October because I'm not happy with all of the alternatives. Any help? Dr. Provost. I wonder if I could just, I, I'm really thinking of Annie here because there were so many words in that and so many other things that I'm a little bit unclear on what the base motion is to, to, okay. to put in the, um, so I want to run this by you and see if this mm -hmm. is correct. Um, to consider three options for achieving a high school start time between 8 and 8.30 and to vote to approve one of them by October 2020. I don't know if that's it, but that's... I'm that's the boil down um, right. sense of what you were saying we should be, we should have I, three proposals and take a vote on it by October. I, the reason I'm hesitating is because um, the last committee said 8 to 8.30, and I think that was based on a lot of important information. Some of it possibly changed with sports. I don't know the answer to that, but I don't. If, if we reordered some of the schools, I don't know if 8 to 8.30 is, is limiting. What if it was 8.45 to make the buses work? So that's why I'm sitting here. It, it, everything else about it is on the right track for me. I think you did say 8 to 8.30. I absolutely did. Yeah. I absolutely so, did. So do we want to just so take we're out, still discussing so do, right? just take out, so do you want to just take out the time and not commit to a time and just say a later start time? At Which, least, I would say. Sorry. Right. Sure. Yeah. At, least eight At least 8 o'clock. At least 8 o'clock or later. Okay. Um, yeah. Not 7.36 or something like that. <laughs> <Okay>. And... <laughs> 
The other thing that I didn't say in my way too long motion is we had discussed <coughs> asking the budget and property subcommittee to find a road map for this. I don't know if that's the right answer either, but that's part of So the idea would be, well, you could pass the motion and then refer it to okay. the property. Okay, fine. Like, uh, so that's the other piece of it. Or you could build into the motion that, that budget and property will lead the pro will will take the leadership of this initiative I'm okay keeping it as simple okay. as possible okay. um, uh, sorry member now a uh, question for dr. provost is October a reasonable decision time for the following school year do we have more leeway beyond that or is October really when it should be decided by for the following school year I think October is probably as late as we would want to go because there would be some cost involved with changing the contract that we would need to be able to build into the budget. I wouldn't want to start it, say, in November or December and then not know the cost increased cost of the contract um, until after we were far into the budget process. So I would say this is probably the latest, although I would defer to Cami. I think it's about right by the time we negotiate with NACE in any contract with the bus company that we need to negotiate if there's some major movement um, I would think we would need to have all that information by January February to put it in place and, and know what that cost might be if anything yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm a little confused because it sounds if I'm in my understanding correctly that we would vote on one of three to approve one of three plans in October mm -hmm. and I guess I'm misunderstanding from what we talked the, at the last meeting. I thought by October we would have three plans, mm -hmm. and at, for which we would then discuss and figure out one of those plans to start in September 2021. I mean, we almost voted in January for a plan to start this year, right? So I mean, it seems like even January was an option. Um, so I just I would be I I I would not be able to confidently. I couldn't vote yes if we were going to decide on the plan in October. I could vote yes if we were going to commit to having the three plans. And I thought this the whole thing from our retreat or whatever, that other meeting we had was to develop a process so that we can have a later start time come September 2021. Um, so, Dr. Provost? This is not an attempt to advocate for or against, but just to explain that what may seem is a, a discrepancy. <laughs> I felt that um, we could make a decision in January regarding the 30-minute plan because there would be no change to, to anything in the bus contract. Some of the other three options that could be considered might involve a change in the bus contract, which would why I, I would want that book to be sooner. I was just going to say, my original motion, which I'd like to go back to, was to say the three plans would be available in September um, the goal would be for them to be there in September and presented so that there would be a month for discussion I don't know if months long enough but yeah I want to make sure that in whatever timeline we are discussing we're building in time to get community support and buy-in and feedback and I don't know if we're gonna if that is baked into the the um, creation of the three plans, or if we come up with three plans and then we're gonna go to the the community say what works. And I just want to make sure that we're not saying okay we're gonna have three plans in September we'll vote in October, and we're also thinking we're gonna get that community mm -hmm. conversation in in that short amount of time. So. I, I wonder if there's a way to almost leave the, the specifics to be determined, maybe by the subcommittee is going to get pushed, so that we can ensure that the process allows community participation and conversation, all of the contract negotiation with NACE and the bus companies and so on, and whatever budgetary decisions need to be made and I, I just wonder if there's a way for us to pass this right now without knowing all those details mm -hmm. I like having it come by September because then it's the start of the school year everybody's back from vacation and that that's 
the time to start that community conversation. But then, do you have to? You'd like it to be decided by October because of the budget, because of the contract flexibility. Depending on what the options are, I mean, it may be that one of the options is another one that doesn't really impact, you know, yeah. contracts, and so it could have been later. But I won't know what you'll be picking. Mm -hmm. It's just you won't be able to be able to do a public process over the summer because people are just right. not available and staff's not available. So, but um, I'm comfortable with keeping it, you know, to just keep letting the committee come up with some of the specific timeline. But just the goal of getting three proposals here by September. And, sorry, I don't want to cut you. Well, I was just going to ask: Is there going to be an opportunity? I'd love for the subcommittee to do the work on this but is there an opportunity for the full committee to weigh in on it so that we don't have three options brought to us for a vote and we actually don't really love any of the three like I don't know at what point no. we can weigh in on what our preferences would be I think you could just post the you could post the budget property meetings as full school committee meetings and then allow members to come if they want it you know they could they that way it would allow for the possibility sure you can double post it as a meeting of the budget property and the full committee and that way if extra people want to show up and be part of the conversation they could they're not going to vote as part of the committee but at least they could be there so the council does that frequently okay. on hot button issues where they want to have an opportunity for more counselors to come and just two things. I would say if it does go to a subcommittee, it would be smart for that subcommittee to bring it back and share it with the public in this format as just a report on the subcommittee. And then I wonder if instead of saying three proposals, just say multiple so that it gives us more flexibility with, you know, the idea that we're thinking on the order of three, but. It could be two. It could be two, oh. it could be four. You know, maybe we'll strike gold. Maybe we don't need three. Mm -hmm. It could be ten. We each favor one. <laughs> Ten way vote. Um, no, no. Um, the, I like the idea of, I don't know if it's realistic to have multiple proposals by September, but what is nice is then that gets, gives us the opportunity to bring it to open houses in September and present it there and make it you know, more accessible, get more community feedback, et cetera. But that's, it's definitely a short timeline. On member Lamica. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what you were going to call me. <laughs> um, so, only as a, a consideration, what if it's developed, options developed in between now and September? Because we have budget pretty much until April or May. Right. So, to try to double that with that mm -hmm. are two major projects. Um, but develop scenarios by September present them to the full school committee and the public and instead of October what if it were November but no later then and that way you've got that 60-day window with people being back open houses mm -hmm. whatever Feedback. kind of groups and, mm -hmm. and committed to no later than November if you can't make it by November we're not gonna, depending on the scenario obviously like Dr. Provo said um, it might not take that much mm -hmm. and it, it may take a lot so we need to build that in but I'm thinking November the latest but that would still give you a 60-day window and it would be people coming back from vacation everybody would be back um, and it would give mm -hmm. us a time to develop it and not rush to get it done either just a suggestion so I don't know how that affects or if it, take that under advisement I'm not sure do you want to change it to not three but just multiple, multiple. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. sure. Okay. So what do you have so far? No. Yeah, what do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I have? I see a lot of cast yes. out words. And I have to consider multiple options for achieving a high school start time of at least 8 o'clock or later. Um, of by 8 o'clock or later. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of 8 o'clock or later um, by September 2020. And then is there no language about voting and all of that? Is that where it ends? I thought that no, I'm the language, I thought the discussion was about taking that out, wanting to see what they were. I think I was the only or, person okay. who said that. That's what if, uh, <laughs> but, so I wanted to make sure the rest of Maybe we could get to consensus. So what if we proceeded it with recognizing the importance 
of a later high school start time where the committee recognizes, I don't know, if somebody <laughs> wants to be more aggressive, go for it. Well, but I think sort of along what Member Fallon was saying, and, and, and what like I think we want to put of saying that we will vote in word, uh, Ms. Non member Lemico said, <laughs> When did you say November? I, I was saying November. Yeah, okay, like if we will it. vote by November because one of the reasons we want to do is so that yeah. the public knows this 2021 school year exactly. start time, whether it stays the same or not. We might all vote no on it, but at least the public will know and not be waiting till now to think when is school starting. So if we say, you know, th plan multiple plans available by September with a school committee vote on it by November for the 2021 start time. And then we have the process and the public knows at least they'll know by November at some point. Um, sorry, Member Bosanski and then Member. Well, I was just thinking in terms of what Member Fallon said, if, um, you know, if at the end of the day we can't come back with multiple program uh, ideas, I can't even think, um, and, and vote on them, then I, I just would like to put it to bed. Like at that point, like I'd like to say, we like gave everything we had. I think we can come up with a proposal and we can make this happen and I think it's incredibly important. But I also don't want us to just, you know, spend the next two years together spending hours and hours on so just spinning our wheels, I guess. That you know, so at that point I maybe we need, we do need something that says if we can't figure it out, we are just gonna leave it as is. But I, I believe we can figure it out. So I don't know if that makes it any more so I agree with what Member Voss said, and I believe with what you said earlier. Yeah. And I also believe, I also agree with what Member Fallon said, that I I think we've got to say that we are committing to a later start time for the high school, and that we're committing to finding a way to do that that meets the needs of all students, so that we're not pushing our elementary school times later to the detriment of elementary school kids and families. And so, and I do think we owe it to the public to, to <coughs> your point, to not say, and maybe we're gonna say we're not gonna do it because I think we've gotta say, the school committee already voted previously years ago to have a later start time. We know that we have creative minds. There's been a lot of research, we can do it. I think we need to, I'm, I'm advocating to say, to, to have language that says we are committing to voting on a solution that works for, for the majority of the populations of our, of our school district. But having language that makes it clear that we're not gonna just pick something just to have a later start time that's to the detriment of another population. Uh, member Gold. Just to clarify, sort of what you're talking about with putting it to bed, like voting doesn't mean that it will happen in September. Voting just means that we're going to vote on it. Like we might not, we might all vote no, which on every proposal. On every proposal, like that, by saying that we're going to vote on it, I don't want us to mislead the the public that we're going to vote on it and there will be one plan accepted. Like I just want to make sure we, however we say the motion, <laughs> not saying that we are definitely having a later start time in September 2021. Like, I, we to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like there's some <laughs> Yeah, so what I was just saying was that we are saying that we're going to have a later start time. They, they, and that's why I was voting yeah, no. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, yeah so then I'd, I'd say I'm not comfortable with that because we might all, we might, like, there's, we might come back with three plans and not be able to have an agreement on it. And if we're, that's Why? Why can't we come up with three amazing plans that we It's taken all 15 love? years and haven't been able to <laughs> happen we're yet. Ten, ten. ten we're sorry. 18 months away. No, I know, but, I, but to, to tell the public we're going to have a later start time and then us to sit here in November and not be able to agree on a start time, like, that's a tough situation to be in, to, you know. Mm -hmm. And we're representing our constituents, and so... Bersansky. We don't have to agree, we just have to vote. Right. And the winning vote, you know, I mean, it could be, you know, like we talked about. I mean, I hear what you're struggling with. I definitely hear what you're struggling with. And I, and I, it's, but at the same time, I, yeah, I don't, that's all. Member Fallon, I, I liked the wording that Member um, 
Levi said about um, the sleepy. I like so. I gave it so much thought, and then I still screwed it up. For every like, possible. Not lucky. Like, <laughs> and I was so proud for the member part. Oh. Anyway, um, I liked the wording where it was "we're committed to this," and but I stopped short of it um, because I I have to be honest. There are school committees all over the state and all over the country as determined and creative and smart as we are who can't get it done. And that's what scares me. You don't think that everyone who has sat at this table for the last how many years has wanted to make this happen? I think that it's just, I get that if we say it, it will be. But I also am trying to be realistic and say, there are mon monetary issues. If the override fails, we're already making cuts. We, how would we possibly take on more expenses that might be incurred as a result of it? Like it always comes down to money and contracts and some of the best solutions for the students may be the most expensive solutions to pay for. And so then, you know, that's a totally different discussion. So we could make it happen at any cost, but I, I want to find the right solution, and that's why I feel like I can't say with 100% certainty that it's going to happen. Member Boston and Dr. So um, I would be in favor um, of the language that, um, now you're making me think hard, <laughs> Member um, Levy uh, suggested. and. Again, I think we aren't going to come up with a solution that everyone's happy with that doesn't cost money. And um, when you talk to community members, um, this is one of the biggest things you hear about what, you know, knocking on doors, running for this to represent the community. This is really important to people. And I feel like bringing that that's an important point to make um, in terms of what might we have to give up and I agree with you Ms. Fallon if the override doesn't pass if we're sitting here how are we going to afford this but I also f know that among everything our community wants this is pretty high up on the list and people feel really strongly that this is going to be one of the most important things for their students at the high school level in terms of getting more sleep um, and, and I guess I'm not a fan of the current, per I, I understand the current proposal, which is to put each school back half an hour because it's cost neutral <coughs> and it does the job. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of good there. I also understand the concerns about younger children going to school later and the difficult effect that has on families and potentially on learning for younger kids, which is why I, am in favor of us spending this extra year trying to figure out a better solution than that. But I think we have to figure something out. And so, you know, I guess I'm ready to say I'm, it's not going to be perfect, but we have to do something. So um, <laughs> I, I do have to say I am the one person here who did actually vote to implement Late Start. <laughs> It lasted for about 30 days, and then we reversed it, but we did actually vote to do it. Well, we actually voted to eliminate high school busing, so that right. made it really easy. Exactly. This was before the last override seven years ago. It was one of the cuts. So, like, we could set the time whenever we wanted. It was not ideal, and then we put busing back in um, when the override passed. But so. What do you? What is the current status of the motion? I actually don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> there hasn't um, really been any formal amendment. Well, no, but it process. just says. But it says to consider <laughs> multiple options for achieving a high school uh, start time, um, 8 a.m. or later, uh, and um, uh, vote to approve one of them by November 2021. Yeah. That's sort of where no, it vote to approve by November 2020 for implementation. Oh, I'm sorry, November 2020. My fault. Yeah, November 2020. Yeah, vote to approve uh, for implementation by November 2020. That's sort of where we are. And I'm sorry. I'll just uh, apologize. I tried to work in a solution that works for all of our students or majority of our students, and recognizing the importance of a late arts. I just That's okay. couldn't figure out where, how to get it all in. <laughs> so. At the beginning. What's that? <laughs> in recognizing the importance of. So do you um, accept that as now the 
final version of your original motion, or? I think so, but okay. I, does somebody, is it, is it vote to approve or vote on? Thank you, that's, <coughs> that's very different. Yeah. I, I think the mayor just read to vote to approve, is that right? I, yeah, I Because see. That's, what that's what my motion said. is. Yes. Read it again, please. Oh, but well, I, you should read it, it's your writing. I, I can't In your recognition writing. of. Recognizing the importance of a later high school start time, the school committee will consider multiple options for achieving a high school start time of 8 o'clock or later and vote to approve one of them by October 2020 for implementation in September 2021. I think when I read it, I said November. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that November. November. Okay, so, November. Yeah. Okay, I, I, that, I'm good with my motion, okay, okay. so. And, then, um, and there was a second, do you? I had seconded it. You seconded it, okay. Member Gold. Sorry to sound ignorant here. What, what does vote to approve exactly mean? One of them will. It means you're, it, it gets put on the floor and there's a vote to, to approve it. That doesn't mean it's gonna. Pass. <laughs> right. not pass, but it, it that's, okay. the, that's, yeah. So Wait, I, yeah, could you? <laughs> there's no way, we can't pass a resolution that, uh, that, that's important that to delineate. He, you know, determines that we're going to pass something. We can't, you know, we can't really do that. But we can say we're going to take a vote to approve one of the plans. Or, eight, you know, to vote to approve a plan. Yeah. Again, that doesn't mean that we don't have a 5-5 vote on every one of them. Or you know, I'm not, I think we're going to vote on something. We're going to pass something. But I'm just saying, but, yeah. I don't know that you can say we will approve one because I don't think we can presuppose <laughs> that. Why are you saying vote to approve versus right. just vote? Just vote. Vote on. Vote on. Because I feel like it's misleading or confusing. Yes. But agree. do you ever make a, I'd like to make a motion for you to deny my motion. Like no one makes that motion. <laughs> they make the motion seeking approval of a motion. You know? No, but none of, but none no, of the. But you. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that, I mean, that's the. It does sound like I'd when say we say favor, vote to approve, one of them means that in the end we're going to have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and and that was the intention of yeah. some of us. Yeah. Yes. A vote it, to approve one of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it sounds like that. But it, all the like all these votes on here don't say vote. Well, two of them do say vote to approve. But <laughs> vote to delegate. Vote to approve delegating. Vote to approve requesting. They're like. I think we're misleading the public if we said the word approve. So I'm, I guess I'd like to amend the amend it to say vote on. Can I amend the what's it called? Amend the motion. You can make a motion to amend. Sure. Sure. A motion to amend it to say to vote on. So change the word approve to uh, on. Ah, yes. Vote on. Is there a second? To that second. Amendment? Okay. Can we discuss that? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I just want to understand what the different, I'm just trying to understand the difference in your, that is, yeah. moved you to make that motion. Um, I, I want to make sure that the public is aware that it's possible, that they're not thinking that one of the three plans will be approved. I want them to be aware that it's very possible that we're going to vote and not be able to have, how many people have to vote yes? Six? Not be able to have six people say yes to one of those three um, plans. I think it would be negligent of us to say that we are guaranteeing now that six of us are going to say yes to one of the three plans. So as I think if we, it, I would want the public to know that personally. Rat versus Mim thinking that we are guaranteeing you that six will say yes to one of the three. That's what it seems to be the difference for me. Okay. Okay, so anyone have any thoughts? Member Goldman, you look unconvinced. Yeah, I think, <laughs> <laughs> sure, I mean, my opinion is that um, I'm not interested in voting on things I that I don't want to approve. I do want, I mean, I feel like it is, I feel like we're using terms like to aspire or intend to, you know, it's just, I just want it to be the way it usually is. It's just my inclination. Um, and I, I'm not guaranteeing anything either, but um, yeah. Okay. That's 
just um, the difference for me. I could, could I could I um, maybe offer a compromise sort of? But, um, maybe it's more confusing, but um, for an for uh, for an approval vote, how about that? Because um, that's really you know your any motion we make, it's you know you're seeking <coughs> body, so. Instead of to approve or to vote to vote on or a vote to approve uh, for an approval vote, you know. can I ask a question? Sure. It seems like what's less important to the committee right now is the words we use, and what's more important is whether we are committing to a later start time and to committing to one of the plans. Mm -hmm. I think there are some people here who are saying. We, we want to assure the public that in the fall of 2021, there's going to be a later start time, and, there's, and we will figure out what that plan is. And then there are other folks who are saying, I don't want to promise that if I don't like the plans. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, we, before we choose the words, we've got to decide which of those we're going to do. The intention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well said, Member Levy. <laughs> yeah, but without having a vote, how do we, how do we, like, how do I say I am not comfortable voting to push everybody back a half hour? I would love it if we made the high school, the, the middle, elementary school start at 8, the high school at 8.30, and the middle school at 9. But for some reason, the middle school starting latest is rarely offered as an option. And to me, it makes the most sense mm -hmm. from, like, a research <laughs> point of view, from the parents, from they don't have athletics and after school jobs. like. So when we talk about like I'm going to commit to something like I'm not going to commit to it if I don't know what you're proposing or if it's a proposal that I cannot get behind because I think it will cause harm. So that's where I don't know where this conversation happens, but it's not that I don't want to commit to a later start time, but I'm not going to. Yeah, I don't know how this conversation happens where we get to the point where we say that we're really committed to making it happen, but I'm not promising that I will if it's a proposal that I think is going to be harmful for students or families. Member Sarah Fikas. Um, I, I heard uh, the mayor mention something about we can't tie our hands to voting a particular way in the future. And s am, am I, did it I? It would be odd, I think. Yes. It would be an odd thing. Yeah. It, it, it almost strikes me that it might possibly be illegal. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, are there any lawyers in the room? Uh, but so I, uh, for that reason, I don't think we actually can say that we are going to approve any particular plan in the future or, or even the outlines of a particular plan. We can have a legal requirement from outside to say that we need to pass our budget by a certain deadline, but that's a requirement from outside. That's not a requirement we put on ourselves. So, um, so for for this, this would be a requirement we're putting on ourselves. So I, I don't think that, like I understand the tension that we are in, but I I think that it's a bit of a moot point because we can't actually tie our future hands to voting yes on something, we can only assure the public that we want to do something and we're going to try our hardest. And it can't be through emotion that we can assure them that. We can only assure them that through our words and our actions. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, OK. <laughs> so then. So then that's closer to taking out of <laughs> So I, I would, yeah, vote on, vote on is fine. I, I mean, it, either way, I think it means the same thing. Okay. So Mayor Nargwitz, can I just point out the, in our code of ethics that's posted on our Northampton Public Schools website, it does support what uh, Member Serafie Cox is saying in two separate spot, spots where it says that realize that statements or promises should not be made regarding how, or sh how she or he will vote on matters that come before the committee. Um, and then make decisions only after all facts on a question if presented and discussed. So if we don't know all of the facts that will make that decision occur, if we don't know how it's going to impact the budget, how it's going to impact individual grades, students, families, we, that we shouldn't make that decision. So making a decision like that in advance does feel wrong. 
So. I mean, I think committing to vote on something by November is pretty strong in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, there's, like, that says that, like, you're not going to continue it to the next meeting. You're not going to kick it to another committee. You're not going to, you know, like, you're going to take, it's, it's going to come up for a vote by November. So to me, that's pretty strong so, without having to say you're going to vote to approve it. But mm -hmm. yes. I, I just have a con I'm comfortable with this. I, I'd rather us be on the same page. Okay. Um, I think. It isn't wrong, though, to say we have had a proposal on the table for a year now. And so I don't think that we're really saying we're, I think it's a gray area with what is um, the code of ethics, because we do have a proposal on the table. And we have talked about it. And we have gotten a lot of feedback. And it is controversial. And so it's not like we're saying we don't really know what we could be voting on. We know a piece of it. And I'm very comfortable leaving that behind. I'm not happy with that proposal either. I, I agree with what you said about the order of the schools. I think there are ways we can figure this out. So I'm going to just have faith it's going to work. And I'm happy with yeah. the way you've worded it. It's more like, call the question? It's more like yeah. we're calling the question. Yeah. I mean, we're literally calling the question <laughs> yeah. in November. Like, there's yeah. going to be no further debate after November. <laughs> so, but can you I, are calling. I, oh. Before you do that, can I okay. say one more? Sure. Thing because the the one thing that that does bother me is the piece that keeps coming up here, which is this this proposal that's been on the table, and I feel like what we said in our um, workshop, and maybe I'm misremembering, so please help me if I am, was that we were voting no on that one, that we were actually gonna put that one to bed and say that it doesn't work for our community, and we would like to spend the time coming up with a better one. And I just want to get clarity on that because I think it would help us and also help the public who many of them have, have commented to us that I, I actually haven't heard anybody say, please pass this one. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say, please don't. This is really not good for elementary school kids. And so can we, like that was on the table, can we vote on that one? while we also have this resolution to do this other thing. So right now we're actually, there's an amendment that we're yes. voting on. There's, there's, I have, we have to finish that. that but in answer actually, to your question, yeah. Member Levy, uh, once we vote on what we're voting on now, which is an amendment to a proposal, and then we vote on the proposal, then we could vote to vote no on the, the proposed thing of moving everything back 30 minutes. So after we take care of this, we could come back to that. After we need to. And yeah. Yeah. It's covered under the Exactly. Uh, thank you, Parliamentary <laughs> Seraphie Cox. <laughs> um, Member Busansky. I guess I'm just curious at when we can sort of talk about the process, because we've sort of talked very vaguely about referring it to budget and property, opening it up, making it a full school committee. You know, lots, we've had lots of discussions in our retreat, and now again tonight. So when do, when can we have that discussion? Because I think that's something we haven't discussed. Like I have one image of it that it would keep coming back to school committee. It's not that budget and property, though I love the idea of opening it to the whole school, opening the meetings to the whole school committee. I didn't really realize that was an even opportunity. So I just wonder when that, like I feel like that's just the one thing we haven't tackled is the process of how we're going to get to these proposals in s September so we could vote on them by November. Discuss that a little bit, Member Goldman. Yeah, that's the clarity piece. I also was wondering about with the amended proposal on the table about right. There's the element of um, when we're going to present viable the viable plan or plans. When those will be presented by when they'll be voted on. Who will do the work to build the plans, right? And what we do about the plan on the table. <laughs> so I think we, I think the motion envisions that um, we'll, have, we'll have to figure that out, but knowing that the whole thing is going to be completed by November of 2020, and then we're just going to have to work our way back to that. Okay, okay. But the motion that's on the table is to amend <coughs> the word approve to vote on. That's essentially what Ms. Member Gold's uh, motion was, that we weren't we were going to vote approved, but we were going to vote on them in, by November of 2020. Yes. And I, I think they mean the same thing. I'm just going to say that. I think. Um, I th okay. 
Yeah. Well, we still have to vote on yeah. it because it's yeah. been motioned yeah. and seconded. Yeah. So yeah. I would like to call that question sure. so we can at least move yes. beyond that. So topic. all those in favor of the amendment, uh, Member Gold's amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Opposed. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, I believe uh, the ayes had it for the amendment. Um, any concerns about that? Do we need a roll call vote? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So now we're back to the main motion as amended. Um, that's all made and seconded to basically approve it with this new language of vote on as amended. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Can, can he read that again, the motion? The whole you thing? Or are you sure? <laughs> Thank Since you. you're the actual uh, person taking the minutes. Uh, just to good. get it right, recognizing the importance of a later high school start time, the committee will consider multiple options for achieving a high school start time of at least 8 a.m. or later by September 2020, with a school committee vote on one of them by November 2020 for a 2021 start time. Does that capture it? So just to clarify, this means we're not locking ourselves into choosing one of the plans at that meeting? We, we could, can vote we no could on choose. all of them? Yeah. Yes, because we're... Yeah. Okay, I yeah. just want to make sure... <laughs> we can't lock ourselves. I, as a practical... Can I just say, sure. as a practical matter, I don't think it's possible for you to pass a motion now that you couldn't pass another motion to rescind at a later date. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So yes. I don't think you're locked in in any case. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, all in favor then of the motion as read to us uh, right now, so please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, excellent. <laughs> there we go. So, we've done it. Um, so, now, um, uh, and now we're still, we still, you know, this is still posted to talk about uh, late start time. So, if, if um, Member Levy, you wanted to make a motion to put to bed the other one, you could do that. I move to vote on the motion that's on the agenda to, I don't even know where it is, to, uh, and to have the late start time push, put, have, have the start time be pushed by 30 minutes. Yes, so you're making that, actually you're asking us to approve it but you're not. <laughs> you're not using that word. I didn't say approve, I said vote. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, that's you. I want to second that. Second. second. Okay. So um, the motion that's before us is a vote on the uh, plan that has been under consideration, uh, uh, you know, since the prior term, uh, the prior school committee term. Um, which is again to ch to cha change all of the times by one half hour later. Any debate or discussion on that motion? Hearing uh, none. All those in favor, please say aye. Loudly now. No. Okay, I, tried, I thought I could trick you. Uh, all those opposed, please say no. No. Any abstentions? Okay, I'm sad to inform you that the motion failed. <laughs> so, um, so that has now been put to bed. Um, so now the only remaining questions is the process. Um, and would someone, I do think it would be appropriate because budget property is going to be figuring out what our process is for somebody to now um, make a motion to, um, you know, basically send this thing that we just passed to budget property. Um, I would like to make a motion to refer uh, the potential options of late start time to the Budget and Property Committee. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Okay. I think rules and policy should really get it. <laughs> 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 Clearly, is, there, is there a way to amend the proposal so that it is, it is articulated within this that there will be open sessions with the full school committee so that there's full inclusion mm -hmm. of the. I mean, I, I, will, I will make that commitment to you. I don't have to put it in the motion. We'll just do that. That's not hard to do. We'll just double post it. And do you commit it. to that on television? What's that? Okay. <laughs> Dave, you paused that, didn't you? I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so it's all, so we will do that. that that's, that'll be my commitment. Um, okay, so 
All those in favor oh. of the open Can we just yeah. talk? I, I wouldn't mind just talking about the process for just a moment. Sure. So we refer to budget and property, budget and property. When will we realistically be able to take this up? Are we? Next week. Well, sure. We set meeting dates going to May, didn't we? Yeah. So I think it would realistically something budget we could start be. working on in at the May meeting. Mm. Unless, but then. But wait a second, we already have pesticides on there, and there's vans on there, so I don't know. Um, well, I don't think one includes the other. You, you could have more than one issue on the agenda. As a member of the subcommittee, I would say we would need to start working on it before May. I know. And, um, and we're just going to have to have a longer meeting or another meeting. Dr. Provost, do you see any other way of... So can I say something? <laughs> so there's some part of planning here that it also takes Dr. Provost, myself, and Tammy Lieber, who's our transportation person, mm -hmm. to do a lot of effort of this. So we've got massive budget pieces going through April, depending on what happens with the override or not. We have to keep bringing that back to school committee, revising plans, depending on how many times. <coughs> That's going to take quite a bit of work until May, which is going to be budget sub subcommittee work and Dr. Provost and I and administrators to get together to do that. So that's a large time commitment. And then the next piece of that is you have to take into consideration we can start working on that piece of it right after that, but then also trying to develop those plans, come August and September, we need to be able to take Tammy out of the mix because she will do nothing but scheduling and routing and bus passes for six weeks. That's all she does, the month of August and the first two weeks of September. We gotta line out the door of people. So whatever plans we develop we need her work on is gonna take that to do. So we have to come up with the ideas, I don't wanna say quickly, but that's what it's gonna take and then fine-tuning them, I think, is what I see the, the committee doing, or the ideas, um, but the details of it. Dr. Rose and then member. Just quickly, that I agree completely, which is why I say I don't think we can start before May. Yeah. And I think, I think um, Ms. Lamica has just given us sort of the end. If, it, it really would have to be between May and July would have to be all the yeah. work. Yeah. So I understand that, and we discussed at our workshop that even though we don't want busing to drive the decision, that's a, a major component, at least to the previous ideas. It sounds like there may be a lot of creativity that may be brought in that before we get to the busing conversation. So I, I just wonder if there should be an ad hoc committee that, I, it's a, you could say no, but so that there can be some legwork done before then the busing conversation is brought in. So. The only reason I have that reaction is because every ad hoc committee creates the same thing that she was just talking about. Someone has to organize it, someone has to get everybody together. I think, as an alternative to that, if people have ideas or creative things that you know maybe we haven't thought of that don't necessarily involve busing, feeding that to the budget and property subcommittee would be the way to, to do it, including you know, anyone who might have outreach too. I mean, we tried to mass, that was a bust, but if there are other groups who you think might have some expertise, and then I would say just, just feed it to the subcommittee. Question, um, is uh, Tammy Lieber as busy as the two of you are until May? And I only ask that, is it, would it be worthwhile to, because it feels like a lot of sort of the ideas that we hear do obviously involve busing because we're flipping or we're, mm -hmm. you know, people want numbers on how many people are on the high school afternoon mm -hmm. bus, et cetera. So maybe there's just a little bit of legwork that could happen before, just in sort of information gathering and sitting with Tammy mm -hmm. Lieber, but I don't want to commit, I mean, I'm asking for your opinion on that. I I think one of the things that might work out best is when we start this, and I like the idea of the, the full committee having input to begin with, maybe it's that brainstorming session first with the full committee of those ideas, mm -hmm. and then have Tammy start working on those pieces while we're finishing up the budget, 
and we can start developing those pieces. Maybe that's the way to go about to start it off, kick it off. We could do that piece at one meeting first, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be the budget committee going right. for hours with that, but it'd be that one session with the full committee, ideas, yeah. brainstorming session. Have Tammy start working on that piece now while we're finishing budget, and then we can get into the budget subcommittee mm -hmm. right after that of working out the details of what would work, what one, mm -hmm. what can we tweak. Um, I have a, more of a comment. Okay. I think my, this is fine with me. I guess what I was thinking was something along those lines in terms of send it to the three people on a subcommittee to figure out this plan, which what you just said is fine, but the, I think the other conversations that need to go along with that, another thing we talked about, about our workshop is bringing in some expertise because if this was easy to solve, we would have solved it by now. And I know Ms. Fallon's mentioned there's other districts in the state. She probably knows who they are. Maybe knowing, doing this collection of information, who do we talk to about what's worked, what hasn't worked? Who are the people out there that we could maybe hire as a consultant for a day to help us think about ideas we haven't thought about if these exist? So I feel like some of that work could be done by a school committee, a subset of us. In parallel with the budget, I completely recognize that you two are comp up to your ears in work until April or May. Um, but I worry that if we really wait till May, we're not going to get done by June. I don't. I don't think we have to wait till May. I, I think. I think it would be helpful for the whole committee to throw out that yeah. brainstorming ideas because I think it would be helpful for the budget subcommittee yeah. to also then start fine tuning some of that based on some details that way everybody has some input <laughs> rather than getting the three ideas mm -hmm. and then somebody saying well how about you didn't think of this one I think doing that up front might be helpful a motion, a uh, motion to suspend the rules because it's 11 o'clock yes second. is there a second <coughs> all those in favor please say aye aye Opposed? any abstentions okay great so back so could I ask if a better way forward would be for us to have another workshop type brainstorming session and somebody say when that's reasonable and then move forward with this i think the full committee i had a thought about that that just occurred to me well you know there was a discussion about are there any other people that we could bring in that might be helpful um one of the um unfortunate sort of uh, byproducts of the situation we had at Bridge Street this year with busing is that we've become quite familiar with RJ. Uh, <laughs> uh, is, uh, you know, basically in charge of busing in the Northeast. I mean, we could certainly schedule a meeting for a time when we could be present and see if he has any other information. His organization works with hundreds of districts. If there are any other solutions out there, he might be aware of them. RJ is the busing company. He's a regional manager for <laughs> Durham Transportation. <laughs> Sorry. So, in a sense. <laughs> um, so, this was sort of a conceptual discussion, and there was a motion to refer that we are now still debating because that's still the motion on the table. Correct. So, I'd like to have a vote on that to make the final referral so people feel comfortable where, where this is headed when we refer it. Okay, all those in favor of referring, please say aye. 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 Oppose any abstentions? Okay, it's referred. Um, and now we take up the uh, next item on the agenda, uh, which is to approve a resolution by, uh, brought forward to us by NACE. Um, it is a resolution regarding charter schools. And, um, ooh, darn, I just had it on my screen and it disappeared. Here it is. Um, Yes. Sir. So, and this is my first time the whole voting after 11 thing. When we vote to extend, is it is it indefinite? Like, do we have a cap? <laughs> well, the rules were suspended just sort of generally. I, no. some bodies have said I want to extend it for 15 mm -hmm. minutes or whatever. But I think the motion was just to suspend our rules to go past 11. I think our policy says it goes for a certain number of minutes. Okay. 15 um, maybe. Could be 15 minutes. <laughs> I guess I don't know. 
I, I don't want to spend Laura's on the website. She's looking it up. Okay, great. So while you're doing exactly. that, I'm going to <laughs> resolution. I don't waste the 15 um, minutes. Exactly. Uh, so this is entitled a resolution against charter school growth in Northampton. Um, whereas all Northampton students deserve fully funded, high quality public schools that teach the whole child, provide enrichment, and address social and emotional needs in addition to <coughs> subjects. And whereas Commonwealth charter schools often fail to serve the same proportion of special needs students, low income students, and English language learners as the districts from which they receive students and often use high suspension rates to drive out students they don't want to serve. And whereas Northampton overwhelmingly voted in 2016 against the statewide proposal on Commonwealth charter schools, whereas Commonwealth charter schools take away vital resources from district public schools, and whereas Commonwealth charter schools are often approved over the objection of the majority of community residents, and whereas Commonwealth charter schools are not accountable to elected officials and there is no local oversight as to how charter <coughs> school officials allocate public funds in these schools, and therefore be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee opposes any new charter school or charter school expansion that draws students from Northampton and therefore be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee will work with district parents, community leaders, and public education advocates to oppose charter school growth and therefore be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee will work with public school officials in neighboring communities to oppose <coughs> regional charter school growth regardless of the physical location of any proposal for a new charter school or charter school expansion. Is there a motion to that resolution. I'm so moved. After we, and I'll second. I'll second. second. Now you can. Um, and I wonder, <laughs> it's gonna work. Do you recognize to speak to this at all? Sure. sure. Yeah. So I'll <laughs> recognize um, <laughs> chapter coordinator Andrea Gito, um, who who emailed this to us and. Yeah, and I, I would like to thank the committee for taking up this resolution and discussing it. it is, um, you are probably the first in Western Mass, hopefully of many, to take up this resolution. It was drafted by a group of our local associations. We have a, um, a, a coordinated um, collaboration called We Mean, which is Western Mass Educators Action Network, which is our um, a, a group of locals, local association, employee associations that get together monthly, um, and this was a, a, a very important issue that we had taken up and are looking to share and bring forward to other um, districts in this, across the state, and we're hoping that Western Mass will be Kind of the on the on the leading edge of this, where school committees will oppose such expansions that are devastating our public schools. So thank you for taking up the issue, and um, I appreciate that. And so certainly, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes. Uh, so I. I, I'm assuming this is a re resolution to kind of guide us as a committee and as a district in our actions regarding charter schools. Right. Um, I think the whereases do a good job of kind of identifying the issues and negative uh, impact it has on our districts and the therefores kind of give some actions to limit the expansion of those negative aspects, but I think we need to add an additional therefore. Um, regarding the funding mechanism mm -hmm. behind the whole problem yeah. because I think the therefores kind of maybe keep the problem from expanding but don't do anything to solve the problem mm -hmm. so I think an additional therefore something like the Northampton School Committee will work with blah 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 to lobby for a change in the funding mechanisms behind charter schools yeah I, I certainly would agree with that okay. um, so, uh, go ahead. So I, along those lines, like if there was, I thought there would be, it'd be good because where that first, the second one where you talk about the fail to serve and the ELLs and mm -hmm. special ed, like, um, therefore, like, move to lobby to ensure that charter schools are held to the same expect, you know, demographics and expectations as public schools are, and and rules and policies because they are in ways exempt from them. So if we can, if we're able to hold them to them and make sure that they reflect. The bodies that they're actually so 
I would just say that that'd be, you know, I'd love to see that as well. Thank you for doing this all. Member Voss. Thank you, and, and I, in principle, agree with you, Member Gold, but I think the <coughs> charter law actually says that they are supposed to do those things, and they don't. So because they don't, that's where I agree with you, but I don't know if we sh I, there's a conflict because they are supposed to. But I agree with the comments both colleagues made. I'm just not sure how to implement that in when the law actually says they're supposed to serve the same group. They just don't. And, no and many of those schools claim that they are. Yeah. Also. Yes. So. And thank you. This is fantastic. So my question would be then, do you want to propose a specific amendment to the resolution? Because um, that would be in order to, if you wanted to add an extra therefore, um, or if you want to pass it as is, and you know, a separate resolution could be, I mean, there, we've done different resolutions over time, you know, opposing the Chinese expansion, we've done some other ones. So it's, this, this wouldn't foreclose a, a different resolution in the future. Um, that focuses on specific reform or endorsing a specific bill that would do reform. So I don't know. It's up to you, uh, whatever your pleasure. <laughs> um, but you would have to make an actual amendment. I, I, yeah, I guess I'd pr pr propose an amendment for an additional therefore that uh, addresses the, the funding mechanism that results in these issues. So, um, so, uh, uh, um, Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee will work with public officials to um, achieve a more equitable charter school funding mechanism. Would that be okay? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Would that be important? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll so, second that. Okay. So there's been a motion uh, made and seconded to just add that amendment, that final therefore. Um, any discussion? If we're approving a funding mechanism for charters, in a way, isn't that encouraging the existence of charters? You know what I mean? Like, like by saying that we want them to be funded more equitably is saying we want to still have them. <laughs> we just want them funded equitably. <laughs> Versus saying, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, my, my inclination would be to say to, you know, the idea of like that to recover the inequities of funding somehow. You know what I mean? Like to be like, to make up for what's been the impact the inequitable funding has had on sc on public schools, not necessarily make sure we're still funding charter schools just equitably. So that That's would just be my concern with saying that okay. that way. So do you have an amendment to the amendment? <laughs> um, can you read it again? And, uh, Possibly to remediate. Mm -hmm. I, hmm. Do you have it, Annie? So, uh, I have. I think I have most of it. Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee will work with officials. I don't have something in there to public achieve officials. public officials to achieve a more equitable funding. I don't know if it was mechanism. mechanism. So, what about to remediate the inequitable funding, the current mm -hmm. formula, or some something yeah, like that, yeah. to to correct the in the inequity, or to or to reform. Yeah. Right. The, to reform the inequitable funding mechanism. Because mm -hmm. um, reform could mean do away with it altogether. Okay. That would yeah. be great. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. So would that be acceptable? Uh, would that be acceptable to the original <laughs> maker of the motion? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. okay. okay, so um, so, so then changing the language <coughs> to reform the inequitable funding mechanism as opposed to what it currently said, which was just to make it more equitable right. or something like that. Okay. So are we comfortable with that as an amendment? Um, and the parliamentarian, you're going to let me let that slide? Well, uh, what I'm hearing is that it's a friendly amendment, friendly. so we don't need to vote on it. Exactly. Good. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of the friendly amendment? No, no. Amendment? <laughs> say aye. <laughs> the I, I know. I know. <laughs> okay. all those, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we're back to the main motion as amended. All those in favor of approving this uh, resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much.
Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. So next we have a vote to approve the use of professional development funds to send a representative to the NSBA, which is the National School Board Association meeting. Um, and I believe this request comes to us from Ms. Fallon, um, who would like to attend said uh, meeting. And um, would you, uh, uh, would someone just make a motion so we can put it on the floor? Motion to approve funds. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Ms. Fallon, which uh, island in Hawaii is? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, the annual conference being held in Chicago, um, April fourth through sixth, and it's um, it's one of the only conferences that the that the MASC does not pay for their um, division chairs to attend. Um, but it's one that I would love to attend, looking at their schedule of their unbelievable offerings as far as equity. And, um, it's over 7,000 school coordinators from across the country and administrators and educators. And um, it would be a great opportunity to <coughs> certainly bring back all the information I could to the committee, although I always end up presenting at 11 something. So. <laughs> and this would be to cover the registration cost, correct? Yeah, so the registration, so that's the thing. I'm already on the hook for it because to save money, um, I did the early bird and it would have been too late. So the early bird saved $200, but it's still conference costs are expensive. It's $765 for the conference. We, we currently have in our account, there was, $3,100 appropriated for school committee professional development, and we currently have available 2450 So I would ask for the 765 and then pay for the hotel out of my my school committee stipend that I spend over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> so any, um, any questions or discussions about this? Where is the conference happening? Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Okay. Um, um, well, um, why wouldn't, would we, do we not, are we not allowed to pay for hotel? Uh, yeah, someone is going to, uh, can professional development funds be used for lodging for It can travel? be, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I would, I think the question, yeah. So they can be, I just, you know, I'm the only one who's used the money this year and so I didn't know, there's only one more real opportunity for professional development beyond this, and it's say on the hill, and that's fifty dollars. So even if I were to pay for our hotel expenses, there'd be enough for all ten of us to go today on the hill. Um, in the account, it was just I didn't want to be greedy and spend all our professional development money on myself. I would just personally like to have the precedent that if one of us goes to a PD, the school committee pays for it. It's not. We're not. Personally, I don't know. I don't think we should be spending our own money to go to conferences. Okay. So, um, so for whatever the I'm saying like to prove the funds inclusive of hotel and lodging. Okay. Uh, the motion, the, what, the agenda says to send a representative to NSBA. It didn't really say specifically oh. what it was for. So you could certainly authorize that it be for the registration and for the lodging. Yeah. yeah. And you would pay for the trip. Uh, yeah. And I already have the receipts for the lodging and the registration. So are people helpful with that as the... So uh, are you saying lodging only? Or are you saying airfare as well? I mean, me... I would feel most comfortable with just going with lodging because if I were to use airfare too, then there isn't enough money to cover everybody going to down the hill, and that feels not right. But thank you. <laughs> okay, so lodging and registration. Remember Bysansky? I mean, we just do only have a limited amount of professional development dollars and anything we don't use goes back to the budget so I think everybody should maybe make decisions that are you know what's comfortable for them of course, yeah. if, you're, if someone wants to yeah but uh, perhaps we could okay. approve it and member Fallon could decide whether or not she wants to file for reimbursement okay. so um, so the motion that was made and seconded was to uh, to approve the use of professional development funds um, allocated in our budget to send Ms. Fallon to the National School Board Association Conference in Chicago. There was a motion and a second. And seconded, yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay. Um, next, we have a report of the legislative liaison from Ms. Fallon. 
I had so much to say, and now I'm going to try and say so much less. Um, just to give you a legislative update, I have worked really hard and really unsuccessfully on a lot of things since we last met. Um, I did write a letter in opposition of the three um, charter amendment requests that were presented at the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education meeting in January. Um, I focused a little bit on the um, Veritas Preparatory Charter School, which is in Springfield and is the closest to us. Um, however, all three um, charter expansion requests were approved. Um, Veritas is now at their, they have added an entire high school. Um, they added 334 seats and now Springfield has hit its cap um, as far as um, the number of charter seats that they have available. Um, I also um, did write a letter um, in support of the special education gap bill um, that Representative Carey from East Hampton and, um, and Senator Comerford filed. Um, I wrote the letter to the Joint Education Committee um, to Representative um, Alice Peich and Senator Jason Lewis, um, primarily citing um, the fact that only two of our six schools in the district actually are at are aligned with that assumed assumption of 16% of our students being um, needing special education services and I gave them all of the data on the other four schools that are at 24.5%, 20.9%, 24.1% and 21.2% and so asked them to please take this and, and also questioned the assumption that those students only need services for 25% of the day um, and asked them to just to please support this bill and have it be the first step in trying to see what the actual rates of special education costs were versus what the assumed rates were. Unfortunately, um, that bill, a study order, it was sent to study. So a study order technically allows the committee um, to study the issue more, but what it really means is that that bill is not going to be taken up this session, most likely, um, and it kind of kills the bill. So that was bad news. Moving on to federal legislation, um, I was in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago, and that was even more depressing. Um, so I went for the, um, the National School Board Association's um, Advocacy Institute and um, as part of their federal relations network, and um, I was, it was a really unfortunate time to be in um, D.C. because the um, impeachment trial, the impeachment hearings were going on, and then it was the State of the Union address. So we were only able to eat, meet with congressional aides, which, let me tell you, they were phenomenal, like so, so well informed, like lovely. Um, but even those were, you know, hard to get appointments with. So I did meet with the congressional aides for. Um, Congressman uh, Bill Keating, uh, with Joe Kennedy's aid and with Ayanna Presley's aid, we um, pushed really hard the number one item on the agenda at the national level, and it should be at, our, at the state level too, is the uh, Individuals with Disability Education Full Funding Act. Right now it's, a, it's got bicameral, bipartisan support. Um, there's a House bill, um, H.R. 1878, and the Senate Bill um, 866, and they both establish a 10-year authorization of um, full funding of the individuals, um, of the federal share of the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Um, it's a lot like the Student Opportunity Act in that the implementation is gradual over a period of years, so this would have full implement implementation at year 2029, um, and that would be at a cost of um, 40, more than $43 billion. But that's what, on top of what they're spending, they're supposed to actually be paying right now to fully implement this. Um, it has a lot of support, like I said, in the Senate there's, as of today, 16 co-sponsors, and in the House there are 151 co-sponsors. The problem that you run into, it seems like a no-brainer, like they've already made this commitment, we're not asking them to do anything new, we're asking them to do what they said they were gonna do. The problem is, is that there's this section three on the House bill of the PAYGO requirement. It's the offsets, where essentially um, these bills end up in the finance committees and you've got to say, like, sure, we'll fund it, but you need to figure out where that money to fund it's gonna come from. And so that's where you can't get both sides to agree on where that money is gonna come from. It's not that people don't agree that this is something that they should be doing, it's how do they do it. So. 
Um, that was our primary focus. Um, we also focused on school infrastructure. There's uh, two bills, one of which would um, invest $100 billion um, in, um, to improve the physical and digital infrastructure at uh, high poverty schools. Um, and that got reported out of the Education and Labor Committee. It's the Rebuild America Schools Act. Um, while we support the bill, we have problems with the Davis Bacon provisions, so that was a, another discussion. Um, and then the Renew America Schools Act, we were also asking them to support. It would authorize $100 million from the Department of Energy grant program for K-12 school districts to make eligible energy efficiency improvements to reduce energy costs. And then the final um, bill that we were asking them that was specific to Massachusetts was every year we ask this, we haven't really made it anywhere, um, is to repeal the government pension offset and windfall elimination provisions because they really um, disincentivize um, people coming from private, sec private sector jobs and moving into teaching jobs, which is particularly impacting us in the areas of teacher recruitment from, um, in, the, in STEAM and at the Votech schools. And so that's really a problem. Um, we're not making much headway, but every year we go and we ask them to do that. So um, eventually maybe we'll make a dent. I will tell you that um, the new budget <laughs> from, the, from Trump um, is problematic. So while we're down there asking them to support um, the, the full funding of the IDEA, um, what they proposed instead, it sounds really good, it sounds like a great sound bite, it's a $100 million increase to that. But the reality is, is that unfortunately the number of students that we're serving is now increased to 7.4 million. And so it's actually a reduction, it's 1% reduction in how they were funding. So right now we are at uh, this budget that they are proposing, it would allocate approximately 13% of the costs associated with serving our students with um, with um, ID, the, under the IDA, and uh, once again, it was supposed to be at 40%, so it's a 1% cut, so that's really disturbing. Um, and then the final thing is we did hear from um, the Deputy Secretary of Education um, under Betsy DeVos, who took the opportunity to, and it's also in this budget, to talk to us about the amazing Educational Freedom Scholarships that they're touting, that's a $5 billion investment um, that will essentially transfer resources from public schools to private institutions and religious institutions. Um, and so uh, the Massachusetts delegation was one of many states that decided to exit early from his speech. Um, I don't know that it mattered. Um, and then finally, as far as the legislative um, portion is the day on the hill, is the day that Massachusetts school committee members typically go to um, advocate for all things education. It's this year on um, Tuesday, May 5th, um, at the Grand Lodge of Masons, unfortunately, again. Um, and then we proceed to lunch at the Hall of Flags. It's from 8.30 registration, um, starts until 2 p.m. Um, it's free to students if we want to get a group of students to go together. Um, and. Um, and it's, I think it's usually worthwhile. We usually make appointments to see our legislators while we're there, and um, the lunch is um, provided by all of, like, of, not all of, but many of the vocational schools in the state. It's amazing. So if anyone's interested or wants more information, um, Member Lusansky's gone with me many times. I don't know. Member Kaufman. Kaufman. Um, but I think everyone else is gone. Um, and then finally, I know it's late, but can I just tell you very, very quickly about the equity symposium? I can wait. I can oh, tell you next I, month. There is a limit of five finalists that you're allowed All right. To say. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Said, no, no it's ahead. Fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So the other thing was the equity symposium that was also in um, Washington. It was identifying and eradicating discrimination, discriminatory practices, prejudices, and beliefs in education policy. And I was able to attend four sessions. Um, they were amazing. Grading for equity, what every school board member should know. I have all the information. Hadn't ever thought about it in that way. Um, more than a seat at the table, considering the requirements for equitable partnering between marginalized parent populations and school districts. 
Um, and then the Albemarle County Public Schools presented, we must strive to be anti-racist anti and what they're doing to address and dismantle individual, institutional, and structural racism that exists in the district. Um, the executive director of Head Start spoke about how we should view preschool programs um, as district money because every dollar spent on for a four-year-old's preparation is um, money that the district doesn't have to spend. Um, and so going to this was amazing. I have all the information. I'm happy to share it with you, but I was left with this thought. We're doing so much of this work around equity um, as far as, you know, the woman from Head, the executive director of Head Start saying the programs should be aligned, shared, um, shared professional development, collaborative to be most effective. And that is happening thanks to our community leaders and um, all the individuals that got together and um, worked on the grant. And I think that that's awesome. We are, we also heard from the commissioner from the um, Federal um, Communications Commission and she talked about the E-rate program and the importance of the one-to-one -one, um, programs uh, as far as devices to close the digital divide and, and um, loaning out devices and hotspots. And I think that we're making a lot of progress in closing that digital divide in our district. And then finally, um, as far as the sessions I attended on supporting LGBTQ students, I think we've made a lot of progress in the policies and culture to support them. But I will say that having attended this and being one of the only white people in a room where up on the board it says 70% of all school board members are white and these are all the statistics on the achievement of black students and this is all the, these are all the problems and inequities that exist. It's on you to fix it. It felt like a huge responsibility. Like, I don't know that we're doing enough as school board members to educate ourselves about what we, what we should be doing. Seeing the work that they're doing um, as far as assessments and equity checklists and policy review and the protocols and procedures to just um, give an out-of-school suspension to a student in other districts um, and the very, very strong anti-racist statements that they have for every aspect of their school, um, for the Albemarle, Ab Ab I can't even say it, Abomar School District made me think that we could be doing more and that we should be doing more. So that's where I'm leaving that report. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Now we go on to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, we do. We have a first reading on a policy about student activity accounts. Uh, I think we have to vote to. I, I, it, so now I pulled it up. So the rule does not have the same thing. I think where we're confusing is the whole break of 15 minutes can be called. But what the rule actually says is at 11 p.m. all meetings will be adjourned unless a two-third majority of the members present vote to continue. If a meeting is recessed, it must be reconvened within a week. Yeah. So I think we're. So we could go on forever. Yeah. No. Are, um. are we allowed to? Are we allowed to make a motion to skip things? Um, certainly, yeah. Um, the, the, the next item is a first reading, so we don't actually have to discuss it. It just has to be on one of our agendas. Um, and then there are second reading and votes on two other issues, which those could certainly be continued. Then there's just a vote to refer. So um, there's a first reading, a second reading, a vote, and then a request to refer a policy. So those are. So can we? Can I? Can I move to um, postpone? Uh, the first and second readings, um, and then I would like to have another policy referred to us. Sure. So, um, motion to postpone essentially item Q. Right. Thank Is you. There a second. 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 All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And now we're to number R. Okay. And I would like to um, make a motion to refer policy um, to GB, which is. Um, uh, I wrote it down, sorry. Yeah. Policy, policy GB. GB. Uh, yeah. That's all. Yeah. Non-representative yeah. employee. Yeah. 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 There you go. It's employee. Well, it's vacation yeah. for non-representative um, Yeah, rules and policy. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the matter is referred. Now we move to the business administrator's report. I can make it real quick. It's in your packet. There's some deficits. I'm working with the administrators. Make some transfers. Um, I have one gift from Bridge Street uh, PTO for $680.
for the nature's classroom. And there were two warrants that were also included in your packet that your representative signed. And for the personnel report, I will just keep on moving. I have 17 new hires in January and three separations. Thank Any you questions? Any questions about that business report or personnel report? Okay. Now we move to the superintendent's report. Thank you. I want to start by addressing the racist graffiti that was discovered Wednesday morning at JFK. I want to state unequivocally that this is completely unacceptable and in direct contradiction to our district core values. Make no mistake, this blatant display of hate and bias will be thoroughly investigated and consequences will follow for any students who are involved. Everyone, everyone has a right to feel welcome, cared for, and respected in our schools. This type of behavior is hurtful to both our students and our staff. And I want to talk tonight about my intersection, my observations about the intersection of student and staff mental health. We teach our students to have a growth mindset and to have emotional resilience. But if we allow our own emotional reserves to run dry, then how will we fill up the students? First, I think it's important to understand that our young people are hurting. Throughout the first half of this year, more than 19 of our students have required psychiatric hospitalization, and more than 50 of our students are currently homeless or involved in foster care. As the host community for Safe Passage, Grace House, and the Cutchin Center, we serve youth and families who face a number of crises. We've also been selected as the host community for Pride House, a new residential facility serving LGBTQ youth who have been placed in the care of DCF and or DMH. And we look forward to welcoming these stu students into our schools. Students from all of these populations have experienced adverse childhood experience which placed them at risk for difficulty in school. Then it's also to import important to understand how student trauma can impact faculty and staff. There's a phenomenon known as compassion fatigue it's also known as vicarious traumatization or secondary traumatization. Um, and it's the emotional res residue or strain that comes from working with those who are suffering the consequences of traumatic events in their lives. It's often cumulative and it can contribute to the phenomenon known as burnout. Initially, it was thought that only workers with chronic exposure to traumatic events, such as first responders, are susceptible to compassion fatigue. But now we know that teachers and administrators are at risk as well. Northampton was one of 69 Massachusetts schools and, and, and um, districts and charter schools participating in the district leaders network meeting on school climate, student support, and family engagement. It was the largest gathering in the history of the district leaders network. The response was so overwhelming they needed a new venue and the topic of the day that attracted so many school leaders was educators compassion fatigue. In the past several weeks you should know that I've brought in no less than three clinical service agencies to assist our employees with their own mental health and situations that have happened throughout district, all, many schools throughout the district. And um, I'll say that I was a part of all three of those groups. Um, so this is something that's impacting administrators as well. Um, we know that almost half of teachers quit within their first five years. And I suppose we might have considered this to be an inevitable part of the sorting process requ required to figure out who really has what it takes to be a teacher. But increasingly, I'm worrying about the other half, the half that makes it past the first five years. I'm wonder worrying about the well-being of those tenacious educators. In an era of elevated student need, ever-increasing accountability, and relentless multi-channel electronic communication, I wonder how long they will find the work to be sustainable. You've seen a draft of my budget proposals for FY21, so you know that I'll be recommending shifting resources to support the emotional needs present within our district, both students and staff. In fact, about a third of the proposals align with 
one or more of the four DESE focus areas for supporting social emotional learning and safety. Getting back to the district leaders network, the final, the final activity of the day had a Wizard of Oz theme. Um, we were asked to gather our, in groups either as scarecrows or woodsmen or lions depending on whether we wanted more cognitive um, understanding of vicarious trauma or whether we needed to work on our own social emotional needs or whether we needed to screw up our courage to become strong advocates for social emotional needs of our students and staff. Um, I joined the lion group. Uh, as you've seen, I'll be advocating um, to make some shifts for our funds to, to sp focus specifically on student mental health and staff mental health. And that can be controversial. It could certainly be controversial in our community. I would just, um, I, I'll tell you there'll be critics for sure. And I would ask you all to take heart. Um, I'm sure this team can ride all of that out. Um, I need more lions. I need more, more people who can help me advocate for the needs because I do sense that this is really critical for our staff. And so I'm just asking you to um, be my partners in that work as I, as I work to try to shore up what I see as um, a staff that's really under a lot of pressure. That's my report. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, we have future business meeting dates. Our next uh, budget meeting is Thursday, February. 7th here at 6 45 p.m. in the JFK community room that's the second 